Well, why don't we go ahead and get started? Uh, I'm Joe Klemp from the Mesoscale Microscale Meteorology Lab. And on behalf of uh, NCAR and our MMM, I'd like to welcome all of you to our uh, joint 24th WARF and 6th MPAS uh, users workshop uh, this year that we are doing for the first time in a, in a hybrid configuration. To kick things off, I'd like to introduce uh, Everett Joseph, our NCAR director, to provide some welcoming remarks. Thank you, Joe. Um, good morning, everyone, and um, a really Pleased to welcome all of you uh, here to this joint workshop, those of you that are here in the room and those of you a um, uh, hundred or so that are online. Um, and so we're really um, pleased we can have this sort of in-person and uh, hybrid option. Uh, so first, let me um, just thank the workshop organizers for inviting me uh, here to make some opening, brief opening remarks. Um, uh, this morning and for for really for all more importantly for all the hard work that always go into planning uh, these workshops. Um, spending time at community workshops like this and having the opportunity to uh, engage you and engage the community is really one of the best parts of my job. There are other parts of my job that are not so good, but this is a really good part of my job. And what it does, it really like keeps it really grounds me and keeps me focused on, on why NCAR was created to begin with and um, why uh, we still today, 60 years later, remain um, relevant, especially um, today with um, society facing such ex existential uh, threats. And um, our core mission um, as a enabler uh, and convener, so we convene and we, 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 uh, we enable the community is really on full display on workshops like this with everyone coming together to network and to share model development app and applications um, work that they're doing to really move our science uh, forward. And it's, so it's really um, witnessing this um, and being a part of it to some extent uh, is really uh, inspiring. And one of the intangibles of NCAR's success is that uh, NCAR really understands how, again, to con convene the community, to marshal the community's creativity and expertise, and to, to, to co-create scientific knowledge uh, and, and innovation. So speaking of WARF, um, as you well know, um, WARF has really been a cornerstone model uh, that is used uh, in a really staggering number of ways by a huge number of people. Um, there are more than uh, 60,000, that's 60,000 registered users of WARF uh, worldwide. And, um, and you know, we've, we're proud of WARF and, and we're pleased that it's really been able to uh, uh, be a part of and enable uh, scientific advancements in the community. Um, and uh, as some of you may already know, evidence of that is uh, there, as of 2022, there are uh, 10,000 publications uh, involving WARF. And again, I think that's really an example of why we're here at NCAR. So um, some of you may have already heard that uh, NCAR is transitioning uh, its model development uh, efforts we're transitioning our modeling develop, de development efforts uh, from WARF to MPAS. And so, uh, and this is something we do like very carefully. Um, and so before there's mass panic in the room or mass panic uh, across the country, uh, I wanna make clear, we wanna make clear that uh, we'll, we'll be continuing to support uh, WARF uh, for the foreseeable future. And while we see MPAS as an important component of our future weather modeling research effort, we really understand that MPAS at this time cannot currently replace the functionality that WARF has. So uh, we plan to continue supporting WARF until MPAS really has that uh, uh, capability. So what does that mean for you as, as, as a community and as, as users? What it really means is that your graduate students will be able to download, download, download WARF as usual, uh, and quickly get it up and running 
um, to do the research as easily as you've accustomed to that, that, that happening. Uh, and this ease of use, uh, accessibility, and breadth of functionality um, are really fundamental strengths, as you know, of WARF, and really make it an indispensable tool uh, for the community. And, you know, we understand that. Uh, and uh, we understand that transition will take time. And um, we have a crucial role in, um, in, in that transition, really supporting you and providing you uh, the tools that, that you need. However, uh, there are, I want to spend just a little bit of time saying that uh, and sharing with you, there are really compelling reasons. Um, and I think a lot, most of you understand this. There are really compelling reasons why we're investing in MPAS as a future modeling infrastructure for uh, the community. And one of the major reasons, uh, and this is, this is something that we're doing across NCAR and community-wide, is that a major strategic di direction for NCAR is that we've been developing um, to really enable seamless earth, earth system prediction across scale. This effort is a priority for us. Uh, it's accelerating and um, we'll continue, we'll increase our communication about that in the coming months and, and in coming uh, meetings. But what this will allow us to do, what this strategy will really enable NCAR to do is really to provide research the research community with infrastructure and capabilities that, that we see, that we all see really, uh, that's really critically uh, needed to really meet the urgent needs of society, that says society is dep de de depending, which is really having detailed information on a local scale on how global phenomena um, like climate change uh, are impacting these communities. So it's really enabling impacts in resilient science. And we really need a, 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 a seamless uh, prediction system across scale to enable that kind of um, research. MPAS's capability to really bridge global to regional to local divide and its flexibility to make efficient use of next generation computing like GPU exascale um, and others that are coming really make it an important part of the, uh, the, the effort towards earth system predictability across scales. Uh, an example of that is that MPAS core and mesh are both options that are being incorporated into our system for integrating modeling across the atmosphere or SEMA, uh, which uh, con continues to be an important initiative for, here, for us here. And again, also is accelerating as part of this, this whole um, initiative here at NCAR. And what this is doing, it's really helping to make our, for example, our community earth system model or CESM uh, interoper interoperable for a range of science across scale, including climate science, S2S, uh, weather extremes, geospace, uh, et cetera. So another important, um, very important reason for investing in MPAS um, is the capabilities it provides to really develop a more effective infrastructure uh, and community, not only infrastructure, but infrastructure and community for R2O. Um, there is, um, uh, I, uh, I've been working between sort of the operational and research community for a long time. And, and I have to say, there's really an unprecedented and really exhilarating and exciting collaboration that has been brewing among NSF, NOAA, and CAR on R2O, really because of the capabilities at MPAS. MPAS is making this, this, this happen. And what it's doing, it's reimagining the partnership between the operational and, um, and, and, and research. Uh, communities, again, in a way that I think it's unprecedented in recent history. And what that means for you is that there is a platform and system, and again, a, a, and, and a community that's, developed, that's coalescing and coming together for you to do your basic to applied research, your R2O work. Um, and um, there's more opportunity for you to do research, to get into operations, and uh, or if you want to do just basic research. Um, and, um, and also, for you to get funded by more than one source, by multiple sources uh, to get that work uh, done. And then as an example of this collaboration is um, the work at the National Severe uh, Storms Lab or NSSL, which is really exploring use of MPAS for, um, worn on, for the worn on forecast system. Uh, and there'll be talks about that during the week. However, as was true for WARF, NCAR, we at NCAR really, we, we have a responsibility to make MPAS more accessible and functional for you as the community. 
And as with WARF, uh, what we do is we don't do this at NCAR by ourselves. We really endeavor to do this uh, in partnership with you and the community. I mean, I think that's been a, a critical an essential part of WARF's success, uh, that partnership. And, um, and really leveraging community support, leveraging community expertise and leveraging uh, community uh, involvement. Um, again, we understand the transition will take time, but I do wanna give you a nudge this morning uh, a, a little bit, uh, those of you who haven't used, um, experimented with MPAS yet. And I, so I do encourage um, you to play around with MPAS um, and to get involved and to help uh, in this transition and make it a, a smooth transition. Um, as always, there is an amazing agenda of talks ahead of us this week. Uh, and we, there's something for everyone. So um, really exciting and I look forward to that. So in closing, thanks again for your attention and um, thanks for the opportunity to share some brief uh, remarks uh, with you. And I wish you a pr productive and engaging um, week um, and um, networking and all the things, all the good stuff that happens at these meetings. Thanks again and thanks, Joe. It moves it up and down. <laughs> and I put it back down just now. Right? Technology. Well, it's such a treat to see actual people out in the audience here for this workshop. Uh, as you know, for the last three years, we've had to uh, convene our <clears throat> uh, workshops in a, in a virtual format. And uh, I think those were uh, reasonably effective, but we certainly heard from a number of you that you really missed the opportunity to get together in person in these uh, annual workshops that we have. And so we're very pleased to be able to uh, start moving back in that direction. But of course, this year we are doing it in a hybrid format uh, that will, uh, produce some some new challenges for us. So I hope you can bear with us in case there's an occasional glitch here or there, but uh, we'll uh, do our best. It's nice to see there's a number of folks out here who I recognize who have been longtime uh, attendees of our of our workshops. Uh, there's also, a, it looks like a, a number of new faces of folks that maybe haven't uh, attended one of these workshops before. Uh, and what I want to do is just briefly summarize uh, some uh, reasons why we uh, are holding these workshops. Uh, the first is, is it, it provides an opportunity to learn about recent model improvements and updates. And, and we have our uh, series of talks about uh, new features and, and changes in the modeling systems. Uh, it also provides the opportunity for you to share your advances in your modeling research with others, and then to hear from others uh, what they are doing so that we uh, benefit from the collective experience of, uh, of our group in uh, uh, moving modeling research forward. Uh, we have the opportunity to discuss community interests and priorities that are related to model development and support. So uh, we'll uh, look forward from hearing you, hearing more from you in those discussions. And lastly, but I think importantly, is it's an opportunity to strengthen informal professional relationships among our community model users. Just the opportunity to, to meet new people. Uh, we have, uh, essentially extended coffee breaks and, and lunch breaks, which offer the opportunity to, uh, to get together and, and meet others who are attending. And I, I really encourage you to uh, take advantage of that and uh, make some new uh, uh, acquaintances uh, during the week. Uh, for our agenda, it's uh, reasonably similar to how we've organized things in the past. I'm happy to say that uh, this year we do not have any parallel sessions. So uh, that's something we've been uh, hoping to, to move toward. 
Uh, we'll start out this morning with uh, our model development updates uh, for both uh, WARF and MPAS. Uh, our lunch breaks are, are essentially an hour and a half uh, each day today, uh, Wednesday and Thursday. And this is gonna be somewhat different as well. Our cafeteria here is not uh, uh, open for business. And so we are gonna be providing uh, lunches uh, in the uh, atrium outside. So I think that will actually uh, simplify uh, the lunch break and offer more opportunity for folks to get together and, and chat while they're, uh, while they're eating. And we have that nice patio area out uh, out, outside the doors there is where you can uh, uh, spread out and, uh, and have your lunches. Uh, at the end of this afternoon's uh, sessions, we will have a, uh, a short discussion period on our ongoing model support and to uh, try to clarify sort of where, where we stand and where we're going and uh, elicit your input on uh, uh, aspects that are, are important to you. Uh, and following that, we will have our workshop recept reception. I believe that's also gonna be on the, on the plaza outside, is that right? Or in the atrium? I, I, anyway, it's outside these doors somewhere. <laughs> uh, there should be plenty of food and drink. So uh, for, for most of us, we can call that dinner, but uh, you can uh, take it as you please. Uh, tomorrow, uh, right after lunch, we're going to be having our uh, uh, posters. This again is a little bit different. We only have uh, 13 posters, uh, I believe, and they are being set up over in the North Bay there, and they'll be up for uh, the entire uh, workshop if the, uh, if the authors choose to uh, leave them up. Uh, we will begin that session with a uh, uh, optional one slide uh, brief summary of the uh, of the poster that the uh, authors can present and then we'll uh, uh, shift to uh, just going over and viewing the, the posters in person. Um, on Thursday, uh, at the end of the day, we're going to have our uh, a wrap up discussion, and that is going to primarily focus on on impasse and future plans and directions. So we'll uh, uh, have an opportunity to address things there. Friday morning, we have a couple of mini tutorials. Uh, the first one is the impasse atmosphere, uh, which will provide demonstrations of steps to run. Uh, regional MPAS simulations to try to uh, provide some encouragement and, and motivations for, for trying it out. And that will be followed by MPAS Jedi um, talking about the uh, MPAS data simulation system. So I hope you will uh, participate uh, in those. Uh, just a, a couple of points here. Uh, Particularly for remote participation, but I mean for all the speakers, uh, if you if we have if you're in a 15 minute time slot, please try to allow uh, uh, several minutes for uh, questions or discussions uh, at the at the end. For re remote presenters, make sure that there's uh, no background noise where you're uh, presenting. Uh, uh, you can submit questions and comments using chat, raise hand functions in the dashboard, and the moderator will convey convect questions then to the speakers following their uh, presentations. Uh, and you may find it helpful if you're having connection problems to turn off your video camera, uh, that could be beneficial. Uh, also, I think we, all the speakers have been asked to provide their slides uh, ahead of time, at least a day before presentation. So uh, I wanted to remind you to uh, please do that. Uh, I think we will be sending out a survey following the workshop to 
uh, get feedback on how things went and what you liked or didn't like. And uh, I really encourage you to take a few minutes to fill that out and send it back so we have a better idea of to how to proceed in the future. So with that, I will turn it over to Jordan and we'll get started with the first session. Thanks, Joe. Good morning, everybody. As Joe said, it's, it's great to have an in-person component again, see old friends and make new ones. Um, our first speaker today will be uh, Jimmy Dudia, presenting on the Weather Research and Forecasting Model 2023 Annual Update. Hey, yeah, nice to be back in three years since we've done this here in person. Um, so I'm gonna quickly go through quite a lot of slides so, so they will look quick. Um, so I'll highlight the, the co-authors of this, Amin Chen, Wei Wang and Kelly Werner, who are in charge of the support and testing of these uh, releases. So WARF of course has been around since 2000 and um, we've had a series of major releases and we're currently at version 4.4, um, 4.5 actually just released in April. So I'll talk about everything from 4.4, which I did talk about last year in, in the virtual presentation. And then the release of these bug fix releases since, and then the version 4.5 in this talk. So first I'll be talking, recapping the new features in version 4.4 and then um, going on to 4.5. And then also talk a little bit about testing we did for version 4.5. So 4.4 released last year, uh, accumulated physics tendency outputs were added um, where you can do bug bits of um, tendencies of temperature, moisture, et cetera, momentum uh, from each physics component. The Thomson aerosol scheme um, was updated to include black carbon, which interacts with the radiation. Thomson iCloud equals three option was updated. P3 microphysics scheme was updated. RTMG radiation had a new cloud overlap option. The no MP LSM had new, many new options and it became a part of a separate repository that is now being shared uh, across operational models uh, in the future as well. Um, not, the NMM dynamical core was removed last year. Uh, CMAC to, to a coupling with WARF was uh, added. We also changed our default greenhouse gases to use the uh, tables that were available for various um, scenarios for future uh, greenhouse gases um, instead of a simple function that we used to have for CO2. Um, and these are available for the RRTMG and the CAM uh, radiation options. Um, we also added the shallow water roughness length published um, by uh, Pedro and myself. Um, uh, this is um, gives you um, slightly uh, rougher conditions for shallow water for a given wind speed than deep water because the waves are steeper and shorter. So it's an, an effect known as shoaling. Um, the water, there's a water depth dependence. So this effect becomes important as you get closer to 10 or 30 meters depth. Um, this is useful for offshore uh, applications such as wind farms. And uh, it can also use a real bathymetry, which is now available through WPS. Um, we also added the stochastic ensemble prediction, part of a WARF solar application, um, which allows you to perturb the inputs to various physics, uh, selected physics choices um, to give you an ensemble. There was a couple of bug fixes releases. Uh, more details are in this page here. There was, um, the only highlights I'll talk about here were a bug in the ozone input. Um, option zero, which is not the default. Um, the default is option one. And then also there's CAPE and SIN diagnostics were improved during version 4.4.2, released in December uh, 2022. There are no notable bug fixes, but details and minor fixes can be found in this page in the, under the GitHub. Um, now in version 4.5, we have only a couple of new things. So as, as was mentioned, WARF development is slowing down. So we're not adding a bunch of things every year, but there are a couple of new things. 
Um, one is a new grapple hail aerosol aware Thompson option known as option 38. Um, Jensen et al. Uh, published, uh, publishing something on that. We also have a new type of PBL scheme. That's a K epsilon beta squared scheme. I'll mention a little more about these in coming upcoming slides. That's PBL option 17. Um, the new Thompson Grell Hapel, uh, Grapple Hale um, functionality is um, with aerosols. It includes um, number concentration prediction for grapple and hail, also predicts the hail, grapple hail volume or density to represent both species with a single mass variable. The K epsilon theta squared or KEPS, we call it KEPS scheme um, by Andrea Zanato from Trento, Italy, who visited us and um, there's a paper now published on this outlined at the bottom here. It's basically, um, so prognostic equations for kinetic energy and dissipation. We had one of those before from um, Chun Shi Zhang um, called EEPS. And um, this one in, in addition predicts theta squared, which is a representative of turbulent potential energy. There's some verifications in the paper, including against LES. And this is a, a picture of one of those verifications. And it, it does perform reasonably well compared to LES. So it was, um, uh, added to WARF in this past year, in this latest release. Um, there's also active development in several schemes updated for version 4.5, NOR MP, there's a way to talk on that. P3 Microphysics was updated, MYNN PBL was updated, another later talk by Joe Olson. WARF Fire had some updates, and there's a new T key um, option, or it, it's a updated version of T key. Cumulus scheme. Um, the cumulus scheme update, this is the new T, what we call new T key, is made scale aware by uh, Wei Wang, who published this in Weather and Forecasting. And uh, it basically scales the, um, the convective parameterization down to, you can even run it at 1.5 kilometers and it still has an impact there. This example of a result shows what happens, um, what happens when, um, you run microphysics only, and compared to the observations at the top, you have too many spurious clouds. When you have the scale aware scheme on, even at one and a half kilometers, um, you actually suppress a lot of these spurious clouds. So it, it does um, it does help even at these scales, but it also works as it did before um, at 15 kilometers and more. So and it scale between 15 and 1.5 it scales. Um, so that's a new variation on the TP scheme that was added. Um, we also had some bug fixes and changes in this last release. The E epsilon PBL scheme was fixed for vertical staggering and the lightning diagnostics were fixed. Uh, and there's more in the page in our GitHub. We did some testing and verification um, as we always do for each release. Um, basically, we do a 15 kilometer domain for most of our tests. Um, we run 20, we ran 28 cases in February and in May. 48 eight hour runs initialized from GFS and verified also just against the analysis and pressure level analyses. Uh, WARF has several suites. Um, this didn't this slide didn't come out well, but we the two we support officially are the CONUS and the Tropical. But there also there are some informal suites. The rapid refresh set of physics that people can use. There's a regional climate set, um, which is used extensively now in a couple of large projects NCAR has. Is it even a CSM set? You can mimic a lot of the physics at least that was in the CDSM as of the previous release. Wolf Solar has some uh, recommended options. There's a Korean uh, options from the KIAPS, um, a lot of um, collaboration with the Korean group through Sung Yu Hong and they've developed several schemes of their own, which we now incorporate. And um, the Taiwan Weather Bureau runs uh, WARP operationally too, and this is their suite. So there are some, some informal suites as well as our two supported ones. We're thinking of adding a regional climate suite um, in the future. 
uh, I won't go through this in detail, but the, the default setting was actually the um, what we call the standard setting. That's not even any of our suites. It was it used to be the Air Force um, options, but we had the, the, the chief key cumulus instead of Cambridge. Um, but there are a lot of these tests, um, which I'll talk a little bit about, including the two main suites to make sure they're still running okay and there were no surprises there. So basically our testing showed no uh, major surprises and things in 4.5 are comparable with 4.4 um, with these all these um, options. But we also tested new things. The climate suite, as I mentioned, um, is also being considered and not listed before, but it includes Thompson, no cumulus because it's designed for a four kilometer regional climate run. YSU PBL, revised M5 service layer, RTM G radiation and NOAA MPLSM. This is just a snapshot of one of our tests, um, surface verification, wind speed, 10 meter wind, two, two meter temperature bias and uh, RMSE, two meter Q. Um, the new K epsilon theta squared scheme is in green um, and has some outlier behavior as you see here. Um, compared to the other options, which are given here. The MP53 is the new P3 scheme. MP38 is the new Thompson. EDMF is the new MOINN. And the standard is the standard suite. It's underneath a lot of these lines. Um, the upper air verification, this is another example of this. What, what again stands out is the KEPS, the new, um, new Ke epsilon theta squared scheme by Zanato. And you can see actually what we have here is in the temperature bias, we see a growing trend in 12 to 24 hours and then 36 to 48. So we have to look at that and people should be cautious of using that option until we figured out what's going on there. The testing did reveal other errors in that scheme related to the winds, which we did correct. But then when we corrected that, we still found this, this potential bias going on here. Most of the other things just overlay each other, so there's no major surprises there. For the climate suite uh, that I mentioned, we also did surface verification. One thing we noticed again, as like last year, there's the wind has less bias, and that's because this is the only one that runs NOAA MP. The other two run NOAA. Even though the wind has less bias, um, the RMS isn't much different. And it turns out, we've looked at this more closely in the last year, and it turns out it's not just roughness length, there are other things that differ between NOAA and NOAA MP. And even though it looks like a good bias that it's really canceling errors, there's some parts of the domain that are worse and some are better. So it's not that it's better overall, it's just the canceling errors in the bias, which mean the RMS doesn't really improve a lot. So we still have to look more at um, these differences between NOAA and NOAA MP, which are the main things you're seeing here. But as I mentioned, the climate suite um, does work as well as the other suites. So <coughs> there were no surprises in this. <clears throat> um, this tests the tropical suite, the CONUS and the, the CONUS suite with no MP. And again, just shows again that the CONUS with no MP, the red line has a lower wind bias. So we're just confirming that the no MP is the difference that um, that. We see some division of um, in the Q2 bias, we see a separation between the CONUS and the, and the, uh, the other two suites, uh, tropical and standard. Um, so no MP has a lower wind bias. U, US, YSU tends to have a lower Q2 bias and the, the T2 has mixed results. As you can see, the dynal cycle here varies, uh, which the biases vary across the suites. We also did some rainfall um, verification. Um, the only things that this is uh, the month total for February. We, we have a similar thing for May. Um, so this is the total rainfall. These are differences from the standard suite of various tests. This is the EDMF, which is the MYNN, new updated MYNN scheme. This is the MP38, which is the Thompson, the new Thompson. And this is the MP53, which is updated P3. Um, there are no real things that stand out here. There's they're basically the random differences. A slight tendency for the MYNN to have more rainfall, which you also see here in the, the time series of the total rainfall that the, the EDMF, the new MYNN tends to have slightly more rainfall. I think it also showed up in the summer option, the summer 
test cases. Um, now we go on to other aspects of our release. Uh, we have an updated uh, user's guide now available online at this page down here. Um, it's updated to version 4.5. It has pictures so and uh, it's a lot more attractive looking and you can navigate it more easily than the old user guide. So um, recommend people to browse that or at least in the table of contents. Thanks to Kelly Werner for putting that together. Later releases we're considering, as, as I mentioned, as, as people mentioned, Wolf's not going away anytime soon. Um, so we have a new configuration and build mechanism being worked on in MCube for robust library detection, for example. I think it uses CMake as well. The, integrating, we're integrating the use of Wolf, MPAS, and CM1 shared physics with a shared physics suite, and Laura Fowler will do more about that in her talk. It is so that we don't have to migrate um, certain physics uh, at least one physics suite across three different models and just share it from one repository instead. Um, continued updates of actively developed schemes. As I mentioned, there is still a lot of active development in the options and um, possible new microphysics from both Song Yu Hong and uh, we, we, we see a talk by Cliff Mass uh, as well. So we're looking at these as possible new options. Uh, will be presented tomorrow, I think. Continued WOLF support, we of course will continue to support the WOLF forum and answer questions there. Um, we will continue the two new user tutorials per year. The summer one we've decided will be in person. That's a, there's one in July coming up. And the winter ones will keep virtual because we've noticed a lot of people um, can't afford to come to our tutorials and this gives uh, other people an option to join them. Uh, typically we limit um, participation to 60 people because of our practice sessions. And th those are all done on, on the cloud. So both in the summer, summer and in per, and virtual, the, the, we use the, the cloud to do our practice sessions, to give everyone a uniform environment. We also will continue updates to code and documentation and um, manage our repository on uh, GitHub. Go ahead. Our next speaker will be uh, Bill Scamrock, uh, presenting uh, MPAS uh, updates. Well, thank you, Jordan. It's a pleasure to be here after, since 2019 was the last time we were all in person. So it's really nice. I'm gonna talk about MPAS updates. And uh, the first thing I want to note is that we released a new version of MPAS. Now the last major release we did was in 2019. So it's been a long time and we've been doing a lot. Uh, we released this last, just this past Friday, so we made it to a release before the Warp Impasse workshop. Uh, as you know, uh, Impasse has a lot of other things in it than just the atmosphere model. There's an ocean model, et cetera, but it's not an Earth system model. It's essentially a collection of die cores that share the unstructured horizontal Impasse mesh. Uh, today, what I want to talk about are, are effectively two things. One, I want to discuss a new release paradigm which we're moving to with this current release. And then I'll tell you about what's new in the version eight release that just appeared last Friday. So our new paradigm is one way to think of it is we're having, we're going to a new numbering system that looks a lot like WARF. There's a major number, a dot and a minor number and then a patch number. That patch number is primarily bug fixes like WARF and then minor and major releases. Where we are going to differ from WARF is that we're not going to do a yearly release. We are moving to a paradigm where we're gonna release when ready. And so 
we've had a major release. There are a lot of things sitting in the queue that we, that we dropped into this current release. But following this, we expect to release several uh, new updates to, to MPAS even through this calendar year. I expect we're gonna see two or three. I'm gonna talk about those on Thursday as kind of an introduction to the discussion session that we'll have Thursday afternoon. So, so you'll kind of see what's in the pipeline and what we're thinking about. And one thing we'll be looking for is your input into what you find perhaps that you really want to see so that we can maybe help our prioritization process to get those out. So uh, that's our new plan. That's our, our new release paradigm. And we're gonna release when ready. So in terms of what's new, Laura Fowler is going to talk about physics later this morning, so she'll cover that in addition to the shared physics repository. I think you'll hear about that. I'm going to talk about essentially some infrastructure updates, some initialization updates, and some updates to the dynamics, both for the global and regional implementation of MPAS. So essentially, in terms of the infrastructure, one of the major things here in this release is a new IO layer. It's called uh, Smile or Smeal. Uh, Michael can maybe pronounce it. We, we haven't decided how to best pronounce it, but, but that's what it is. And, and for those of you who have tried to build MPAS, you realize that the hardest part of building it is getting PIO and everything else, all the libraries it needs in place. And if you run very high resolution, oftentimes PIO is what dies when you have troubles uh, going to very high resolution. So uh, Smeal provides an alternative to that. It's very clean. It has very few dependencies, only MPI and, and PNET CDF, and gives you the same functionality in terms of how you can uh, do your IO. So uh, essentially when you use it, it's, you don't think about it. You don't have to change anything outside of the build with, with Smeal. And as noted, to do that, all you need to do is uh, deactivate the environment variable PIO and it will build Smeal. So we think this is a, a major advance here and will make it a lot easier for people to, to use MPAS because this has been a big sticking point, PIO. So uh, this is what happens when, when you try to build it, you deactivate it, you'll see it. And if you look in the log files, as you should when you run MPAS, you'll see at the end, it'll tell you how it built it and everything else going along with it. So it will tell you that it built it successfully. Another thing we've done is we've reorganized the halo exchanges in MPAS, uh, essentially aggregated them. Uh, essentially what it means is that instead of individual calls for each variable which we need to communicate at various points in the integration, uh, now we, we aggregate those when there are several at one, one point. Uh, the bottom line is what's in the old version. Um, and essentially that's replaced with, with a single with a single call. Our reason for doing this is essentially when you're running on GPUs, which we now have a ratio here at NCAR, so we're starting to run on GPUs, and we've been running on GPUs with some of our collaborators outside of NCAR for a long time. When you're running on GPUs, this uh, bringing these together and having a single call for these communications can significantly help the, the speed of that communications. We're finding a little bit of an improvement on CPU-based architectures, um, but that's not our primary reason for doing this. Uh, but the nice thing is it also cleans up the code. So if you look at where these things have to happen, it looks a lot, lot cleaner with this new implementation. So that's what's in, in MPAS version eight in the release that came out Friday. Now, going on to the, the dynamics and, and regional MPAS. Uh, essentially, uh, we've had it and been able to test MPAS in, in regional mode in collaboration with the group from NSSL, uh, the Warren Forecast Group. They've put together essentially a HER-like configuration that used MPAS. They cut out the, the HER domain from the three kilometer global mesh, and this is what they're running. And, and you can see that mesh you can kind of tell where, where it's cut out. It looks like a projection in wharf. Uh, so there's not rounded corners or anything. It has those sharp corners, but it's all there. We found out early on when we were running that occasionally forecasts would blow up. Yes. And this was the experience of, I think, some other groups that had tried regional impasse. And what we traced it to was uh, essentially instabilities that were growing in the uh, boundary region, the relaxation region of the lateral boundaries. And here's a plot in, in the center part here 
of, the, uh, of that lateral boundary off of Massachusetts. And you're looking at the, at the zonal wind. So it's the, the U component, the west-east wind. And you can see this uh, pattern by the boundary. And, and what this is is a growing mode that, that ends up uh, blowing up. I think the reason this is happening in impasse is that the boundary is corrugated because it's hexagons and you're cutting out from another mesh as opposed to the nice smooth boundaries and wharf. Well, it turns out there's a, a very simple fix for this. In that relaxation region, we, we apply a Laplacian filter to the difference between the driving analysis and the interior solution, which is also computed in that relaxation region. And what we did was we increased the coefficient in front of the divergent component of that Laplacian. So, so for the horizontal momentum, we write the Laplacian in terms of a horizontal divergence and a vertical vorticity. And so we can play around with the coefficients in front of those. And when you look on the right here, from, from left to right, you can see that uh, this noise just completely goes away and we get nice clean solutions. Now, now there's a mismatch at the boundary, but that's, that's life when you're running regional driving it from another analysis. It's, it's essentially one way. So you get these mismatches, but MPAS is now as well behaved as WARF. And I think this is a huge advance and from the, the daily forecast that the NSSL group has been doing since last fall, when we incorporated this kind of late in the year, early uh, this calendar year, uh, we've had very robust behavior in impasse. And I think this is the one of the improvements, one of the critical improvements that was needed to bring impasse to the point where I think it's ready for the same kinds of applications as WARF across the board in regional if the other components in impasse that you need are there. There are a couple other things we did. We, uh, we added in a generalization to the upper absorbing layer. Uh, this was incorporated in impasse, uh, this second order horizontal filter to the dynamics variables that is uh, started some number of levels below the model top to absorb gravity waves. Uh, we put this in there to be consistent with what's done in the climate model where this dynamical core is used. Uh, we've also found we sometimes use it in some simulations for the standalone version. And what we've done is provided a generalization of that. So that's one thing you'll see. Uh, of course, we have the default uh, wharf configuration in MPAS also where we uh, really damp the vertical velocity. So that's also there. In some of our, our diagnostics and comparing, uh, doing a close comparison, regional MPAS to WARF, uh, what we found was that in the diagnosed heights of pressure surface, uh, constant pressure, that there was a bias in WARF. Well, that bias was in, traced to the diagnostic, not to the MPAS integration itself. Uh, we've updated that diagnostic, so it uses a log P in the interpolation of the closed pressure. And that, that significant bias is, goes away. And that's also in the new release. The other thing we've incorporated in this release, we need to, at times, we need to essentially project the variables that are in the, the layers, the horizontal momentum U, uh, theta, the density, uh, to the W levels, which are at the interfaces. And the way we were doing it was we were doing a linear interpolation to those W levels. Uh, we've changed that to now we actually take the, the layer average between W levels, uh, assuming that, or, or through be, between the, in, the, the midpoint levels, uh, assuming that the values are constant in a given layer between the W levels. Uh, what that does is it actually just flips the weights from the linear interpolation. But what this gives you is that if you integrate the hydrostatic relation down from, for example, the model top or up from below, whether you integrate between W levels or you integrate between density levels, you get the same answer. Now, that, that's a nice thing when you're doing that integral, for example, in initialization, but perhaps even more importantly, particularly in longer term integrations where you're worried about the energetics, you can demonstrate that this is more consistent in terms of the in terms of the potential energy of the system. So the conservation properties are, are better maintained. And, and we learned that in some idealized testing on the sphere, uh, looking at the total energy budget. So, so this is why we did this. 
in terms of your actual applications, a short time, you're not going to see any difference at all in your solutions. They look very similar. So, so this is not a major change. But in terms of the consistency of the integration and the energetics, this is a nice addition here. Also, for those of you who've run MPAS for any length of time and gone between different domains, you're probably aware that there's a nameless parameter in the atmosphere that's this length scale, this config length dissipation, and that is supposed to be set to the smallest nominal grid scale in the model. And I think all of us who've run MPAS any number of times and changed between meshes have forgotten to change this and had your model blow up. And, and given that it's supposed to just be scaled with the smallest nominal length scale of the grid, why don't we just have it as part of the, the grid itself, the mesh itself? And we've done that. So with this release, uh, you no longer have to specify this in the name list. And hopefully this will clear up a lot of these mysterious blowups that happen when you move to new meshes and forget to change it. So we, we finally done that. Uh, and that was uh, Michael Duda who put that in. Uh, so that's there. Uh, this length scale is important because it's used to compute a number of the parameters for the integration uh, in the Smagorinsky eddy viscosity. This is the L squared that goes in front of the deformation to give you the, the eddy viscosity. We also run with a background fourth order hyperdiffusion on the dynamics variables. And this is essentially uh, that hyperdiffusion, that fourth order diffusion is proportional to this length, this cubed. So if you forget to set it properly, it, that's why things blow up. Uh, but it also sits in, in the divergence damping that filters acoustic waves. So that's also in the new release. We have incorporated a large number of changes into essentially the infrastructure of the model that most of you will never see unless you go digging for them. And this is because we've had to be compatible with the with CESM, with NCARS Earth System model, because MPAS is taken as a dynamic core and used in there. We're, we're running it regularly now in testing mode, uh, looking at its ability to actually forecast weather down at three kilometers in there. I'm not going to talk about that at this workshop, although I'll mention it a bit more Thursday afternoon in terms of future directions. Um, so uh, a lot of changes have come in uh, to accommodate that, that you're not going to have to see. W one thing I do want to point out, though, is that when you build MPAS inside of CESM, and I hope that functionality is going to be released somewhere in the next year, but I, I've been saying that for a couple of years now, and we're, we're getting closer, but we're not there yet. When you build it, it pulls MPAS directly from the MPAS development repository. So it's not as if we threw it over the fence to the climate model and they brought it in and we'd have to keep chasing it. No, it's part of the build of the climate system to take it from the MPAS repository. So just like we want to go single source for the physics in a shared physics repository, we're doing the same thing for the MPAS dynamical core to give us Earth system modeling capabilities, for example, coupling to an ocean, et cetera. So that's where that's going. And there's a couple other things there. Okay, in terms of uh, initialization, um, we've changed a few defaults. Uh, when you do a real data simulation in terms of the, the lower boundary, uh, it used to be that it was doing a, a linear extrapolation of the air temperature. Now it's keeping a lapse rate. Uh, this is actually in part, uh, we've got colleagues in Germany who are running a 1.5 kilometer global mesh. And that mesh is, uh, the topography is much finer then the analysis is driving it. And sometimes there are valleys that are much deeper than what they're seeing in the analysis. And that linear extrapolation was not particularly happy. Likewise, for the velocities, we hold it fixed when we get below there. So by incorporating that and a few other changes, we were able to get much uh, stable initializations for that uh, very high resolution application that was being done by, by, again, colleagues over in Europe. We've also enabled and, and this is a big thing here, enabled uh, parallel remapping of static fields. For those of you who've, who've done real data, you know that getting that static file can take a long time. 
because in previous releases, you had to run on effectively a single core, a single node. And now we've got a parallel version. So you don't need special partition files and you can run in, in parallel. So it goes a lot faster. So, so this is a really nice part of uh, updates to the initialization that should make your life a lot easier when you move to different meshes and you need new static files created. Okay, so um, the take home message here from this talk, the regional impasse is ready. I think we've incorporated a number of changes in this release that make it as robust as MPAS. So, so I, I wanna really emphasize this. If you're thinking about using MPAS, but you've been holding back, now's the time to try with this release if regional implementations and applications are what you want to do. Michael Duda is gonna give a, a mini tutorial Friday morning. And if you look at the, the abstract for that tutorial, he states that after the conclusion of this session, you'll be left with no doubt that running regional MPAS is, is at least as easy as running WARF, maybe easier. So I, I really encourage you uh, to, to try it if you're thinking about it and, and come to this uh, mini tutorial and, and see if Michael uh, makes good on his, his claim that it's as easy. And, and I think he probably will. Uh, again, you're gonna hear about physics updates uh, later this morning. We've got a new release paradigm. So you're going to be seeing new functionality come out hopefully on a regular basis. We've already got a couple lined up within, certainly within this calendar year, and hopefully we'll be able to get those through and out. And we've got a lot of other things back there. So we're looking forward to discussion Thursday, at least in part, to talk about what we should prioritize and, and get out to you. So, so we'll talk about that on Thursday, and I'm just gonna put up the, well, what's in this release as a conclusion. So thank you. And I think we have time for a few questions. Hi, uh, really interesting talk. I just would like to ask, uh, I know you mentioned that you're getting pretty good results with the regional impasse. How is that performing in terms of wall time relative to her or worth? Is the NSSL crew gonna talk about this? So, so, so essentially our, our, our own internally, we just find impasse runs about the same speed as wharf, but um, perhaps uh, should we wait until, well, can someone say something or? I can wait if there's a talk on it later. <laughs> Probably a little bit slower, but it's not enough slower to make it. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, we're, we're running these on uh, the Jet, NOAA Jet uh, supercomputer. And let's see, what are we running on? Um, I think we're running on, we're running on 200 nodes. Is that right? Yeah. Two, 200 nodes, it's about 1200 cores. We're not using all the cores on a node. And I think um, with that with that speed, with the 25 second um, time step, I, I'm not good at describing that. Uh, the runs all finish in less than three hours for a 48 hour forecast. Um, and then we're also doing a 60 hour forecast and that's, um, our runs are, are a little quicker with the Thompson microphysics, uh, the Nestle two moment run that we're doing uh, is a little bit longer just because the microphysics are more complicated. Great, thanks. I think you've shown this in the past, maybe once or twice, but what are the characteristic differences between WARF and MPAS? If you run with the same physics at the same resolution, is there anything striking about one versus the other? I would say nothing groundbreaking. I mean, so, so I think MPAS probably gives you a little bit better symmetry because it's got three axes instead of two in the horizontal. So, uh, but other than that, uh, we, we more or less designed it to get similar fidelity to convection as wharf. And, and I think we were able to meet that goal pretty much. So, so there's not a big difference. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. Um, I've got a quick two-part question on Smeal. Uh, does it include any asynchronous IO capabilities and also what is the performance compared to PIO? I'm going to defer to Michael on this. Uh, so in this release, we haven't included any of that asynchronous capability. Uh, I think we've had a lot of discussions about this. It's 
you think it ought to be a simple thing, but given the amount of effort, it you really just don't get much out of it. You try to set aside cores on nodes to say, all right, you know, we're gonna, let's say on Cheyenne, use the 36th core to do asynchronous IO on every node. Um, but that involves some sort of MPI communication, which seems to interfere with the integration rate. So you get offloaded IO, but slower integration rate. So at the end of the day, the total wall clock time is the same. So we've elected to keep things simple. So we could call it like, Smeal with two S's, the super simple and pass IO layer is, is basically what we've we've included. As far as performance, um, we didn't put up any numbers because I'm I'm not convinced that I haven't screwed something up and I want to be fair to PIO, but I'll just say it um, unofficially. I was doing some testing over the weekend um, on Cheyenne on about 400 nodes, so 14,400 cores the best IO rate that I could get with an up-to-date version of PIO, even making some tweaks to the rearranger method, which were suggested by the PIO developers, I could get output rates, writing a restart a history in a diagnostics file, maybe four or five gigabytes per second. With Smeal, using the same version of the PNET CDF library, we we're getting 25 gigabytes per second. So substantially faster, but I wanna be sure I'm not somehow being unfair to PIO. Um, but unofficially pretty good. So there is some, some benefit to simplicity, perhaps. Thanks, Mike. And, and I think our experience with asynchronous IO is, is shared across uh, different development groups across the world that it looks like a great idea, but devil's in the details there for sure. Our next speaker will be uh, Jake Liu, uh, presenting Wharf DA 4.5 and MPAS Jedi 2.0 update. Okay, good morning. Uh, so glad to so, uh, see you uh, in person. Uh, so my name is Jake Liu. Uh, I'm in a different section uh, uh, in MQ. Uh, this uh, prediction, the simulation, the risk communication. So uh, our section is responsible uh, for the data simulation. So I will uh, give you an update for both work for uh, DA 4.5 and uh, MPAT Zeta 2.0. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, there are mainly uh, two uh, new I terms uh, in work DA version 4.5. So first one, uh, is uh, uh, contributed by uh, Shen Yang, De Qinli, and uh, Li Qiangchen at the Institute of Atmospheric Environment uh, of CMA. Uh, they added a uh, regularized version of WSM6 microphysics schemes and also extended in their in the, the joint code uh, in Wolf Plus. Uh, so uh, this addition allows the analysis of all five uh, hydrometers using uh, when using Foldivar. So prior to uh, version 4.5, uh, Foldivar can only analyze cloud liquid water and the room water uh, with send linear the joint of a, a Walmart scheme. Uh, so I also gave the uh, name list option. Uh, uh, you can turn on or off this uh, scheme uh, when doing fault debug. Uh, so default is off, you know, like default, but you can, uh, uh, you know, just uh, uh, using this, uh, uh, you know, microphysics uh, 106 for uh, this uh, WSM6 scheme. So another new item uh, is uh, contributed by my NCA colleague, uh, Craig Swartz. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, he uh, added uh, more uh, uh, enhancement for uh, Himavari HI reading state. Uh, so I have to give a list here. Uh, also, uh, I put this information on the uh, website, uh, WorkDA website. You can check later time. So basically, uh, 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 you know, more important one uh, is uh, introduction of the all sky observation error model. Uh, for all sky HI data simulation. 
you can also optionally uh, read in the uh, use of uh, some level, uh, level two product like uh, cloud mask. Uh, you know, you can use that cloud mask uh, like for uh, cloud detection purpose uh, to just use clear sky uh, observations. And uh, uh, the more efficient read of sub area for disk uh, date. Uh, also, uh, another important one is a lot of use of uh, offline statistic of uh, constant bias correction values. Uh, what you can do a uh, VBC variational bias correction, but if you like, you can uh, also just uh, do some your uh, own offline statistic, like some constant bias correction. Uh, there are also uh, more uh, diagnostic output uh, uh, in O minus B O minus A feedback files. So there are two uh, new name, name list parameters. Uh, so one is for uh, turn on the uh, all sky observation error model. Another one is to apply uh, this uh, constant bias cracks and that's you can specify the uh, constant bias values in a file or uh, the readings info file. Uh, if you know where, where about uh, work DA. So, uh, so now uh, uh, we are, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, NKM cube. Uh, so we are transitioning from work data simulation to MPAS data simulation. Uh, so we will likely uh, still uh, keep updating work DA uh, as needed. Uh, especially uh, if there are uh, important contributions from the community. So if you have something I uh, want to be included, just reach out to me and we could help uh, you to uh, incorporate your uh, development in the future release. Uh, but we have no plan for the future of the tutorial. Uh, the last of the tutorial uh, that was in uh, 2019. And uh, also I want to uh, clearly mention that uh, so NKM Cube has not a dedicated star for answering uh, work DA related questions uh, in work and past forum. So we encourage users uh, to help each other, uh, uh, you know, for more experienced user, you know, may help uh, less experienced users. So, uh, so we also encourage uh, users to adopt m -pass data simulation based on ZDI. Uh, that's called uh, m -pass ZDI. So uh, internally, MCube, uh, uh, development moves to uh, uh, MPAT ZDI. Okay, so uh, we made a release, first MPAT ZDI release in September 2021, uh, be the uh, less than uh, two years ago. Uh, so we just, uh, uh, this week, uh, we, uh, we also uh, have a uh, MPAT ZDI 2.0 uh, release. That's kind of a code version of really soon uh, this year. Uh, for those of you who uh, don't know ZDI, so ZDI is uh, a project uh, led by Joint Center for Satellite Data Simulation. Uh, so a little bit trickier, uh, this MPAS ZDI is not like a WORF and MPAS model. You know, WORF and MPAS model is, is uh, it's just a single GitHub repository, okay? You can just, uh, uh, Git clone you know, one single repository uh, in terms of management, a little bit easier. Uh, but MPAS ZDI software package is a collection, uh, we also call it a bundle, if you like, a collection of uh, multiple GitHub code repositories uh, with model agnostic components. Uh, that's basically uh, led by ZCSDA and also contributed by our partners. And also MPAS specific interfaces uh, code repository that's a little developed by NKMQ. Uh, so this code version uh, is accessible from, uh, is a GitHub repository is called MPAS bundle. Okay, so it is kind of a bit uh, trickier, you know, I, uh, this Friday I will uh, give you some uh, mini tutorial about how to access, build and uh, give you some lab demonstration. So at least the major, this model uh, now stick components, basically four components. Uh, four components, uh, Oops, Saber, UFO, Yoda, that's mostly by, managed by uh, Joint Center for Satellite Data Simulation. 
And the right hand side, there are a few uh, repositories, mostly developed and managed by MQ. Uh, one thing I should mention also that, uh, so for compile MPAS data, we also need the MPAS model uh, in it. So MPAS model is part of this collection, this GitHub repositories. And for uh, currently we still using a, uh, uh, a separate MPAS version uh, that's based on uh, uh, version 7.0, not, not uh, latest 8.0 yet. Uh, because we have some uh, uh, modifications from data simulation group. Uh, those modifications not fully uh, merged back yet to the official release. Uh, but hopefully uh, before next release, uh, we will eventually uh, fully uh, integration between model data simulation. And also uh, uh, our data uh, MPAS data team uh, developed a uh, data simulation cycling workflow uh, that's under uh, this GitHub repository, uh, fully open source. Uh, so that's basically you can control it, uh, control your data simulation requirements. There are a lot of uh, settings uh, internally we are using. Uh, there are also a uh, observation processing format conversion. Uh, you can convert and send buffer observation uh, into uh, uh, Zeta format. Okay, so where we are now uh, with uh, 2.0 version. Uh, so basically, uh, MPAS data I mentioned last year, you can do deterministic analysis and also ensemble analysis. For deterministic analysis, you can do 3D VAR, 3D, 4D EMR, or their hybrid uh, with dual resolution capability. Uh, we can do also a multivariate static uh, background error covariance modeling. It's basically uh, follows with the GSI approach. Uh, for example, we also use a psychi to UV transform for multi-variate uh, correlation. And a special correlation the localization is based on so-called bump. Uh, I'm uh, not sure I still remember the bump, but this uh, developed mainly by CCSD uh, uh, Zeta core team. So ensemble approach, uh, we can do an uh, ensemble of uh, EMR uh, with perturbed observations. And for this 2.0 version, uh, we newly enabled LETKF. Uh, so LETKF is, uh, there is no, uh, uh, you don't need a perturbed observation. Uh, this one, uh, we didn't extensively uh, test yet, uh, but this uh, capability is available. And also a uh, nice thing uh, with MPAS data is uh, analysis directly down at MPAS unstructured grid. And you can do uniform or variable resolution mesh and you can do also global and regional. And uh, computationally uh, much more efficient than the uh, release one. So one of uh, advantages uh, to use Zeta is that you have uh, uh, you will have a more comprehensive capability for satellite data simulation. Uh, for reading state simulation, for example, you can use both uh, CRT and MNR12. Uh, even though uh, uh, so far uh, our team is mostly uh, using uh, CRTM. So for satellite readings, in general, you have a lot of, uh, uh, you can assimilate a lot of uh, reading state. Uh, so far, uh, we have tested uh, clear sky reading state for MSLA, MHS, and YAZI. Uh, for all sky data simulation, that's including clear picture and the cloudy picture. Uh, so we, uh, we tested MSLA window channel MHS and ABIHI from zero stationary satellite. And more recently, uh, ATMS uh, window channels. Uh, this uh, talk by uh, Jun Mei Ban this afternoon. Uh, you have also capability to doing a uh, variational bias correction. Uh, so uh, for all sky uh, data simulation, you, uh, you can include uh, cloud hydrometers as part of analysis variable. And uh, for GNSRO data simulation, you can do refractivity of bounding angle uh, with multiple choice of operators. Uh, so that's uh, quite, you know, because the, there, there are very many partners contributing to uh, this uh, satellite capability, you know, including NOAA, NASA, UK Met Office, 
so that's uh, is very uh, nice, uh, you know, cloud development. So uh, we made sure the uh, code uh, release code is robust and uh, perform perform uh, properly. And uh, by running a uh, uh, couple uh, months long cycling experiments, uh, so one is a 120 kilometer resolution uh, mesh uh, using 3D EMR, another 30 kilometer resolution using hybrid 3D EMR. Uh, what I showed here is the uh, O minus B O minus A time series over the four months. Uh, from the aircraft uh, uh, wing component and also uh, GNSSR refractivity. Uh, so basically you can see the 30 kilometer uh, background analysis fitting to observation is better than 120 that's where it's expected. Uh, so even though, you know, that's not something, uh, but that's very good uh, uh, check you know, for uh, the code uh, stability and uh, robustness and the performance. Uh, for this one, we have simulated uh, no reading state plus uh, MSLA and MHS clear, clear sky readings from multiple satellites. Okay, uh, we also uh, uh, run another experiment uh, by adding a hyperspectral IR sensor uh, named the Yazi. Uh, there are multiple hundred channels. Uh, uh, this one, we only assimilated 88 channels. Uh, so here I show that in the upper panels is the bias of verifier against the GFS analysis. Uh, that's the model level versus latitude bound. Uh, you can see uh, in the left, uh, we saw the uh, Yazi, you have the significant bias, temperature bias in the South Pole. And for this three temperature forecast, uh, but after adding Yazi, uh, the bias largely reduced. And the lower panel is the uh, UV compo uh, U component verifier against the GFS analysis. In the left is the road mean square error itself. In the right panel is the, uh, the, uh, the percentage road mean, error, uh, uh, road mean square error reduction uh, in percentage. So basically, uh, you know, yeah, they, they're largest impact. It's like uh, if you see uh, impact uh, uh, from operational center, that's basically yeah, they is most most of the time is ranked in the uh, in the first uh, place. And uh, one thing I mentioned, uh, we have got advanced the capability for doing uh, uh, all sky data simulation. So here I just. Uh, uh, showcase you a little bit uh, about the impact of simulating MSLA uh, window channel uh, at uh, 30 kilometer uh, using hybrid 3D EMR. Uh, so that uh, gives you some list of configuration here, but we are not uh, mentioned one by one. Uh, so basically uh, that's quite, uh, uh, you know, it's not comprehensive simulation of all satellite data, but this is a very, uh, a rich uh, observation uh, used in this set of uh, uh, cycling experiments. Uh, so for important thing for uh, all scattered simulation uh, is uh, we need to use so-called situation dependent uh, all sky observation error model. So basically uh, the observation error is a step function of uh, this uh, uh, so-called cloud uh, parameter. Uh, basically, that's the beam model, uh, like uh, indicated in the black uh, dash black curve. And uh, you can see that's the uh, uh, impact from uh, assimilating a MSLA window channel all sky, where for can CFS analysis for the day one to day 10. So basically, you can see for the uh, moisture field, uh, that's uh, averaged over all vertical column. Uh, you know, day one, you have about a 5% uh, improvement and the impact can last uh, up to 10 days. And uh, very efficient code, uh, you know, I probably sh I should not say very efficient, but it more efficient code allows high resolution global DA cycling. So uh, we recently also tried uh, the higher resolution, 15 kilometer, even 7.5 kilometer, that's maybe the highest resolution, uh, you know, ECMWF doing nine kilometers still. 
so that's hybrid uh, three. Uh, that's not hybrid. That's three D EMR with eighty uh, eighty ensemble member input at uh, fifteen kilometer. Uh, just show you a half man cycling uh, with this uh, fifteen kilometer seven point three meter in stable lane. And, uh, so just uh, tell you this efficiency is, is also quite good now with uh, latest code. Uh, like a model, uh, M pass model, we can also run regional M pass ZDI. Uh, so that's I tried with uh, this uh, four man cycling with three uh, three resolution setting at 15.7.5 and 3.75 kilometer. So basically, 3.7.5 is kind of convection permitting scale. This is mostly over uh, North America, so there is no readings for this range. And basically, uh, you can see the 7.5 kilometer, six hour forecast background fitting better than 15 kilometer one uh, to you know aircraft observation, radio sound observation. Uh, so negative means uh, the, the percentage root mean square reduction. Uh, you, you, you gain you know, with re increasing uh, resolution, you gain you know, one to three percent uh, in different vertical levels. And uh, uh, three uh, three point seven five kilometer, uh, uh, you you have further improvement for cloud. In this case, we compare against the independent ABI China ten readings. Uh, that's a lower level uh, troposphere uh, moisture field. Uh, uh, you know that's over UI. You can see the blue color in the right means uh, road mean square error reduced uh, by this uh, inflator observation. So just uh, concluding remarks. Uh, so I, I can see that MPAS data is rapidly maturing. Uh, I, I, so we, we strongly encourage uh, community users to adopt and transit from FDA to MPAS data, at least for weather applications. Uh, so almost ready for convective skill application, uh, surely for regionally. I think we close to do a data simulation at three, uh, four kilometer resolution globally. Uh, so we will have new computer uh, this fall. Uh, so hopefully uh, we can uh, experiment with more uh, high resolution and pass data with new computer. Uh, I should say that the documentation is not complete. Uh, we, we didn't have chance to update uh, the documentation from version two yet. Uh, but we will do this gradually over the next year. Uh, uh, so that's documentation is the key for the you know, community use. Uh, but uh, to begin with, uh, you can come to uh, this Friday and pass it a mini tutorial. Uh, so I will give you some uh, live demonstration how to download the build and run something. And uh, so we already set it uh, for the MPAS data tutorial together with MPAS model in September. Uh, so watch out for announcement for the, uh, for the tutorial. Okay, I have a couple of uh, uh, reference here. Uh, just uh, uh, I can take questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk. A uh, quick question. Can the Ampas Jedi be used with WARF? No, not for WARF. That's just basically for Ampas, yes. Our final talk of the session will be uh, from Jordan Schnell of uh, Series NOAA. Uh, WARFCAM v4.5 updates, applications, and future plans. Uh, Jordan, we can see you. Can you hear us? I can. Can you hear me? All right. You're, you're good to go. At, at 15 minutes, um, think about wrapping up, and time will end at 20. Thanks. Okay. Do you see my screen? Yes, we do. 
Okay, excellent. All right, well, thank you guys uh, for the introduction. Thank you uh, for being here today. Uh, my name is Jordan Schnell. I'm a research scientist at Ceres NOAA GSL. Uh, I'll try to get through this um, so you guys don't miss any coffee. Uh, so I'm just going to be talking about some of the developments um, that are in the WorfChem community version, uh, some of the applications that WorfChem is being used for, um, as well as some of the new developments um, kind of in the pipeline um, that we've been working on these applications and hope to uh, enter into the community version. So I'll just jump right in uh, with some bug fixes and enhancements for WorfChem version 4.5. Um, one is we addressed a bug introduced uh, in version 4.3 uh, that affects uh, users using ChemOps 201 and 202. Um, users are experiencing a stalled simulation. Essentially, you need, you need to set uh, one of, the, diag or one of the, the name list options in order for the diagnostics to be written to the output files. Uh, we've added an option to use uh, GFS total ozone uh, in the TUV photolysis scheme. Um, so essentially to, to get a better representation of that photolysis and the impacts due to the overhead ozone. Uh, chemistry option 100 um, has been moved to a unique module uh, separated from chemistry options 108 and 109 uh, due to subcrustal species that do exist in option 100 but don't exist in option 100 and 108. Um, so there's just some uh, memory mapping errors that that could occur there. Um, additionally, there was some uh, new developments, mostly on the WARF side, but also uh, very uh, connected to a WARF chem that uh, Joe Olson uh, will probably be talking about a little bit later this week. Uh, I'll mention here for the chemistry side, uh, but they've introduced uh, inline non-local mixing um, uh, with the MYNN EDMF scheme. There's still parts under development, um, and I'll go through some details here in just a second. I uh, also like to mention this, uh, this self-install script developed by Will Hathaway uh, as a meteorologist out of Texas. Um, so this is just a, kind of a one and done type of script where um, you run it on your system and it determines the different libraries that you need and does the installation for you of not just WARF or WARF Chem, but also many of the pre and post processor tools. Um, I know that he is continuously updating this, so um, it's kind of a nice way to get something installed on your system if you're not quite sure exactly how to do that or what packages you may need. Uh, so kind of going back to some of the developments, I'll start with this inline non-local mixing. Um, so to, to start off, the default way that WorfChem does this is that the exchange coefficients um, uh, that are computed in the, in the boundary layer scheme of your choice are passed to the dry deposition dry, uh, driver where local vertical mixing is performed alongside of dry deposition. The new code uses the deposition velocities uh, that are computed um, in the chemistry, um, passes that to the PVL scheme, specifically here the MYN and uh, EDMF, and does non-local mixing uh, alongside other species like water vapor, um, and then simultaneously does the dry deposition there. Uh, so we're working on some uh, uh, enhancements over urban cells and wildfire cells uh, to reduce uh, surface accumulation, especially during uh, some shallow boundary layers. This existed in the old version, um, but we're still testing some parameterizations for the new version. Um, so here's just another example of, uh, of how this might impact some simulations. Um, so on the left-hand side, you have some curtain plots. Uh, X-axis is just time and hours. Uh, Y-axis is uh, pressure or height. Uh, the, the shaded area is model simulated carbon monoxide in the top two plots, um, new mixing and old mixing, uh, respectively. And then the bottom plot is just showing you the water vapor mixing ratios. Uh, the uh, black line is the PBL height, and then the circled dots are uh, aqua airs measurements uh, to, to compare with the, the model simulated values. And so um, it's not quite obvious when you look at the two curtain plots, but if you look at this plot in the center, um, just the reds and the blues, this is the new mixing minus the old mixing. And so you can see that in general, we get um, um, much more enhanced uh, CO aloft um, and kind of reductions um, below that area. So kind of the surface to around 850 millibars or so, at least in this example, um, we're seeing uh, mostly reductions, um, but some increases aloft. And so um, uh, at least on the right-hand side here, we can see this uh, very clearly at one different time step. So uh, if we compare the red uh, line, which is the old mixing um, for carbon monoxide uh, as a function of height, um, and then the green line is the new mixing uh, carbon monoxide uh, mixing ratio as a function of height. 
and then pay attention to this uh, cyan color over here, which is the, the water vapor mixing ratio. And you can see that uh, with the new mixing, the carbon monoxide is, is mixed like uh, the uh, water vapor as opposed to this old mixing that kind of has this exponential uh, drop here. And this is due uh, largely to the, uh, the MF or mass flux component of the EDMF. Um, this was an area or a time period with uh, very deep boundary layers. You can see over here on the right um, with the, the black lines reaching uh, up to over four kilometers uh, at some points in time. So um, yeah, so we're seeing some pretty interesting results with this. Uh, kind of related, this wasn't introduced in version 4.5, but was introduced in ver ver version 4.4. Uh, the boundary layer clouds that are simulated in the MYNN scheme um, have been coupled to the photolysis scheme. This is specific to the TUV photolysis scheme. Um, so this is just an example of what that, um, what that impact uh, might look like. This is just a single time step um, from an 18 hour forecast. Um, on the left is just showing you the, the difference um, in the NO2 photolysis rates. Um, and then on the right hand side is just showing you the difference in ozone um, that results uh, from this, uh, this new coupling. And so um, obviously it's very dependent on what sort of uh, boundary layer clouds you might be simulating. But here in this example, we're seeing reductions of you know, anywhere from you know, one to five PPB uh, where these uh, clouds are being simulated. And so uh, for those of you that might be struggling with that last few five PPB, this could be um, uh, something uh, to look into. Um, and, and so uh, many of the mechanisms are not coupled to the TUV scheme. Um, they're mostly just coupled to the Mozart uh, scheme, but I just wanted to mention that um, it is fairly easy to do this, uh, to couple it to uh, your specific scheme. There's just a mapping file that you need to include um, in the KPP directory um, for the mechanism of your choice. And I'm just providing an example here um, that's in the, the T1 Lodzgard uh, mechanism. Okay, and so some of the applications um, that WarfChem has been using, uh, or WarfChem has, has been uh, able to, to do for us um, here at NOAA GSL, is that we've coupled uh, the rapid refresh or the operational wrap smoke model to the WarfChem chemistry packages uh, to, do, to, to do full chemistry forecasts over the entire wrap domain. Uh, so this is a 13 kilometer forecast um, using the operational wrap input and boundary conditions. Uh, we run two forecasts uh, a day, 36 hours a piece at 6Z and 18Z. Uh, this has been running since about July 2020. Uh, the chemical mechanism we're using is a simplified carbon bond, uh, similar to CBM4. Uh, it's got a less than 100 species and 100 reactions, so about half that, um, uh, at least in terms of species, um, and compared to what's being used in the operational air quality forecasts. Uh, we've got pretty much every online emission uh, imaginable except volcanoes, um, dust, sea salt, biogenics. Uh, the wildfire and plume rise algorithm is coming right out of the wrap and her smoke systems. Um, and then we also have an experimental pollen forecast. Uh, as I said, the, uh, we've coupled uh, the TUV scheme to this, uh, th this mechanism. And so we've included the aerosol direct effects, um, both photolysis and radiation. Uh, for my, uh, microphysics, we're using the, the Thompson scheme, uh, which we've actually loosely coupled to our prognostic aerosols, which I'll, I'll briefly describe here in a second. Um, the chemical vertical mixing I've gone through uh, it is in line with MYN. Um, our boundary conditions are coming from the Rackham's model out of the University of Wisconsin uh, with total ozone uh, coming from GFS um, through that work chem update. Um, and then we're also running a near real-time verification system um, against uh, air now measurements using the Melody's Monet platform, which I'll, I'll briefly describe as well. So here's just what the website uh, looks like for the RAPCHEM. Uh, we've got different domains to choose from, uh, different species and um, cross sections and that sort of thing. So if you're interested, uh, please have a look. Um, I'll briefly mention that we extended the RAPCHEM forecast uh, to uh, a three kilometer CONUS wide forecast uh, running at three, uh, running for about two months uh, last fall. Um, we're now kind of using it for some more high resolution retrospective uh, simulation now that we have kind of the framework set up, um, mainly because it's an extremely expensive system to operate. Um, we're talking about, uh, yeah, 15,000 core hours or so for a 24 hour forecast. So. Um, quite the quite the hog in terms of, of core hours, and this is with the reduced mechanism. So um, yeah, we're we're trying to to speed this up. Um, some additional applications that RAPCHEM is being used for, as well as uh, the NCAR WARFCHEM model. Um, these, uh, uh, in addition to the the NASA model, we've been contributing to the tropospheric ozone lidar network. Um, 
uh, early warning system. And so essentially these models will forecast the stratospheric intrusion, um, will get notified that there may be one coming, instruments are turned on and operated um, in, in order to capture the event. And so um, here's just showing an example from uh, last June uh, of a, an intrusion that occurred here over the front range. Uh, it didn't quite make it to the surface monitors um, at the actually instrument location, but um, in the bottom right, if you look at the MDA ozone uh, monitors kind of around the metro area um, and, and up higher into the mountains, you can see that there are some exceedances that uh, very well could have been um, related to the stratospheric intrusion event. Um, so uh, an exceptional event uh, of sorts. Uh, as I mentioned, we do have a, uh, an experimental pollen forecast in the model. Um, this is coming from uh, Allison Steiner's group out of the University of Mich Michigan. Um, so the emissions are, are online, so it's similar to biogenics and where you have an emission potential, um, and then those are modified uh, by precipitation, wind speed, and sunlight. Um, it's been coupled to the made sorghum uh, aerosol scheme uh, with two species, a primary um, and a secondary or sub-pollen particle, uh, the latter of which forms due to uh, the rupture of the primary particles from uh, humidity uh, or lightning. Uh, there are species-specific emissions available, but we've not really validated um, the uh, kind of bulk forecast yet. So before we extend it to any more uh, complicated versions, we're going to want to evaluate this. Uh, but I, I hope to get this in the community version. But um, in the meantime, if you're interested, the main um, uh, Allison Signers group out of the University of Michigan is the one uh, that's kind of spearheading this. I also mentioned um, this uh, coupling to the uh, Thompson microphysics scheme. Um, so um, some of you may be aware, some of you not, um, when wanting to include uh, uh, cloud chemistry um, in your wharf chem simulations, this requires the addition of essentially doubling um, your aerosol uh, species um, and so can make your simulations very expensive. And so the Thompson scheme um, is kind of an intermediate complexity with uh, just two different aerosols. Um, this is the water-friendly and ice-friendly aerosols. And so these can be a, a climatological um, value, um, or for example, you might get them from uh, the GFS model. Uh, but essentially what we've done is just couple them to the prognostic aerosols in our simulations, um, where we, uh, we convert the organic carbon, sea salt, and sulfate con concentrations to number concentrations of water-friendly and aerosols, and then the dust goes into the ice-friendly aerosols. And so here's just an example of, um, from September of 2020. Um, during the kind of severe wildfire period that occurred over the Northwest. Uh, the water-friendly aerosols from GFS are shown here uh, on the left. Uh, and the second column um, is with the RAPCHEM water-friendly aerosols that we've calculated with, uh, with our parameterization. And then the third column is just showing you the difference um, between um, the RAPCHEM simulations and, and the GFS aerosols. Um, and kind of showing you where that location is when you look at um, the PM2.5 simulated by uh, RAP chem as well. And so this could have some downstream effects on some precipitation, of course, cloud formation. Um, we're still um, uh, very much actively looking into this. Uh, so it's kind of a summary of uh, the in the pipeline developments um, for the next version of warp chem uh, coming out of NOAA GSL, um, kind of improving or enhancing this, um, this MYNN EDMF coupling to the uh, vertical mixing for chemical species. Uh, this FRP-based plumerize that's in the RAP and HER smoke models, um, we're, we're hoping to get this in the community version as a, as a new plumerize uh, method. Uh, the reduced uh, hydrocarbon mechanism that's running in RAP chem, um, we'd like to get in the community version as well as some of the other um, uh, options that are in uh, RAP chem, including this uh, water-friendly and ice-friendly aerosol conversion, uh, the pollen uh, emission algorithm. Um, and the, the function dust uh, scheme, which is running in the operational air quality models, but it's just not made it into uh, wharf chem yet. Um, so finally, I wanted to uh, touch a little bit on something that I was kind of interested in, uh, a paper that came out um, a couple uh, months ago. Uh, it's a, a way of coupling uh, Fortran or the wharf code with uh, Python. So essentially being able to call a Python function um, from the wharf code. And so we're using this, um, in the, in the machine learning uh, uh, realm in terms of, of fire prediction. Um, but I would imagine that many of you have all sorts of, of ways that you might be interested in, in uh, using Python in your work. And I'll just kind of wanted to show this. Of course, this is not code that you might be able to use, but 
uh, I was able to do this um, in just a, a couple quick sessions of, of looking at some of the code that um, the authors kindly shared, um, kind of testing, adding a adding a number to a 2D array that I passed to a Python function and, um, and was successful. It even has some options for um, some Quilt-like servers where you can run the Python, um, uh, uh, call Python using dedicated servers so you're not waiting on uh, the rest of the simulation to integrate or waiting on that to finish in, in order to continue the integration. And so, uh, yeah, so in, in terms of the, the model evaluation, um, I wanted to mention this Melodies Monet uh, platform. Uh, Mary Barth may, may discuss this in terms of the musical work that's been going on, but it's essentially a platform to be able to quickly compare multiple models uh, against observations. Right now, it's mostly uh, set up to do uh, comparisons for the Air Now network um, over the US, but highly, highly flexible. Um, updates being added every day in terms of field campaigns, satellite comparisons, um, the the Aeronet AOD network uh, all across the, uh, the world as well. So um, they are looking for testers. So if this is something that you're interested in, um, I highly recommend you checking it out. We've been using it for um, our real-time or near real-time verification system, um, comparing not just the RAPCAM forecasts and the, the HER smoke and the RAP smoke, but also the NCAR forecasts, uh, the operational air quality forecasts uh, coming out of uh, ARL, EPA, National Weather Service, and some of the new even experimental models that are that are being developed. And so you can make all these different fun plots um, uh, just uh, very quickly uh, without a whole lot of work. Um, and, and you can run these, um, you know, batch script uh, very quickly uh, so you can produce these, these plots. So what is the future of WarpChem? Um, NOAA ESRL uh, will continue to support and maintain the WarpChem code, um, though most of our effort is focusing on the development of the FE3-based models, um, so those in the, the UFS framework. Uh, some schemes um, currently in WarpChem are, are already being put into UFS or those UFS-based models. Uh, NCAR will continue uh, to use WarpChem for research, though most of their major efforts is focusing on Musica. Uh, that said, uh, have no fear. Uh, WorkChem is here to stay, uh, though um, uh, your students and your student students may be using a, a, a different framework, likely uh, within the UFS realm. Um, and we'll talk about that here today, but um, yeah, keep your ears open for uh, those developments. And so with that, thank you, and I will take any questions. Thanks a lot. Uh, questions from the audience here, uh, Mary. Hi, Jordan. Uh, nice talk. I was curious about one of your slides on using the um, thompson eidheimer scheme with um, WFA and, um, and WIA. Have you made any comparisons with a full-up sophisticated aerosol scheme? We are work. Yeah, we're working on that right now, actually, um, as part of uh, uh, something through the the NOAA Earth Radiation ERB um, initiative. Um, so that's that's kind of the idea. Is um, I'm not seeing um, as strong of impacts as I'd like to see um, uh, with the with this uh, kind of conversion. Certainly, um, there are uh, are th so far I'm seeing better results with the full cloud chemistry, um, but. I think at this point, it's there's going to be a decision um, in terms of you know how much do we want to reduce that bias for how much computational power I think is is some of the questions that we still have. Um, yeah, we I, I don't have any of those results here, but I'm happy to talk about that offline and um, some of the parameterizations that we've used. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, just yeah, going for some so simple to so complicated. You know, how do you balance that? Like you said. Yeah, um, and you know, essentially, it, it's not you know, it, it it's not even adding any uh, really time complexity or um, you know, computational power because those feces are already in there, and so um, they're going to be carried around anyways. And so this is a a way just to make them essentially a diagnostic instead of a prognostic species. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions here? No? Okay, folks, uh, that brings us to the end of this session. Uh, thanks to all our speakers. We'll uh, reconvene at 10.35. Okay, we're ready to start. Um, the first speaker is actually gonna be a recording. Uh, Sin Lin Hay is gonna talk about the, um, the uh, recent updates in wharf urban and land surface models. So being a recording, he's not even online. And um, 
uh, there probably won't be questions unless somebody in the audience can answer them. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Um, sorry, I cannot be here today in person to present these uh, um, updates uh, because of a conflicting conference. So I will use this pre-recorded video to uh, describe some of the major updates um, related to the uh, land components in WORF version 4.5. Um, those changes are mainly related to non-MP land service model and the WORF urban parts. So first, um, let's look at the non-MP related updates. Um, so we have a few um, bug fixes uh, related to the variable units, variable attributes, and also the way uh, several uh, mixing ratios are calculated in Jarvis thematic conduction schemes in non-MP. Um, and we also bring some of the hard-coded parameters and variables to uh, uh, um, non MP parameter tables or using a more generic treatment. Uh, these will provide a more convenient parameter tuning for the users. Um, so, if you are interested in the bug fixes, please take a look at the list and also take a look at the uh, work for um, GitHub. Um, one major um, updates regarding the non MP land service model I would like to mention here is that there is a recent um, effort to refactor or modernize a non-MP model code, which has been released as the um, non-MP version 5.0. Uh, but uh, please note that this version 5.0 has not been implemented or coupled with the WORF uh, framework yet. Uh, so it is only currently available as an offline model, um, which can be run itself, uh, um, showing here in this uh, uh, GitHub link here. Um, so we plan to couple this refactored non-MP version 5.0 with WORF later this year. Uh, hopefully uh, users can use this uh, um, uh, in the future. Um, so uh, there is also ongoing work to couple the latest non-MP version with MPAS. Please see Laura's uh, presentation um, for details. Uh, I would like to note that uh, the version 5.0 has exactly the same physics as uh, uh, version 4.5 for non MP, but they just have entirely different model structures. Um, uh, with the version 5.0 having uh, enhanced uh, modularity, interoperability, and also applicability. Um, along with this code update, uh, we also provide a very comprehensive uh, tech note for NOMP to describe the mathematical formulations and uh, uh, model physics uh, uh, for the NOMP model. Um, so on the upper left here, uh, I'm showing the DOI website link where you can get this uh, tech note uh, um, for free, uh, which is stored uh, as part of the uh, non um, NCAR library. Uh, archive. Um, so in addition, we also have a separate uh, um, peer review journal submission to describe this modernized non-MP version uh, in GMD. Um, so if you are interested in the key features of the uh, version 5.0, please take a look at this uh, paper, um, which is currently still in review. Um, so some of the key features I would like to mention, uh, which includes the enhanced uh, model modularization, data structures, code and coupling structures, as well as the model variable names. So here I'm just using one slide to give you a demonstration of the enhanced code and data structures in non-MP version 5.0. On the left, as you can see here, each of the key physics uh, have been um, divided or um, separated into uh, each individual uh, modules uh, uh, with the enhanced modularization structures. Uh, if you remember, the, by default, the previous uh, non-MP only has one single uh, Fortran file uh, with more than 12,000 lines of code uh, as the source code. Uh, but now um, we separate that into different modules, uh, which allow users to modify the code more easily. Um, and on the right, uh, we also restructured the model, uh, non-MP model code into five different uh, 
uh, types, uh, including the forcing, configuration, energy, water, and the biochem. Uh, and uh, under each of these uh, um, uh, types, uh, we have the subtype. In, for example, uh, under energy, we have the flux type uh, variable, state type variable, and the parameter type variables. So in this way, P, uh, users are uh, uh, can um, pass the variables and define the variables uh, in a more convenient way. Um, so if you are interested in more details about the most recent non-P adv scientific advances and model code updates, uh, please also take a look at this uh, um, international non P annual users workshop and tutorial materials. Uh, the recordings uh, and the presentation slides are publicly available at this uh, website. Uh, so this was held re just recently, about three weeks ago or at NCAR. And uh, um, uh, we are very fortunate to have more than uh, 1,200 uh, wo uh, workshop uh, registered uh, participants from uh, 16 countries. Uh, we really appreciate the community interest and uh, um, uh, enthusiasm in this uh, uh, workshop. Okay, so next few slides were about, uh, will be about the uh, war for urban updates. Um, so just as a reminder for people who are not familiar with the world of urban system, so we have uh, three different uh, uh, urban physics options in WORF. Uh, option one is single layer UCM, option two is a multi-layer UCM, uh, which is called BAP, Building Effect Parameterization, and uh, uh, option three is uh, uh, the multi-layer UCM plus the building energy model, uh, which is the BAP BAM. So to uh, to activate these uh, urban physics schemes, uh, uh, we also needed uh, to have uh, uh, two important uh, uh, input data. One is the um, urban land type uh, specified for each of the urban grids. Uh, the second one is the uh, urban parameter table, where uh, the model reads in the um, parameters like the building height, the street width, uh, the uh, building height to width ratios, something like that, uh, uh, according to the specific uh, uh, urban types uh, uh, specified for each of the grid. Um, so recently, uh, we work with the uh, original data developer for the uh, urban local climate zone uh, data sets um, by implementing a global 100 meter uh, local climate zone maps into the WOLF WPS. So, or, so previously, uh, users, if you, if users want to use this uh, um, global LCC map, they have to go to the external data set and use the external uh, uh, pre-processing tools to uh, regrade this data set into the WOLF GOEM, uh, WPS GOEM file. Now, or oh, since we already implement this, implemented this data set into the WOLF WPS system, uh, so what user needs users need to do is just to run the regular WPS and specify this uh, new data set name in the WPS name list. Uh, and uh, um, the model will automatically use this data set and remap to the study domain uh, at specific uh, spatial resolution. So one important note is that uh, currently this data set only work only works with uh, the modis land type because uh, we essentially we merge the urban local climate zone on categories with the global modis data set to come up with this uh, global map. Um, um, if you are interested in um, how this uh, data set uh, has been developed, please take a look at these technical documentations uh, provided in this, uh, in this uh, open data repository. Um, and if you want to download the data from uh, external website link, so here on the left, I'm, sh uh, I'm providing the link here. Uh, and uh, 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 users can also download the data set in a binary format uh, in the uh, WORF WPS uh, data archive uh, shown on the right. Um, so if users want to use this, as I mentioned earlier, uh, what they need to do is just three steps. Um, first, uh, in namelist.wps, um, you need to specify the CGLC modis LCZ dataset plus default. 
for the geo data res uh, entry. Uh, in geo grid folder, you need to link the LCZ's um, a new geo grid table uh, to be your default one. Uh, and then lastly, you need to activate the uh, use of the LCZ in the namelist.input and also activate the work urban physics. Um, so inside the world of urban systems, uh, we essentially uh, map the original LCZ uh, categorization uh, from number one to number 10 um, to the uh, wolf land use type uh, 51 all the way up to 61. So one important note is that before WOLF version 4.4.2, the LCC numbering inside the WOLF is uh, um, from 31 to 41. However, uh, we got the report from the users uh, uh, with a bug fix that um, this uh, numbering from 31 to 41 is actually overlapping with the uh, NLCD 40 land categorization system. So starting from the WORF version 4.4.2, the LCZ numbering inside the WORF has been changed to 51 to 61 to avoid overlapping with any of the existing land type data sets inside the WORF. Uh, and, uh, uh, also, we have fixed uh, uh, important uh, bug in the roof long wave calculations in the backfam urban uh, schemes. Um, if you are interested in this, uh, please take a look at the uh, pull request descriptions in WOLF uh, repository. Okay, now lastly, I would like to mention one important upcoming uh, updates regarding the WOLF uh, non-MP system. So uh, the team from uh, University of Wisconsin Medicine um, has been working on developing a mosaic subgrid treatment inside the non-MP uh, with the lateral service water transfer between these subgrids, uh, uh, which has been um, implemented and successfully uh, run uh, in the WOLF non-MP coupled system uh, in this group. Um, so. Now this code is still being testing. Uh, it has not been officially implemented into the WOLF or no MP uh, uh, community uh, code version, but uh, uh, I would expect that this uh, is going to be uh, officially merged to the uh, WOLF and no MP code soon, probably later this year. Um, just as a demonstration of the impact uh, by using this mosaic, uh, treatment. So on the left, uh, I'm showing the le uh, the traditional one grid treatment inside the WOLF no MP system for the lateral transfer or service water transfer. And then on the right, I'm showing the mosaic treatment with the lateral service water transfer. As you can see here, compared to the default treatment, uh, the temperature bias uh, by using the mosaic scheme uh, are significantly reduced. Uh, which is showing the uh, very promising results from the mosaic treatment. Okay, so with that, I would like to stop here. Uh, and again, sorry, I cannot be there, uh, be here in person to answer your questions. But if you have any questions, uh, please email me uh, at this uh, um, uh, email address or email the uh, entire WOLF team. So we will try our best to answer your questions. And with that, I would like to stop here. Thank you. Oh, there is a question. We'll see how that works. Go on, Cliff. Yeah, I have a problem. It's... Do we, it was, now it's working good. Um, one thing we've noticed running uh, no MP for long periods over the Northwest is we still have these extreme cold biases when snow's on the ground during the winter time. It's, it's, a, really, it's, a, it's a really substantial problem. In fact, we had a pull off no MP during the winter time. It was so bad. Um, is, is there any progress in fixing this problem? I, I'm only vaguely in that group. So I think they, they certainly look at snow cover issues that they're, they're 
they're gradually making progress on some of these issues, but no, I, I, I've seen those problems too. And it, it's still there and it's very, it can be very large, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. I can Another help one. you answer this question. All oh, right. Sure. Uh, now I'm working with Chenlin to fix this problem, especially we are developing a physical radiation trans of skin, the sneaker and a couple of the no MPM we try to input this part of the snow albedo and the snow process. So yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Okay, thank you. Okay, I, I had a brief question about that new data set since- Yeah, LCZ. Um, yeah, since- in pre at least in previous versions in 4.4.2 um i don't believe you could use an lcz map with no mp is that different with this new data set can that be used with no mp or are you limited to other land surface models i think it was initially implemented for no mp even before 4.4.2 um but it wasn't in integrated with the pre-processing system so now it's part of the pre-processing system okay. and everything mapped onto modus Excellent. So it is. And people are not familiar, LCZ is um, extending the urban categories from three to 11. So it has a lot, a lot more detailed maps of urban areas and they're global. Okay, so we're a little ahead of schedule. We'll move on to the next talk, which is uh, Laura Fowler, who will talk about physics updates. Uh, the yellow light. Oh, where is the yellow light? Oh, that light. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. So I let's see. Let me move. If this should go. Here we go. Uh, so I divided this uh, talk in four separate parts. First, I'm going to talk about a few bug fix and simple physics updates that we did in uh, version uh, 8.0. Then I'm going to describe a new concept and a roadmap to the MMM shared physics repository. Some physics updates in uh, MPAS 8.0 and, and then list a few additional physics updates that are going to come this summer uh, using the new numbering system that uh, Bill described earlier this morning. I'm sure I touched the right button, I should move ahead. Here we go. So the first bug fix relates to the initializations of the annual maximum snow albedo over sea ice point. So in version 7.3, we actually didn't correctly do that. Uh, and the annual maximum snow albedo was set to zero, uh, as you can see over, let's see this button, oops, okay, here we go. Uh, I need to go back a little bit. Okay. Uh, as you can see over uh, the Arctic Oceans and off the coast of Antarctica. Now in version 8.0, we corrected that uh, bug and we now set the snow albedo to a value of 0 0.75 over sea ice. And you can see the increased uh, surface uh, snow ice albedo over off the coast of Antarctica. Hmm. I can advance them for you if you just tell me to click next. Okay, yes, that would be great, thank you. So the second bug fix relates to the initializations of fractional sea ice over cold ocean uh, temperature. This is simply a map that shows uh, sea surface temperature that are colder than 271 degrees Celsius. So in version 7.3, we use that 271K uh, threshold to decide when fractional sea ice is going to be set equal to one. And I think historically comes from the fact that in older meteorological input data set, we didn't have any fractional sea ice. So therefore we had to add that, that threshold. That led to pretty high uh, fractional sea ice, again, for instance, along the coast of Antarctica. So we corrected that bias in version 8.0, and now we only uh, set that fractional sea ice to one when the sea surface temperature are uh, colder than 100 K or sometimes missing. 
So now you can see that we have a decrease in the uh, fractional sea ice along the coast of Antarctica from a value of one to values between uh, 8, 8 and 0 0.96. Have the next slide, please. So ad additional bug fix and simple physics updates. So we can also consolidate the calculations of the advective tendency of the potential temperature for the scale aware and TITCO and graphite ice convection scheme in the dynamical core. Initially, in version uh, 7.3, they were not actually calculated the same way. Now they are calculated the same way, and they are, and that's kind of a lot more consistent with what the physics wants to see. We also added the scale aware versions of the NTCO convection scheme. So just as we did for, uh, for WOLF. We finally updated the NOAA land surface scheme to the WOLF release 4.5. We had a pretty old version of, of the scheme there. The updates being uh, mainly introduced in the urban physics that made us include those uh, made updates to the input uh, table files that reads the land use, the soil, and vegetation, and vegetation, vegetation parameters. So those updates were mainly, mainly made in the main uh, uh, initialization driver in, in MPAS. And the next slide, please. Next, I'm going to move on and talk about that new concept and infrastructures for uh, physics implementations and physics update that we refer to as the MCUBE Shared Physics Repository. And I started to describe that concept uh, last year at the virtual workshop in uh, 2022. So we described the new infrastructures with the idea that we wanted to facilitate implementations across uh, uh, the different models that are developed and maintained at MCUM, namely WORF, MPAS, and the cloud model version one that would facilitate not only the implementations of additional physics, but also the interoperability interoperability between those different models and comparisons. So we are basing these new infrastructures on three main components. The first one is the use of the common community physics package. I simply add a link to the descriptions of what CCPP is. It describes the CCPP framework and the structures of a CCPP compliant physics parameterizations that is going to be used here. The second component is a public GetUp shared physics repository, which is going to be accessed by all three models. And finally, we're going to use the managed external tool to check out the physics suites and parameterizations. So this schematic shows that uh, MPAS and CM1 here directly use the physics parameterization that are available from WORF as is. So the idea is to remove the dependencies of the WORF coding structure and to use that shared physics repository that will net contain all physics parameterizations that are going to be CCPP compliant. The added advantage of doing this is that for a different a separate host model, except for instance, the community atmospheric model in CC CSM would be also available to simply implement, for instance, the mesoscale physics uh, suite coming from, from MCUBE. So different facts and motivations here, updating MPAS and CM1 from annual work release is sometimes can be a, a tedious process. That explains the reason why in the public release versions, MPAS has not been systematically updated and is not in sync with most, uh, most of the work, most recent physics. So for instance, here I am listing uh, the suite of parameters, the list of uh, uh, parameterizations that are used in the convection, in the convection permitting suite and the associated uh, work release version. So if you look at the Thomson uh, cloud macrophysics here, the version is come all the way from back to version uh, 3.8, except for a few easy updates, meaning that in particular, we do not use the aerosol wear version of the little scheme. For the uh, MYNN surface layer scheme and PBL scheme, the version dates back from 3.6, meaning that in particular, we still don't use the ADMF version uh, that, uh, that is available in the most recent version of, of WOLF. So this is very really deficiencies in the, in the MPAS physics that, that, that can be uh, alleviated by, by using a, uh, a shared physics repository. 
So once it's updated, the MPAS physics is not always tested at all scale, global, regional, and cloud scale through the same set of standardized regression tests that are available currently with the world physics. So now we know that physics parameterizations are being developed and tuned for WORF, and maybe they, mean they need to be retuned and adjusted for to run on global scale within MPAS. We also know that physics parameterizations to run in MPAS correctly must be evaluated using a variable resolution framework, which allows us to test those physics parameterizations at coarse and high resolutions. So we definitely need to uh, develop a set of regression tests in a more rigorous way that we have done, been doing so far. And we think that regional MPAS will have a very significant role in the development of those, of those regression tests. So in version 7.3 of MPAS, we know that the physics modules are very much worth centric depends on the worth coding structures. And that makes it sometimes difficult to connect to a different host model. For instance, you can have extra capabilities in WORF that may be needed at very high resolutions like urban physics, physics which are not really uh, uh, yet available to be used on a global scale. So in version 8.0, uh, we modified the modules that are available in that physics underscore WORF directory, and we split it into two files. So the actual parameterizations now is moved to a separate subdirectory called physics underscore MMM. And the source code in that directory is going to be or is CCPP compliant. And the remaining source code now is simply reduced to an interface between the MPAS driver and the actual parameterizations. Uh, once uh, all the physics parameterizations are CCPP compliant and have been fully tested be between WORF, MPAS, and CM1, then we can, in, at least in MPAS, further simplify those drivers uh, and make them uh, more consistent with the uh, structure of, of MPAS. So to date, we have applied those changes to the most physics parameterizations that are currently available in the mesoscale reference suite, meaning the YSU PBR scheme, the WSM6 current macrophysics, the NTTQ convection scheme, and we have done some comparisons between uh, those uh, CCPP compliant parameterizations and use them in the DTC single column uh, model. I want to refer you to the poster by Lee et al, which is available in session six. Uh, most physics parameterizations for the convection permitting suites is one on the way because we have already have earlier versions of the CCPP compliant MYNN scheme, as well as some earlier version of the RTMG radiation scheme. So I was, as I was just saying in uh, MPAS uh, 7.3, every modules contain that uh, physics underscore work directory the every module is contained both the driver interface and the actual parameterization. So the paradigm here is in version 8.0. Now we kind of added that physics underscore MMM directory and we retain the physics underscore WORF directory. So for the CCPP compliant physics, now in the WORF subdirectory, the, the modules are simply uh, drivers or interface between the higher uh, label MPAS drivers and the parameterization themselves. Now in physics underscore MMM, all the modules contain the parameterizations only. So for instance, for the mesoscale reference suite, we have the gravity wave drag over orography, the YSU PBL, the WSM6 cloud macrophysics, and the MM5 revised surface layer scheme that are all CCPP compliant. And now with the corresponding modules in the physics and the work correct, uh, directory are simple interface between the MPAS drivers and the prioritizations. So what does a modified uh, module in the physics underscore work directory looks like? This is an example of what we've done for the entity prioritizations of convection. Uh, here are the three, here are the three uh, subroutines that are needed to run the convection scheme. Those three subroutines are CCPP compliant, and now they are sitting in the physics underscore MMM uh, directory. The source code above and below are now simple, simple rewriting of the global variable 
the 3D global variable needed in worth to local 2D variables. But note that when we when we have uh, physics uh, CCPP physics that are completely compliant and have been tested in all three models, we can also further simplify uh, those drivers in MPAS and remove those uh, loops that are shown here. After the call to the actual parameterizations of the NPITCO scheme, now we kind of move the local 2D variables back to global 3D variables. And again, in future release of MPAS, we will, we will even be able to kind of remove those loops as well. So it's a very strong simplification of what the top of each parameterization uh, including the new uh, concept that we have been uh, developing. Now in that physics underscore MMM uh, directory, here is an example again of the NTCO convection scheme and it's just in since new structures using a CCPP compliant uh, version of the scheme. So it's here it's composed of five different uh, main subroutines, uh, an underscore run subroutine, which is the actual core of the prioritizations, an init and final subroutines, which is a one-time initializations and a final cleanup, as well as what we call a time step init and a time step final, which is an initialization that you need to do every time step following updates to the state variables. Or for instance, as well as output to standard variables like convective tendencies. So the top of a, the top of those uh, subroutines are uh, back here. The top of the subroutine now includes information on this is not what we were at, information on uh, what we call a meta a metadata file, which contains which describes the different uh, variables in the argument list of the subroutine itself. We also add a standard uh, error and message. Uh, flag, which is, which is needed for the CCPP framework to, to work. So what is coming soon uh, updates in version 8 point star following the release of 8.0 and a few additional bug fix. Uh, and then I'm, what I'm listing here doesn't have any priority really. Uh, first, we want to finish the CCPP compliant version of the MOIS physics for the convection permitting suite using the work release 4.5.1. As I said earlier, uh, this will also uh, allow us to test this mesocal physics, physics suite within the CSM CCPP framework. It's well underway, should be ready uh, in early July because we already have earlier versions of CCPP compliant MYNF surface uh, layer and PBS scheme, as well as early version of the RTMG long wave and short wave radiation codes. So in that version, we'll have the EDMF, EDMF version of the MYN PBR scheme. And we also, by also uh, using the CCPP compliant, compli compliant version of the Thomson Cloud Macrophysics scheme, then we will also be able to use the two moment grapple and help pronostic variables of the latest version. We're also going to release uh, the RTMG long wave and short wave radiation code in a CCPP compliant version. Uh, the WOF and MPAS interface are very different, so we may need a little bit of time to reconcile the two interfaces, but that should be available as well in the summer of, I mean, this summer. Uh, how to add extra layers between the top of the atmosphere and the top of the model in WOF and MPAS consistently, since we're using different vertical uh, discretizations. And how to deal with the WOF centric preprocessing options within a CCPP compliance system. The next thing that we want to do is to merge the physics and 3D uh, grid analysis FDDA source code that has been provided by the EPA developers that should also happen in the summer of 2023. Uh, implementations of uh, the physics to run aquaplanet experiments. I want to refer you to the talk by Rosimar in session seven. Merge the refactored version of NOAA MP with uh, MPAS. Uh, the pre-refactored re 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 pre -re version of the scheme has been testing uh, using global and regional MPAS already, but we decided to release the refactored version instead because we are going to be able to kind of develop that interface between MPAS and uh, NOAA MP using the CCPP uh, uh, concept framework. 
And finally, we also kind of think about uh, releasing the aerosol aware option of the Th Thomson Cloud Macrophysics scheme. The question here is how to provide physically based the surface emissions of anthropogenic and natural aerosols. Particularly, do we want to have a link to chemistry, especially for variable resolution meshes? So to show that we are actually done some of this work that I've been talking about that will be released this summer. So the top panel show compares the NOAA MP versus uh, NOAA in a very short five day forecast run for the 30 kilometers global impacts. It simply show a decrease here of the surface moisture flux between the uh, NOAA MP shown on the left and uh, NOAA shown on the left and NOAA MP showed on the right side of those uh, top two panels. In terms of uh, aerosol uh, aware Thomson cloud macrophysics, so the bottom left panel shows, uh, well, the bottom left panel shows an example of the development of a mesoscale convective system where the number of concentrations of CCN, which is uh, shown on the left panel, the bottom left panel, is based on initializations uh, using a CAM CAM data and on physically based surface emissions. Where the right panel now shows the uh, vertically integrated number concentrations of cloud droplets. Next slide. So here's a couple of requirements and, interf and uh, guidance for future implementations in MPAS. I think we can discuss those, I think, this afternoon or Thursday afternoon. First, the interface and actual parameterizations must reside in separate files. And I gave an example of that using the NTITCO scheme. Uh, the interface must simply be now a transfer between global, local, and local back to global variable before and after the go to the parameterizations, particularly in WARF. Some of that uh, interface will be further simplified in MPAS when everything works together. The parameterization itself must be CCPP compliant, and we have help to kind of do this. Uh, and it will be available and directly downloaded from the MMM shared physics repository using that managed external tool that I mentioned earlier. Funny, we can help the developers to do this. Uh, you can email us, you can talk to us through the MPAS work forum. And we also finally want to develop a simpler guideline, guideline to do this than the actual uh, CCPP documentation. Thank you. So I'm still a little unclear whether this MMM physics repository is CCPP or is like CCPP. It is. The physics parameterizations are completely CCPP compliant, but MPAS doesn't plan for now to use the CCPP framework. So that's the reason we're testing the CCPP compliancy of those schemes using a model like the DTC SCM that includes the CCPP framework to make sure that we have all the components that are needed to kind of be moved directly to a CCPP framework like the one used in CESM. And I, I, you said a lot about MPAS, but is there some movement toward making WARF uh, able to use that repository? WARF and CM1 are going to use that repository as well. So that's the reason we have been kind of doing that consistently and in a parallel way between WARF, MPAS and CM1. So at the end, all three models will develop, uh, will all develop, all three models will access directly that MMM shared physics repository, as well as other host models will be also able to download those same set of physics. So yeah, next talk is Joe Klemp. Um, about modifications and impasse for deep atmosphere. <laughs> All right, we shall see. <clears throat> well, as part of our development of the uh, impasse system, we are interested in adapting uh, MPAS so it could serve as a non-hydrostatic dynamical core 
uh, in whole atmosphere model, particularly in the in the Wacom X model, uh, which simulates the atmosphere all the way up through the thermosphere, so really to high uh, altitudes. Uh, Suda Kamal will be talking in more detail about uh, our work with that and some uh, initial uh, comparisons. Uh, but as part of this, Bill Scamrock and I are also uh, looking to see what we need to modify in the dynamics of the uh, numerics of the uh, solver uh, to be suitable for this application. And what I'm gonna be talking about this morning is uh, our work to uh, generalize the upper boundary to allow it to instead of being just a rigid lid at the top to follow uh, constant pressure surfaces like uh, uh, many other models do. As we're looking to uh, simulate through up all the way up through the thermosphere, there's a number of interesting uh, challenges that arise. Uh, you can see that uh, one characteristic of the uh, thermosphere is having uh, rapidly increasing temperatures. Uh, so you typically be reaching uh, temperatures between 1000 and 2000 degrees up in, in the thermosphere. Also because of the, the depth of the atmosphere, the uh, changes in thermodynamic quantities like pressure and density uh, change by 12 orders of magnitude or more as you go from the surface up to uh, around 500 kilometers. Another interesting aspect is that for the kinematic viscosity and thermal conductivity, these are uh, influences that are totally negligible in the troposphere and stratosphere. But as you go up in uh, to high elevations, they become I mean, sometimes dominant terms because each of those are uh, proportional, inversely proportional to density. So as that density is going down, these things are going up. And uh, so they're, uh, they, they become very important factors. Another, uh, it ju just to give you a feeling for where this is, the average altitude of the International Space Station is around 400 kilometers. So it's, uh, it's getting really up there. Uh, one of the uh, complicating factors of, of the thermosphere also is that there can be very large radiative heating and cooling up in this region that uh, we have to deal with. Uh, this uh, shows a vertical cross section taken around the, uh, along the equator all the way around the earth from a, uh, a simulation from the Wacom X model that Han Li Liu provided to us. And you can see here that if we look at the temperature on the left, uh, there is a strong uh, difference in the temperature on the, on the daytime side versus the nighttime side because of the diurnal heating and cooling associated with the Earth's rotation. So here in this situation, there's a several hundred degree change in temperature uh, as you go from one side to the other. Uh, also notice that this is the top of the model domain, a constant pressure surface in the Wacom model. And that is varying by over a hundred kilometers uh, in the, uh, uh, at the top of the model. There are very strong horizontal velocities associated with this uh, well over 100 meters a second uh, here where the uh, horizontal velocity is uh, lagging the temperature by about uh, 90 degrees as it's propagating around. So uh, you can imagine that this is a difficult situation for a model like MPAS that has a height-based vertical coordinate that uses a rigid lid uh, at, the, at the top. And because of this large uh, heating and cooling, we really need to have an upper boundary that can uh, go expand and contract uh, in, uh, as this uh, strong heating and cooling is taking place. 
The way we deal with this is to uh, employ a simple coordinate transform that allows the upper boundary to move adaptively to follow a desired constant pressure surface. Uh, you can think of this as just an upside down terrain following coordinate. So it's following the, like the terrain, except in this case, the, it's following a constant pressure surface, which will vary in space and time. Turns out that uh, modifying the vertical coordinate in this manner uh, really does not produce major changes to the code. So it's relatively straightforward to implement. Uh, this slide uh, sort of shows in schematic how this can work. If we start down at the bottom here, this is where we have our normal uh, terrain following coordinate that follows the terrain at the surface. And then the influence of that terrain decreases with height until when you get up into the, say, the mid stratosphere, uh, the coordinate surfaces are horizontal constant height surfaces. To follow a constant pressure surface at the top, what we do is then put in a, uh, an additional coordinate transformation that begins at some height z sub p that's above the point where these surfaces became uh, uh, constant z surfaces uh, to allow the coordinate surface then to gradually uh, change until it uh, follows a specified uh, this capital H uh, profile at the, at the top of the model domain. So then the trick is how do we get the coordinate surface to follow a constant pressure surface, which is varying in space and time. To do that, we simply apply the hydrostatic equation along the upper surface where uh, we look at any deviation at the end of each time step, uh, any deviation uh, from the constant pressure surface then uses the hydrostatic relation to adjust the height to nudge it back toward that constant pressure uh, surface. Uh, and, and so this equation that we apply at the end of each time step is just applying this hydrostatic adjustment uh, to continue to follow this constant pressure surface. Oops, are we losing it here? Okay, <clears throat> to uh, test this out, uh, we've developed a, a, a idealized test case that is loosely patterned after that uh, 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 result I showed you from the Wacom X model uh, that I showed from the previous slide. And so what we do is specify a, uh, a temperature uh, field that increases with height at, at low levels and then uh, uh, becomes uh, uniform with height at uh, about 975 degrees. And then uh, with a perturbation of plus and minus 150 degrees uh, to provide this diurnal variation. We can then compute a, uh, a heating function, a time derivative of uh, this profile, which provides the forcing, which we would in then include in our thermodynamic equation, our equation for rho theta, that uh, provides the propagating uh, diabetic heating to, uh, to propagate this, uh, this disturbance. Um, one interesting aspect of this is that uh, although this, this solute, the linear analytic solution is essentially inviscid, physically realistic solutions require dissipation in the horizontal momentum equation. If we just, if we just solve the, the fully inviscid problem, the horizontal velocities get up to almost 2000 meters a second. And so the uh, putting in uh, uh, some kind of dissipation is needed to generate physically realistic solutions. Next one. So when we do this, 
uh, put in this heating function. Uh, this is the, the results we get after propagating this disturbance around the earth uh, one time. This is the results at, at, at one day. And we see the temperature profile here. Uh, notice that this is not uh, quite the same shape as what we started with, which is what it would be from the linear analytic solution. Although if we used a smaller temperature perturbation, that would agree with it. So uh, we believe this is, these are just uh, nonlinear influences uh, and has this qualitative similarity to uh, the observed case that's motivating us here. The horizontal velocity gets up over 100 meters a second here and it's phase lagged about 90 degrees from the temperature which is very similar to what the observations do. And our vertical velocities now uh, are maximum at the upper boundary uh, of five or six meters a second in this uh, simulation we're doing with a 100 kilometer grid. The next slide. To get a, a more quantitative uh, assessment of the numerics itself, uh, we can also compare the results from this simulation with what we would get in from a WARF simulation. Now with WARF, it uses a train following pressure coordinate. And so we don't need to do anything special to, uh, uh, to simulate this case in WARF. And so when we, when we simulate it in WARF, we can see we get very similar results in temperature, horizontal velocity, and vertical velocity. So that's uh, uh, encouraging that this is uh, working properly. So the question you might ask is, what happens if we just go ahead and keep the uh, rigid lid upper boundary condition? Uh, the next slide uh, shows a, a, a simple illustration of that. We've taken essentially the same idealized case simplified it slightly in that we've removed the temperature gradients at low levels so that this the the background temperature starts at a at a constant uh, value with height and then we add the perturbation to it uh, and by doing that the we can generate simpler linear analytic solutions uh, to compare with in fact the, the the linear analytic solution for vertical velocity and temperature are shown down at the bottom here and you don't need to look at the details of that, but for each of these terms, each of these fields, there are two terms in the square brackets. The first term is the solution you would get if there were no upper boundary and these things were just extending to infinity. The second term is the adjustment that has to take place to drive the vertical velocity back to zero at the top. Okay, if we get to the next slide, uh, we have several things here. On the far left it is the solution we get if we uh, go ahead and implement our constant pressure upper boundary. And so here we see that the disturbance now is propagated around the earth. Uh, it's preserved its, its shape like it should. Uh, so this is what we would expect. Uh, if we now compare it in the in the middle ones to the solution we get when we impose a rigid boundary, you see down at low levels, say up to the lower half of the domain, the simulations are pretty similar to the ones with the uh, pressure surface. But now as we start to approach the upper boundary, it gets very different because now the vertical velocity has to go back to zero at the top. And what that causes then is very large artificial temperature perturbations underneath the upper uh, boundary, which uh, is not a good thing. And we have confidence that these numerical solutions are doing actually what they should do for that boundary because they compare very closely with the uh, analytic solution we get for the same rigid lid. Um, We've also looked at some aspects of applying this to more shallow atmosphere uh, simulations that uh, uh, we're more uh, have more experience with. For example, this is a case of a, of a mountain wave simulation where we have the, the top of the domain is at 30 kilometers 
it's fairly small horizontal scale. So the waves generated are non-hydrostatic. And along the top is the solution for streamlines and vertical velocity when we uh, impose this constant pressure surface as compared to along the bottom with the rigid lid. And now you can see through most of the domain, the results are quite similar. And it's only as we get right up here near the top that we see the differences as the flow adjusts to the specific upper boundary condition. The, the, the main point to me here is, is that neither the constant pressure surface nor the rigid lid is a physically accurate upper boundary condition. Both of them are totally reflective to upward propagating gravity wave energy. And so uh, the fact that these sim simulations are, are, are similar and both are artificial in, in <laughs> detail uh, suggests that we don't really see a, a reason to apply this constant pressure surface for more shallow atmosphere applications. And of course, in reality, we put it in an absorbing layer to absorb the gravity wave energy. So then it really doesn't matter anyway. Uh, I just wanted to mention one other uh, test we tried. Uh, we become aware that at certain times when there are strong uh, geomagnetic storms, there can be extremely large uh, velocity perturbations in the in the mesosphere. Uh, you can see in the this is plot over here shows the track from uh, satellite uh, observations with the horizontal velocity reaching over uh, 800 meters a second and the vertical velocity having a peak right here of 175 meters a second. And for us, this was kind of mind blowing in terms of how in the world is the model gonna to hang together. And one, one strong contributor to this can be the, uh, what they call ion drag, the fact that when you have these strong disturbances, the ions are moving with the uh, uh, electric and magnetic fields, whereas the, the neutral atoms are moving with the neutral uh, wind velocity. So these ions are producing a significant drag uh, on the neutral particles. And the next slide. We, we tried a simple idealization of this, putting in a, a Rayleigh damping term into the horizontal velocity equation, where the damping is proportional to the difference between the neutral wind velocity and the uh, ion drift velocity. And we start with just a constant 100 meter a second uh, uh, neutral wind and put in a perturbation for the ion drift velocity that can be plus or minus a thousand meters a second uh, up in the uh, upper thermosphere. Uh, when we do this, and of course, with these large velocities, we have to cut the time step back. This is a little over a, a minute uh, uh, time step. Uh, but at the next slide, if we could do, whoops, back, there you are. Uh, this shows the what is nearly a steady state uh, flow at, after five days of simulation. And we can see now we've got a uh, large horizontal velocity uh, perturbations, uh, plus and minus 700 and some uh, meters a second for the, for the neutral winds. Uh, vertical velocities over here get, are hitting a maximum of about 160. Uh, meters a second. This is with a hundred kilometer grid on the globe. So for us, this is kind of uh, uh, exciting to see that our, our numerics is still holding together in spite of these very extreme uh, uh, conditions. So uh, that was an interesting test for us. Uh, on the next side, uh, I want to mention our most Recent work, we've been uh, porting this code. I, I guess I didn't properly mention that these idealized test cases we've been running, we've been running in a two-dimensional uh, prototype of the full model that runs in a vertical slab XC coordinate. It, that's the situation we've found very effective for testing 
initial testing of all of our numerics. So we've been porting this now to the full three-dimensional MPAS code, uh, which has required uh, modifying the initialization to be able to initialize the atmosphere uh, following a constant pressure surface uh, to uh, reproduce the uh, two-dimensional framework. We actually use a three, a, a, a fully three-dimensional uh, uh, configuration of hexagons on a flat plane. And we, we just have four columns wide uh, and it's actually 400 uh, in the X direction. So the, our initialization has no variation in the, in the Y direction. So our solution will only have uh, variation in, in the X direction. And uh, after tracking down a number of little glitches here and there, I am happy to report that we are able to produce uh, very similar results in the, uh, in the full three-dimensional code initial run with this 2D uh, idealization that you can see across the top and comparing it to our, our companion results from our 2D prototype. So that's very encouraging uh, for us. And our next steps now are gonna be to uh, go to a next level of complexity uh, to extend a idealized test case sort of like this, but on the, on the running on the full globe uh, to get the, uh, uh, a lot more of the interaction from the three-dimensional system. So with that, I'll stop and answer any questions. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you very much. An interesting talk, a lot of new concepts there when you get 600 kilometers above the surface. Um, one thing I don't think you mentioned is how do you deal with the fact that as you're a tenth of the radius of the Earth above the surface, your horizontal dimensions expand? How do, how do you deal with that? That's right. And, and that's, that's another part of what we're adapting the equations, because as you say, the grid volumes are getting larger as, as you go up. Uh, and so uh, we've implemented the, uh, the changes to make the uh, the individual grid size uh, their when you, when their size is, is is increasing is increasing with height and, and so we have that there's also the fact that gravity is decreasing and so it, it gets down it's it gets down to 70 or 80 percent of uh, of its value at the surface wow. uh, and a third aspect is is increasing or including the full Coriolis uh, effects uh, in the, in, that are in the vertical momentum equation as well as the horizontal. Yeah. Pardon? Well, the chemistry up there is very complex and, uh, and, and uh, we have not yet uh, uh, coupled to that. Although we have, uh, we have modified the system so that now our uh, we do. We can handle variations in atmospheric composition, which means that the heat capacity and the ideal gas constant they vary with composition and therefore with height. And so, lots of things that are just constants in our previous applications now are also varying in time and space. Okay. So now, uh, Dave Randall will talk about earthworks. This is sporadic. This is this is a page, right? That should advance because it doesn't matter. Okay, thank you. It's nice to be here. I want to talk about a project that some of you will have heard of, uh, Earthworks. And uh, it involves a large number of people, uh, some of whom are in this room. So this is a university-based project. CSU is the lead. And uh, NCAR is a partner. Um, and we're using MPAS 
in a, in a new way. So we're using the, um, the atmospheric model that you've been hearing about today. We're also using the Ampass Ocean model, which is developed at Los Alamos, uses the same dynamics almost. And um, there's also an Ampass sea ice model, runs on the same grid, also developed at Los Alamos, and it's compatible with CICE, which is the, the CSM sea ice. We're also using CLM on the, um, on the Ampass grid. And this is all uh, implemented in the framework of CESM in a way that I'll explain a bit more in a minute. Uh, so we're using the CESM infrastructure, including the mediator, which used to be called a coupler, uh, to connect all the components together, as you can see uh, in the diagram here. And uh, the plan is to use the community uh, physics framework, uh, which we heard about a few minutes ago when ready, but I, my understanding is that'll be about uh, two years from now. We'll see. So the vision of the project is to perform uh, 3.75 kilometer grid spacing, fully coupled ocean atmosphere, land surface, simulations using CESM as a base, of course, as all of you in this room know, this means that we have partially explicit deep convection and gravity waves. Uh, gravity waves excited by all different kinds of sources. We intend to have a resolved stratosphere, not going as high as uh, what Joe described, but going up to around uh, 80 kilometers or so. And of course, MPAS has a regional refinement option, as you all know. So our intention is to study both weather and climate. And I'm gonna talk about this a bit here today. My, my reason for coming here is to talk about uh, earthworks as, a, as a, a tool for studying weather. So the timescales involved will be a dec days to decades. Um, as I'll say later, we uh, expect to be able to get about one simulated year per wall clock day on a DOE leadership class machine by the summer of 2025, which is in our current funding ends. And so that makes it um, feasible to do a few years, maybe out to about 10 years, but it's very, very expensive, of course. Um, we intend to use the model to understand deficiencies of lower resolution versions of the same model. Um, and uh, use the model to create training data sets for machine learning so that it might be possible to uh, get similar results with uh, coarser grid. And uh, our goal is to um, develop improved parameterizations that work well over a wide range of grid spaces. And finally, a lower resolution version of the same model could be used to study century scale climate change. So Earthworks is not CESM. We are building it on top of CESM but this is a university-led project and we can do whatever we want, okay? Earthworks is also not SEMA. We're working with SEMA. We have some common goals and some common issues that we're working through, but we're not SEMA. As I've told you already, we're using a single grid, one grid to rule them all. Uh, it's the impasse grid. And uh, a grid spacing of 3.75 kilometer works well for the, for the atmosphere, the ocean, and the land surface. Um, as most of you probably know, uh, coupled ocean atmosphere models with coarser grids often use very different grid structures for the ocean and atmosphere. So maybe a cube sphere for the atmosphere and a tripolar grid for the ocean. With a 3.75 kilometer grid spacing, that doesn't make any sense at all. Why would you do that? So uh, we're taking advantage of the high resolution to use a single grid everywhere. And of course, there's lots of simplicity that comes from that. So I don't need to introduce the MPAS dynamical core here developed by uh, Joe and Bill and their team, but um, I do want to point out that this is the first global dynamical core for the atmosphere developed at NCAR in-house since the Washington Kasahara model 50 years ago. That's a very big deal. So you might think that NCAR would stand up and cheer and be a, using MPAS everywhere, but as we know, that's not the case. And um, from the outside, this looks rather strange. 
Uh, I want to talk a little bit about climate and weather. I said I was going to do this. So uh, I put Lorenz up here to uh, represent climate. I don't know who this guy is on the weather side, but uh, there's a kind of schism in our field. Um, weather on one side, climate on the other, and it's not healthy for our science. It's everywhere. At least it's everywhere in this country. Academic departments, uh, some are very highly weather oriented, others are very highly climate oriented. Journals, NOAA laboratories, NCAR, professional societies, and even the National Science Foundation. Um, weather research is about atmospheric physics. So here's a chart showing uh, evolution of forecast skill with time. Um, and my builds are out of order here, but uh, you know it involves uh, fluid dynamics and microphysics, of course, and individual events like particular storm systems on particular days in particular places. Okay, weather, um, and of course forecasting. So you can tell whether or not you got the right answer. My builds are out of order again. Climate dynamics is not dynamics. So here's a sort of representative chart of you know, anthropogenic climate change predicted with a climate model. Scenarios, feedbacks, of course, statistics in the sense that, uh, well, here's an, on, here's an ensemble of simulations and uh, not looking at individual weather events by any means. And of course, projections as opposed to predictions. So a little playing around with the words there. You don't know whether you don't know where the right answer is here, but in 50 years, our descendants will find out whether we're getting the right answer today. Weather and climate with the same global model is not a new idea by any means. The UK started doing this about 30 years ago or a little more, the unified model. Um, and ICON now is doing it in, in Germany, Deutsche Wetterdienst and uh, Max Planck with ICON. Some of the most important parameterized processes in climate models can be described as weather. As a model's grid is refined from let's say 100 kilometers to something better, uh, more and more weather is explicitly simulated and some of the changes are really qualitative as when convection starts to grow on the grid in a somewhat realistic way, at least on the mesoscale. And mesoscale modelers like the people in this room, uh, weather people have decades of experience with the grid spacings that climate models are just beginning to use in work like the, the diamond simulations that some of you will have read about. Um, and, the European Center has been taking advantage of the fact for you know, something close to 50 years that systematic errors in short range deterministic forecast, systematic errors in one day forecast or two day forecast actually resemble client biases of the same model. So it's possible to fix that fixing forecast errors or tracking down the cause of forecast errors can lead to uh, smaller climate biases. So the climate community really has a lot to gain by using the same model for both the weather and climate. So uh, just to wind this part of the talk up, high resolution global models can help us to mend the schism between weather and climate. And I hope that that is what's happening now in the world. We'll have to wait a decade or so to see, but it looks like maybe that's happening. So a few early results from Earthworks, and I'm just gonna show a couple of things quickly that relate to weather. So the first one is, uh, work with a regionally refined simulation. So the grid spacing is uh, three kilometers here in uh, Northwestern North America and 60 kilometers elsewhere. And uh, this young scientist uh, uh, has done uh, three five month long simulations starting from uh, three successive October, starting from observations. So a total of uh, 15 months and uh, the next slide shows uh, precipitation uh, over that period of time in the, in the uh, three simulations. 
observations on the left, uh, wharf in the middle, and earthworks on the right. So this is MPAS with CAM physics modified by the earthworks project. And, and uh, Bill Scarmuch has been heavily involved in this, so, so I have to acknowledge that. Also, Andrew Gettleman. Um, second example, again, regionally refined, uh, and again, initialized from observations, simulations of squalling, and probably most of you have seen some version of this on another day. Joe, or Bill told me that he wasn't gonna show it here, but you've probably seen it elsewhere. So comparing uh, observations on the left side, um, you know, fairly broad squall line, a few hundred kilometers uh, wide in the east-west direction with uh, heavy precipitation on, near the leading edge and an extended stratiform region uh, trailing behind to the west. With wharf physics in uh, MPAS, you get this result. It looks pretty realistic. CAM6 physics out of the box looks like this. So the, uh, you know, the heaviest precipitation is, first of all, much too extensive and it's not near the leading edge and there's way too much stratiform precipitation too, so a terrible simulation. Um, the microphysics parameterization has been adjusted, so not replaced, just adjusted to allow more evaporation of falling precipitation and it leads to the results shown here on the right. So this is uh, MPAS uh, with uh, CAM physics, but modified uh, in the way I just said. And uh, here's a second slide that relates to the same case. So on the left here, you've got uh, war physics and you can see uh, a cold pool and a gust front essentially down here. Uh, this is the leading edge of, of the squall line. CAM physics out of the box gives you something like this. So uh, well, there's a little bit of a, of a cold pool, but it's much too far west and it's not deep enough. With the modifications that uh, were made to the microphysics, we get the results shown on the right here with a much sharper leading edge. It's not quite that, but uh, it's better. Uh, the, the cold pool is deeper, it's propagating faster, and that accounts for the, uh, the improvement in the shape of the squall line that I showed you in the previous slide. So performance goals, um, I've already said this, but our 2025 goal, uh, end of July, is uh, to be able to produce um, half a simulated year per day with a resolved stratosphere, so lots of layers, um, one simulated per day, year per day, and couple simulations with fewer atmospheric layers. And as I said, this will be on a DOE uh, leadership class machine. So to do that, we're going to need to use GPUs. And uh, this table, which I've um, shortened considerably from the original, shows basically that um, except for the sea ice down here at the bottom, uh, basically everything has been ported to GPUs. So we aren't actually running the machine very much on, uh, sorry, running the model very much on machines that, uh, that have a lot of GPUs, but of course that's coming in the near future with uh, Derecho and, uh, and uh, we're using a machine at TAC in Texas also that, that uh, has that capability. So this is done. Um, obviously, not many groups around the country have the computational resources uh, needed to run a global model with a roughly two kilometer grid system. But remember that in the early years of our field, in the early years of global modeling, not many groups had the resources to run a global model with a 300 kilometer grid spacing. And yet a lot of great work was done in those years. To maximize the scientific output of a project like this, the data from the ultra high resolution simulations has to be made widely available. But even the large data volume is a problem. You know, uh, just storing it and moving it around and analyzing it is a huge job. So some of the data from the ultra high resolution simulations has to be made available in coarser grids, some, maybe 60 kilometers or something like that. So it's, uh, you, can, you can run it on your desktop. I told you we're not CSM, but our goal is at the end of the five-year project that CSM management, which is a very strange machine, will um, 
choose to support the earthworks configuration that we built and demonstrated as a supported configuration in CESM. And we can't make them do that, but um, I think we've made a little progress in that direction. Just reading the tea leaves, it looks like maybe this will happen, we'll see. Um, so concluding remarks, we have encouraging results, many more things that I've shown you here. Um, along the way, lots of issues with CESM software infrastructure. So for example, currently we have a problem with PIO. How many of you have heard of PIO? Okay, a few. It's the um, parallel input and output package used by CESM. And um, works great with a 100 kilometer grid. But when you try running it with a 15 kilometer grid even, it crashes because it runs out of memory. There are lots of parameters that can be adjusted. We're experimenting. So this is the, the current problem, the problem of the week or the problem of the month. And there's been a long chain of these and most of them have been solved already. Porting GPUs is complete. We're planning to run these diamond cases that some of you might know about, uh, summer and winter test cases that have been run by other models like ours, like uh, Icon and so on. Uh, we'll do that later this year. And um, Earthworks is actually available. It's been available since March in our first functional release. There's the GitHub address and uh, there'll be a second release, I think next month. Um, so I will stop there. You're jumping way ahead. Yeah. Global, you know, long-term, you know, uh, high resolution convecting allowing forecast. Can I suggest something? Do something else first. And that is do sub-seasonal, like three week forecast, no, large numbers of them. Yes. You, no one's doing this, showing that a coupled atmosphere ocean model at convection allowing resolution could radically improve sub-seasonal predict predictability. If you did that first, you would make a tremendous contribution to subseasonal forecasting and find the problems with the models when, where we had verification data. I mean, it'd be a home run if you did that first. We are doing that first. I didn't say that, okay. but that's the plan. Okay. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, so first, I, I want to thank you for actually considering the value of sharing the data and making it available and having that be a thought, not after it's done. Um, along those lines, you know, yeah, we can degrade the data to share it, but we can also probably recognize the limits of the NetCDF and grid formats and look for other formats designed for that, like ZAR and ZARDAP. And I'm just wondering if that has been any, any of that that's come up that, that makes it easier to access only the data you need instead of the larger than- Yeah, we're areas. trying to deal with that kind of thing by partnering. So we're partnering with the Rajin project that some of you must know about. And we're hoping that many of those issues can be dealt with in that way, but we'll see. Hi, Dave, this is a trivial question. Why 3.75 kilometers? Well, 120, 60, 30, 15, seven and a half, 3.75. <laughs> Been there, done that. <laughs> Very interesting stuff. Okay, so in the NWP community and also in the climate community, they use ensembles. Do you think what you're going to get, say you integrate for 10 years uh, and you started from a different initial condition, do you think you'd get a different trajectory at the end? Well, sure. I mean, there's decades of experience with this. Uh, with a model with this very high resolution, obviously running a large number of cases is very expensive, but uh, we can do a, a small number of ensemble members for particular applications. Um, and we'll see, you know, that'll play out over time.
Well, that ends the morning session. It's a long lunch break until uh, one thirty, so we'll see you back uh, then. Okay, uh, it's one thirty. Um, welcome to the new capability and development update session. Uh, the first speaker will be Mary Barth, uh, talking about what's new with multi-scale infrastructure for chemistry and aerosols development. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, yes, I'm gonna talk about what's an update on our Musica project. Um, there are several people involved in this project and those listed here are some of the key people that we have uh, worked with on this per, uh, particular presentation. So as global scale and regional scale atmospheric chemistry models are maturing over the past decade or so, we're starting to think about addressing new frontier science applications. And I'm listing some of those applications here, things like looking at local air quality, but having the global context uh, to fit that into. And things like looking at the bottom, you know, removing the inconsistencies and sensitivity of boundary conditions for regional air quality predictions. But to do this, any of these uh, frontier science applications, we think we need a new modeling infrastructure. So we at ACON are, developing such an infrastructure called the Multiscale Infrastructure for Chemistry and Aerosols. And today I'm gonna to talk uh, about two pathways that we're taking to advance Musica. I'll start with the developing infrastructure um, part first. So Musica is a new model independent infrastructure that will facilitate use of a variety of chemistry schemes, physics parameterizations and atmospheric models. It um, makes use of a uh, standard, there it is, standard interface um, to connect the chemistry and physics uh, interoperability, but also with the host atmosphere model as well. Uh, this vision for Musica is uh, described in a paper from in BAMS in 2020. I wanna focus a little bit more on this section, which is uh, what we're calling the um, Model Independent Chemistry Module or MICM. So what MICM does is it takes a database of information of chem for the chemical mechanisms, for the characteristics of the chemical constituents, and we generate Fortran code um, shown here in these blue purple squares that describe the chemistry uh, solution. That um, has, uh, 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 <laughs> has a programming interface to um, connect to any atmosphere model. And so for CESM, we connect uh, it through the CCPP, the Commun Common Community Physics Package. While developing MICM, uh, we're following three software design goals. Uh, we're practicing implementation hiding and uh, top-down test-driven development to ensure that model configurations are based on science needs. We're applying uh, unit testing to ensure that new code works as exp expected. An existing code does not break with any new feature additions. Um, as part of this, we have standalone software libraries that um, provide well-defined APIs uh, with uh, modularity. And then we also want to improve the user experience by trying to put everything into runtime configuration. Uh, so we're striving for this, and that allows um, us to configure the model without modifying the code or rebuilding the software. And so because of the software um, libraries that get developed, Musica should be able to work with any atmosphere model. And in fact, we've created what we call a box model, music box, where the host model is really just prescribed atmospheric meteorological conditions. So it's pretty much the same thing. Um, so music box currently um, has its host model and it, um, it is running gas phase chemistry with prescribed photolysis rates. It's available in both a command line control or a browser interface. The browser interface is kind of fun because it does have this runtime configuration. So you can change your chemical mechanism, you can change your environment, um, you can change the characteristics of your species and see what happens. Um, we, last year, we had a tutorial for Music Box and you can find a demonstration video on our Musica webpage. We are uh, releasing an, the next version of uh, Music Box in early July, and we are uh, looking for friendly users to further test the system to make sure we have all bugs ironed out. 
In addition to Music Box, we've been extending the tropospheric ultraviolet and visible radiation model to the upper to include upper atmospheric photolysis rates. This uh, TUV X code does meet the standards of music for software that I listed above. It's already available as a standalone model. So if you want to get information about photolysis rates in any particular location in, of a, in the atmosphere, you can do that. And, uh, and we are now currently updating our web-based quick TUV calculator. So again, another uh, resource that you can use to find, get these photolysis rates. And then the third thing that we've been doing is implementing it into the CAM global model. And it's, uh, that is currently undergoing final evaluation of the science results and hope to have that uh, completed this summer. Okay, so those are the two main things, developing Music Box and TUVX over the past year uh, that we've been working on. Uh, we're also refactoring that MICM code, as I mentioned. And now I wanna move on to the second part of uh, talking about testing, evaluating, and applying variable resolution grid meshes in a global model. And so these are sort of the first steps to addressing frontier science applications. So as we know, MPAS and the spectral element grid mesh both have a grid mesh where you can do regional refinement with smooth transitions. The, um, um, the uh, spectral element grid mesh has been in CAM for several years now. And so ACOM scientists uh, went ahead and started working to see, hey, can we get chemistry working with regional refinement? And so uh, these, uh, this allows us to be representing the emissions and the chemistry more accurately um, with this type of grid mesh going down to say 14 kilometers and, um, and yet still have global feedbacks that are directly included in the simulations. So last year, uh, Wen Fu Tang gave a presentation here at the uh, Wharf Empaths uh, workshop, talking, comparing music of version zero with uh, Wharf Chem. And that was a Wharf Chem simulations or Wharf Chem forecasts that we do over in ACOM um, for the CONUS region. So shown here in the, on the left figure are carbon monoxide from wildfires from the music of version zero simulation. In red is overlaid the Wharf Chem domain that we compared music of version zero to. And what we got was this uh, um, interesting, unique aspect where wildfires in the Western US, those plumes move um, north eastward up into Canada and actually exit the Wharf Chem domain and then come back in into the, uh, New England. That's actually not too unlike what's going on now with the Canada fires um, and shown on the right are Wharf Chem simulations where we have to use the uh, WACM model, the global course resolution model to provide the boundary conditions. And you can see, um, for example, the carbon monoxide in Canada has this one big blob of um, CEO coming into the model rather than filamentary structure. So we think there's benefits in trying to um, have more consistent lateral boundary conditions. Um, and also provides benefits in uh, having a stratosphere stratosphere where ozone is predicted and not just prescribed as it is in work chem. And so, um, so we see some definite advantages going here. Um, there are other uh, refinements of grid meshes for the spectral element grid mesh. Um, these show a few examples, but I, if you're interested, I would encourage you go, to go to our wiki page to see all the different available grids um, at this point. Okay, so music version zero covers the global to regional scale. So grid spacing is down to about 10 kilometers. And so many of our chem simulations will really, you know, are, they're very similar, right? We have a lot of air quality forecasts using these uh, grid spacings. So in my opinion, there's a lot that can be addressed with music version zero. Um, most of the grid points are in the refined region. So there's really not much difference between the warp chem cost of the warp chem simulation and the cost of music version zero, at least when we did our calculations can, doing that comparison. However, we're not really able to get down to the urban scales or the cloud scales. And so we're looking towards going to MPAS. So the first question one might should probably ask is how does CAM MPAS with full chemistry perform? And so we're doing tests of uh, CAM MPAS with chemistry using a, a MPAS grid mesh, the standard 60 kilometer to three kilometer grid mesh 
that is uh, over the Asian summer monsoon region. It is centered over uh, Southeast Asia, um, where there's uh, often convection occurring during the Asian monsoon. So, we're, um, so if you recall, we have a lot of pollution happening in North, Northern India and China, all in this region. That's gonna get lofted by the convection to the upper troposphere. We're doing a five-day case study of August uh, 2021. So I'm gonna show you that the preliminary results are reasonable, but we do still have a number of tests to do. Okay, so this is what I'd like to show you. This is carbon monoxide at 14 kilometer altitudes. We're in the upper troposphere. Carbon monoxide is a good uh, tracer of transport because of its chemical lifetime being on the order of about a month. In the upper left is the CAM impasse with full chemistry simulation um, that we recently have done. In the upper right is the whole atmosphere community climate model simulation that has a grid resolution of about one degree, latitude, longitude. And then in the lower right is Musica version zero grid mesh that goes down to 25 uh, kilometers over the most of Asia. And so comparing these uh, three panels, we see that the transport patterns are pretty similar for carbon monoxide in the upper troposphere, getting caught up in that anticyclone and that the magnitude of the carbon monoxide concentrations are quite similar. I wanna take this to, oh, don't do this. <laughs> Help. I wanna take it to uh, sulfur dioxide on the next slide. Can I get some help on that? There it is. Um, so here's sulfur dioxide at 14 kilometer altitude. Sulfur dioxide has a much shorter chemical lifetime, less than a day um, in the gas space chemistry and aqueous space chemistry, but it's also prone to being scavenged by precipitation. And so again, I'm showing uh, results from those three different model simulations. And you can see that sulfur dioxide is showing similar patterns, especially between uh, MPAS, uh, CAM impasse with chemistry and the WACM simulation. But you definitely see lower concentrations of SO2 in the upper troposphere compared to the uh, WACM model. Okay, so, um, so I wanna conclude with um, to just uh, reminding you about our updates to Musica. We're using this two-prong approach to advancing Musica. Uh, we're doing have advancements in both the developing the infrastructure and testing um, and applying variable resolution grid meshes to understand how chemistry behaves in these re um, regionally refined grid meshes. Also wanna mention we're partnering with others to create a community infrastructure, uh, Jordan Schnell, I uh, mentioned the Melody's Monet analysis tool this morning. We we're also working with um, Harvard, who's put in their HEMCO emissions tool into CAM. And um, the GIANT initiative is, uh, is expanding the aerosols out to a variety of atmosphere models. We do welcome more con other contributions. We're happy to collaborate. Um, so please let me know. The QR code is, a, is goes to our Musica homepage. And uh, we uh, are planning to have a side meeting on um, Wednesday after the session, if you're interested. And it will be virtual as well or hybrid, and we'll get that link out to you uh, later. So with that, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the nice talk, Mary. I just wanted to kind of echo one of your points that for many of the applications we're looking at today and the rest of this workshop, uh, it really doesn't cost much to, more to run a global version of MPAS than the regional version. So if you have a big domain with high resolution, then those additional points that you want to put in on the rest of the globe uh, aren't a big cost. And I think we should look at it as, you know, this community, I'll look at it as, a, as another option to regional modeling to run the global variable resolution uh, impasse. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Uh, according to the agenda, the next talk will be virtual from Sudhir Kamali, who will be speaking about the development of a whole atmosphere model with a non-hydrostatic impasse atmosphere dynamical core. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as mentioned, I'm Sude Kamali, and I'm currently an ASP postdoc at NCAR, hosted at HAO and MCube. And today I'd like to share with you some of the progress that we've been making with regards to the development of VACM, the whole atmosphere model at NCAR with the non hydrostatic and pass A dynamical core. And this is a joint effort from multiple labs at NCAR, from HAO, I've been working with Han Li Liu, from MQ with Bill Skamarok and Joe Clem, from CGD with Peter Luritsen, and from ACOM with Francis Witt. And you might have uh, attended Joe Clem's talk this morning where he was talking about uh, adaptation of MPAS for geospace application. And this work is uh, following the same uh, efforts as well. So here's the outline for my presentation today. I'll start with a brief background and talk about the motivation behind this work. Uh, and then go through the dynamical core configuration that was used in this study, talk a little bit about the climatology based on the simulation results. And in order to get more insight into that climatology, we've done some preliminary wave forcing analysis that I'll share with you as well before ending with conclusions and future works. So uh, we all know that the main source of space weather and fluctuation in the ionosphere comes from solar variability. However, it's not the only source of space weather. Uh, we see fluctuation and irregularities in the ionosphere, even when there is no geomagnetic storm. And that's because there are other sources coming from the lower atmosphere, uh, such as wave propagating from the lower atmosphere into the upper atmosphere and giving rise to those fluctuations. And so in order to accurately simulate the region between the Earth and the Sun, we need to take into account the impacts of the lower atmosphere as well as uh, the solar solar output. And that's where the need for whole atmosphere models come into play. And if we look at the uh, atmosphere models available at NCAR through the Earth System Model CESM, we have CAM, which is our low top model. And uh, the top model top is around 42 kilometers. And then we have VACM, which is built on top of CAM. And the model top is around 140 kilometers. And then we have VACMX, which is used for geospace application. And geospace models require atmospheric models with tops in excess of 500 kilometers well into the thermosphere. So for example, VACMX extends from the Earth's surface up to approximately around 600 kilometers. And at these altitudes, the accuracy of the hydrostatic approximation starts to become problematic. Uh, and that's why there's a growing need for whole atmosphere models uh, with non-hydrostatic dynamical cores for geospace applications. However, uh, the dynamical cores that were available to VACM and VACMX were all hydrostatic. But recently, as part of the system for integrated modeling of the atmosphere or the SEMA project, NCAR has been adapting MPAS to work inside of CESM. Uh, this will bring non hydrostatic modeling capabilities uh, to CESM, and it would open up the opportunity uh, for us uh, to run VACAMIX with a non hydrostatic dynamical core. Uh, however, the first step towards that would be to run VACM with MPAS, and that's what we've been doing in the past year or so, and that's what we, I'll be presenting on today. So traditionally, the dynamical cores available to uh, VACM are uh, the finite volume or the FB uh, dynamical core and, or, and the spectral element or the SE dynamical core. As the name suggests, the FP is a finite volume solver and SE is a spectral element solver. Uh, the FV uses a lat long global grid and the SE dynamical core uses a cube sphere mesh. They're both hydrostatic dynamical cores and use sigma pressure vertical coordinate. Now we are also able to use VACM with MPAS. MPAS uses a central Voronoi mesh. As mentioned, it's a non hydrostatic dynamical core. It's also a finite volume solver, but uses C grid staggering in comparison to the D grid staggering that the FV solver uses. And MPAS uses a hybrid train following height vertical coordinate system. So in addition to being non-hydrostatic, there are other differences between MPAS and the two other dynamical core that could give rise to uh, differences in the simulation results. Uh, once we were able to run uh, VACM and with MPAS stably, we uh, decided to verify the simulation results as well. And for that, uh, we tried to compare VACM MPAS simulations with available observation, as well as uh, with simulation results from the FB and SE uh, dynamical core. So we set up um, 
three simulations with Vacum, one with each of the dynamical cores. The simulation was run for one year on an approximately one degree horizontal mesh with 70 vertical levels. And then we did a comparison of the uh, mean zonal wind and temperature climatology uh, from the vacuum and pass simulations with the FDNSE simulation, as well as observation results that were available. Uh, and although we looked at, as I mentioned, mean zonal wind and temperature here for the benefit of time, I'm only going to be presenting results for the mean zonal wind and only for the month of January and June. And before looking at some simulation results, I did want to briefly touch on the observation that uh, observation results that we've used for our comparisons. So I have here the URAP climatology for the month of June and January. These are from the Mighty Wind Instrument. And uh, what I wanted to point it out here is the wind reversal that we see in the MLT region in both the winter and summer hemisphere in both June and January and also the asymmetry that exists in this wind reversal. We can see that uh, the wind reversal for the summer hemisphere happens at a lower altitude in comparison to the winter hemisphere in both June and January. And this asymmetry, although it's well known in observation, is hard to reproduce in parametrized models such as vacuum and vacuum mix. And with that in mind, uh, let's move on to looking at some simulation results. So here I have the mean zonal wind uh, for the month of January from the FB, SE, and MPAS dynamical cores. Uh, the control lines and colors both correspond to mean zonal wind. And we can see that the main features of the wind structure is very similar for the three dynamical cores, such as the stratospheric jets and the mesospheric wind reversal. There are differences that we can see here. And as I mentioned earlier on, that could be stemming from the differences between the models. But here we were not doing a rigorous model comparison. It was only to see if the preliminary results from MPAS compares well with the other two dynamical cores. And the results look encouraging. And then when we compare this with the observation from the URAP climatology that I had on the previous slide, we can see that all three models were able to reproduce uh, the wind reversal uh, in the summer hemisphere. And the location of the wind reversal is roughly the same for the three dynamical cores. For the winter hemisphere, we only see a slowdown of the jet. And I do have to mention that here at these resolutions, we are running the models with parameterization. And that could be one of the sources of difference between the observation and simulation. And here I have the same results, but for the month of June, so mean zonal wind from FB, SE, and MPAS dynamical cores. And again, the control lines and colors are corresponding to the mean zonal wind. And we can see that the general wind structure is similar between the three dynamical cores. And if we compare that with climatology from observation, we can see that all three dynamical cores are able to reproduce the wind reversal in the winter and summer hemisphere. And the location of those wind reversal are at uh, roughly the same height, although we don't really see that asymmetry that we see in the observation. In order to get a better insight into this climatology, we've also done some preliminary weight forcing analysis. And for these wind structures, both parametrized and resolved waves are driving this wind structure. And so we looked at both of them. Um, uh, however, here I'm only going to present results for the month of January. So here are total parametrized gravity wave forcing from the month of January from FB, SE, and MPAS A. Uh, the control lines are the mean zonal wind and the control colors are the wave forcings. And the parametrized wave forcing play an important role in the MLT region. And we can see here uh, clearly their role in creating the wind reversal in that region. Uh, the, the wave forcing corresponds well with the location of the wind reversal for all the three dynamical cores. And we can also see here why we were seeing the wind reversal at roughly the same height for the three dynamical cores, because the wave forcing is at roughly the same height for all three of them as well. And if we look at the resolved wave forcing for the month of January, again, from the FVSE and MPAS dynamical cores, and again, the contour lines are the as mean zonal wind, and the color is the wave forcing. Uh, the resolved wave forcing uh, play an important role in the stratosphere. And in particular here in the winter uh, hemisphere, they play a, a important role in slowing down the jet. And we can see 
uh, a good correspondence between the wave forcing and the uh, wind structure uh, from these graphs, but this is preliminary results and we would need to do more studies to really understand that, but we just wanted to share that here today with you. So in conclusion, uh, as part of the SEMA effort, we have developed and tested VACM with the non-hydrostatic model for prediction across scale atmosphere and past A. We looked at mean zonal wind and temperature climatology from the VACM and past simulation and compared them with available observations as well as uh, with simulation results from the VACM FV and SE dynamical core and preliminary comparison is encouraging. We see that VACM and past is able to reproduce the main structures that we see in the other two dynamical cores. And in future, we hope to further study the effects of uh, the resolved and parametrized ways, hopefully perform high resolution simulations um, at convective scales. And I would like to reiterate here again that this work uh, is the first step towards the main goal, which is to adapt uh, the non-hydrostatic MPAS-A to work with uh, RACMX for geospace applications. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your uh, time and attention, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. And I know that Bill Scamarok and Joe Klemp and perhaps Hong Lili are uh, also in the room, so they can help uh, answering those questions as well. Thank you, Sudeh. Uh, we have a few minutes, so take a couple questions. clear what effects how the non hydrostatic effects will be manifest is it like through smaller scale gravity waves or is there some large scale thing that you expect to be different with non hydrostatic dynamics so at this resolution i don't expect to see much difference uh, it's when we go to higher resolution that i think we will really see the impact of mpass uh, and we're hoping to be able to do that in the coming months Any other questions for today? Just wanted to mention, I think it's worth noting that, you know, we talked about this morning how uh, kinematic viscosity gets large and uh, absorbs a lot of the smaller scale wave structure. And so what that means is, is that there tend to be uh, significant lar longer wavelength disturbances in the vertical. And that means that the non-hydrostatic regime extends out horizontally to much larger horizontal scales than we normally think about. So uh, even scales of 100 kilometers can have significant uh, uh, non-hydrostatic influences. Thanks for adding that, Joe. No other questions. Thank you, Sudeh. Thank you. Uh, our next talk will be another Empass Jedi talk um, from Junmei Ban regarding all sky ATMS radiance data assimilation with Jedi Empass. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Junmei Ban from NCAR. Uh, I'm going to talk about all sky ATMS reading data simulation with MPAS JDI. This morning, Dr. Dick Liu mentioned all sky AMCOA assimilation in MPAS JDI. This work is an expansion of all sky DA approach to ATMS reading This is ATMS instrument characteristics. Uh, ATMS included 22 channels, which combines most of AMCOA and uh, MHS channels. Window channels 1, 2, 3, 16, 17, they are sensitive to surface and hydrometers. For channel 4 to 15, these are used to profile temperature from surface to upper stratosphere. 
for ATMS channel 18 to 22, they are used to sending humidity from surface to upper troposphere. Now, ECMWF assimilate clear sky ATMS operationally. For NSEP, they operationally assimilate all sky ATMS begin from uh, 2019. And due to the limitation of microphysics scheme, only cloud deep water, cloud ice are included in analysis variable. And uh, they excluded precipitating cloudy pixels when assimilating uh, and got neutral impact. In tone 2020's paper, they, uh, they extended five hydrometers in analysis variable and excluded deep convective pixels. These are key points for assimilating all sky readings with MPAS data. Mixing ratio of five hydrometers are included as analysis variable. And CRTM is used as cloudy readings observation operator. And the situation dependent observation R model is used. And the QC uh, quality control is relaxed to include thick cloud and precipitating affected readings. Here I'm one to experiments. We conducted four experiments on 120 kilometer resolution and uh, by using pure 3D ENR. For benchmark experiments, we assimilated non readings observation, uh, AMCUA and MHS. Then we progressively add ATMS temperature channels and humidity channels and window channels. Uh, here, window channels, we only use it over ocean. The configuration used here uh, is compensating in oh, 120 kilometer 3D ENR in MPAS data. I will not go through it one by one. For situation dependent all sky observation R model, I will talk it in detail in next page. Uh, this is observation R model for ATMS. The X axis is average the cloud liquid water path. It's cloud amount predictor. Y axis uh, on the left is standard deviation of OMSB. Uh, on the right, Y axis is log of observation number. The red curve is observation number in each beams. And the blue dot is standard deviation of OMSB. It's increased with cloud amount. Then this uh, black dashed curve, uh, Fitting line is symmetric error. It's a step function of cloud amount predictor. And it describes the increases in error uh, between clear to cloudy situation. Now move on to observation space verification. This is time series of mean and RMS of OMSB from channel six. The blue curve is from the experiments we assimilating temperature set channels. The red curve are experiments from uh, we assimilating temperature and humidity channel. And the, the orange curve is from experiments we further adding window channels. Uh, we can see the blue curve and red curve are very close. Uh, when we uh, adding further, further adding window channels, both mean and RMS, of OMSB from channel six are reduced compared to we only assimilating uh, temperature and humidity channels. This is model space verification. The figure on the left is time series of the RMS error uh, of QV uh, verified against uh, GFS, uh, GFS analysis for four experiments. We also checked other field the most notable improvements are in moisture field, especially for QV11 level to level 20. Uh, here we can see there is the RMS reduced uh, 0 0.15 uh, gram per kilogram uh, when we further add in window channels. Uh, the red two figures are vertical distribution of relative RMSE re reduction 
uh, a negative percentage indicates the positive impact from ATMS uh, relative to benchmark. And uh, here for QV, uh, we can see this uh, red curve. This curve is uh, we uh, simulated the temperature and the humidity channel compared with the uh, blue curve. We can see the improvements mainly uh, between level 15 to 30, 45. Uh, this is because the waiting function peak for humidity channel is around these levels. So there is large improvement. Uh, when we further add in window channels, this orange curve, then we can see the improvements in, uh, over 5%. For some levels, it's over uh, 30%, 13%. The contribution is mainly from channel one and the channel two because they are sensitive to uh, hydrometers. Due to relative, uh, due to multivariate correlation, we also uh, got uh, wind field improvements. Here we can see the improvements reach 5% in some levels. This is RMS distribution. The figure on the left is RMS from uh, six hour forecast QV uh, from benchmark. The QV, the large QV uh, RMS is in uh, tropical region. For the figure on the right is relative RMS reduction from ATMS when we further add in window channels. The blue color indicates the improvement. We can see the improvements mainly over ocean because we assimilate window channel over ocean only, but there are still some degradation over land. We will further investigate the degradation over land in future work. Uh, we also check the longer range forecast. This is a relative RMSC reduction as a function of forecast lead time. Um, again, uh, the negative percentage indicates the positive impact from ATMS experiments relative to benchmark. We also checked other field here, only list uh, temperature, QV, and U. Uh, overall, uh, by progressively adding temperature channel, humidity channel, and window channel, we got improvement gradually, especially if you, for QV uh, here, uh, the relative RMIC reduction for day one is about 5%, then it's still retained 1% for day five. Uh, this is summary and uh, future work. The forecast performance have been improved through progressively adding ATMS temperature, humidity, and window channel with all sky DA approach. Um, and we will evaluate ATMS all sky DA impact with higher resolution setting and more advanced DA approach. That's all. Thank you. Hi, Jimmy. That's a very nice talk. Um, I have a quick question for you. When you, you are simulating multiple channels in the ATMS, are you using a correlated observation error uh, matrix? Is your R like have off diagonal terms or maybe I missed a slide? Yeah. Uh, you mean? This R model? She's not using correlated R. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, our next speaker is Orhan Araglu. 
uh, we'll be discussing the project Rajin community geoscience analysis tools for unstructured grids. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Orhan and I, uh, I am a software engineer in the CISL uh, lab as part of the technology development division, TDD, and visualization and analysis software team, as we call it, WAST. And today um, I would like to talk about the Project RIGENE as an effort to address the unstructured grids, data analysis and visualization uh, needs in the scientific Python ecosystem. Um, a number of people in this room may know me from prior years and presentations for about the GeoCAD team, a geoscience community analysis toolkit. So this project Rigene is kind of interrelated with GeoCAD, but today my focus will be on the project Rigene and its usability for MPAS uh, data analysis and visualization, as well as what we could do to uh, increase the community attention around it. And there are a number of people in this project, Raijin. I am the co-PI who is in charge of the software development efforts for project Raijin, but we have science uh, uh, co-PIs and collaborators as well. So I think it is always good to start with when, when it comes to the uh, comparing project Raijin's efforts to the structured grids, it is always good to uh, start with this uh, visual, but after today's MPAS updates in the morning by Bill, I think we will want to change the MPAS visual here to something with variable resolution, but let, let's just focus on whatever we have uh, today. So I'm not talking only about the MPAS, but in general, unstructured grids has a lot of um, uh, potential, like the scalability, and you, you can you can have uh, fine resolutions around kilometer scale. It is the reason behind in the most recent decade, there has been a constantly increasing attention around unstructured grids in contrast to what we have already uh, had in the scientific Python ecosystem about structured grids, right? So, but there are some um, related challenges with unstructured grids. So I, I'm, I'm talking about the scientific Python ecosystem, but I think this also applies to uh, the development pool in general. So there is no widely used conventions, just like we had with the structured grids when it comes to unstructured grids. There is the U-grid convention. There are a lot of models like MPAS and CAMSE and others, but there is no um, widely um, uh, accepted convention around unstructured grids when it comes to development and implementation. And there are just a few analysis tools which are capable of directly uh, operating on the native grid instead of the need for regridding to structured grids. And global storm resolving uh, scales, like the kilometer scale is great from the scalability perspective, but it is very challenging when it comes to the generation of huge amount of data. So it, it, is, it is a scalability problem uh, as well. And some trivial uh, structured grid analysis and visualization functions can get very tricky when it comes to applying them, implementing them in the unstructured grids uh, research fields. And actually these challenges have been also the motivation behind us putting together this project Raijin around the beginning of 2021. And it, it was awarded by NSF EarthCube program through the end of the same year. And there, there were two essential uh, goals behind this project Raijin. First, to develop and implement extensible and scalable uh, data analysis and visualization functionalities in the scientific Python ecosystem for unstructured grids that would operate directly on native grid instead of needing to regulate 
for the majority of the functionality at least. And while doing that, to make sure about the sustainability of the project by uh, making this tool a community involved and community owned uh, a Python effort. And I will, I will talk about uh, the software tool we have been developing so far as part of project regime, but just in a minute. So as, as I
it off with just a bit of uh, our motivation for the project and then go into some of the performance, um, some benchmarks and show you how you can apply that. Um, and then I'll go over some validation. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, so in general, computational expense is a major limitation for all WARF users. Um, advances in computing can better enable modeling through imp improved resolution, larger spatial and temporal extents, uh, more ensemble members, more complex physics, things like that. Um, but these benefits are only realized if WARF can run on modern HPC architectures. Um, so the limitation with WARF is that it does not support execution on uh, the GPU architectures that make up a vast majority of the HPC systems we see today. So ACEGAS is a modified version of WARF developed with the sole purpose of enabling the model to run on modern GPU-based HPC systems. So what we've done, we've uh, we've implemented ACEGAST in uh, with OpenACC and CUDA, um, and these, if you're not familiar with that, these are just uh, extensions of C, C++, and Fortran, um, and they enable execution on NVIDIA GPUs. Um, and in the future, other GPUs as well, uh, certain compilers. So. Uh, for example, AMD and Intel GPUs. Um, so ACEcast is designed to be a drop-in replacement for CPU WARF. It uses the same exact input and output files, um, and it provides identical results, theoretically, to the CPU counterpart. Um, and uh, yeah, it implements the same model with highly optimized algorithms uh, for running on GPU. Um, so it does exactly what CPU WARF does, but just much faster and can run on um, modern GPU systems. So the way this works, um, it's very similar to how CPU WARF works. Um, you just break down your grid like you do with CPU WARF um, with your MPI patches. And then each MPI patch is assigned a GPU, which does all the computations for that. Um, that subgrid or patch. Um, and then we have direct GPU to GPU communications for halo layers and things like that between those patches. Um, I have a little thing in the corner here. It, it's We've tried to make ACEcast as simple as possible for WARF users to transition over to. It, it runs with MPI just like it would for CPU WARF. So it's it's a very easy transition to switch over. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to be showing the uh, CONUS 2.5 kilometer benchmark here, um, which probably a lot of you are familiar with. Um, it's been used for a long time, it seems like. Um, it's a 1,500-ish by 1,200 uh, by 50 vertical level grid. It's using CONUS physics suite. Um, we're just running it for a three hour simulation because that's sufficient for benchmarking purposes. Um, and I've tried to find a system that's gonna be as similar to what you'd see on derecho as possible. Um, so for the CPU configuration here, we have uh, nodes with two AMD Epic 7713 CPUs, which is really similar to, I think they're gonna be 7743s on derecho. Um, and uh, for the GPU configuration, we have um, four NVIDIA A100s per node. Um, these are the 80 gigabyte versions on derecho. They're gonna be the uh, 40 gigabytes, but overall this should be pretty representative of the kind of performance numbers you would be seeing on derecho. Um, okay, so, here we're just looking at the strong scaling. On the left, we have the GPU numbers. Um, on the right, we have the CPU numbers. And then uh, you have simulation speed on the Y axis. Um, and then on the X axis, you have the total number of GPUs um, for the GPU one and then the number of nodes um, for the CPU. And uh, just 
give you a general point here. We have, uh, you're, you're hitting a 26 X simulation speed, um, a single GPU node with four GPUs versus about 12 CPU nodes. Um, moving on, so here with the efficiency, um, this is something you will know, uh, the, the efficiency drops off a lot quicker on the GPUs. Um, so in this case, we're hitting a 50% efficiency, um, strong scaling here on four GPU nodes. Um, whereas we're going up, you have to go up to 24 CPU nodes before you actually hit a 50% uh, efficiency. So, so the, G, the efficiency does drop off uh, significantly for the GPUs. Um, really it, with, with the CPU, most of the time this, uh, this can be attributed to the um, MPI uh, overheads. Um, but with the GPUs, it's actually more of a, a GPU utilization issue. Um, so that's why you're kind of seeing that um, dynamic. There's thousands and thousands of cores on any GPU. And if you don't give it enough work, then you're, you're not gonna get much performance uh, increase from just throwing more and more GPUs at the problem. Okay, so with our validation, our objective is to ensure that the differences between ACEcast and WARF results are exclusively due to floating point error propagation rather than incorrect model implementation. Um, so uh, our standard validation process for any given WARF configuration, what we do is we compile uh, two builds of CPU WARF, one using O0 optimizations with the compiler and one using O3. Um, so by doing that, it triggers all these different um, uh, things that the compiler can do. It can, uh, well, one example would be like fuse multiply adds, things like that. And so you end up with two different results that are generally uh, accepted. These are, these are different results that you would see across. You could do the same thing with um, different CPU architectures or different compilers, things like that. Um, so what, when you, you look at the two of those and then um, that gives, us, gives you a good baseline of what we can expect is an acceptable difference between um, the CPU and the GPU. Um, so then we run the simulation with ACEcast on GPUs and compare the results to the baseline runs. Um, if the ACEcast versus the CPU baseline differences are consistent with the acceptable differences that we see when comparing the two baseline WARF runs, then we can conclude with reasonable certainty that ACEcast is Im implemented correctly. Um, so here's an example. Um, uh, we're looking at uh, two meter temperature at uh, 24 hours. On the top row of graphs here, you have the two CPU warp baselines um, on, in the left and then ACEcast in the top right. Um, and then on the bottom row, you have the differences between all of them. So on the bottom left, that's the CPU warp versus CPU warp, the two different runs that are different. Um, and then uh, on the bottom right, you have uh, ACEcast versus those uh, two different CPU WARF runs. So really what we're just looking for is any like significant biases or um, any, any kind of patterns that, that look very different. In reality, we, we actually run like, I think our uh, regression test, we, we have like 600 different name lists that we do. And we, we do this kind of analysis over every field. Um, but this, this is a bit easier to, have you guys look at um, some actual uh, plots of this for a single field. Um, here's another example with that same simulation. We're looking at accumulated total grid scale precipitation here at 24 hours. Um, so yeah, yeah. Okay, so if you're interested in using ACEcast. Um, we have all of our documentation at this 
uh, link here um, that goes over the model description, instructions for installing and running the model, um, benchmarks, uh, and all our information about our releases, uh, as well as licensing, um, some nameless tools. Uh, you can email us at support at templatequest.com or uh, contact me directly or pull me aside here at the conference at any point. So I'll leave that to questions. Hey, uh, great presentation. Uh, I have a bit of experience with the GPU. So I was wondering, uh, do you have, like, do you need all the 80, 80 gigabytes of the uh, global memory for the 100s? Uh, for the simulation for the whole continental U.S. And, or not, uh, because, um, you know. For that specific but, benchmark, I yes. should. Um, I believe it's really close. Basically, I'm asking think, whether you are a memory-bound, uh, memory-restricted, uh, basically, simulation, or, um, like, there are other criteria as why you chose that specific GPU. Um, I sp I chose the GPU because it's uh, the closest thing I could find to a derecho like system. Um, uh, but I mean, memory is definitely a limitation in general with ASCAS, just like it would be with um, CPU Wharf. It uses approximately the same amount of memory, a little more, um, because of how we've implemented the physics. Um, but it's generally going to use about the same. Maybe you could you could approximate, say, like it's going to use double the amount of memory for um, ASCAS as it would for your typical WARF configuration. Right. And also, um, you know, you mentioned with an increasing number of nodes, yeah, you get, you know, less performance. Uh, mm -hmm. Isn't that might be because of like the copying over overhead between different nodes, uh, communications between CPU and different GPUs? Have you uh, looked at like asynchronous um, data transfers from CPU to GPU, basically um, instead of like one uh, stream of data, you can do like a couple of them. I was just curious to see. Yeah. Um, so. We have played around with that a little bit in, um, I think we, we did it with the radiation a little bit where you you start, you, you do some data transfer and then that, but that was actually mostly early on. At this point, we um, everything actually runs on the GPU. So you only copy the data onto the GPU um, during initialization of the simulation and then everything runs on the GPU. So you don't actually need to worry too much about CPU, the GPU data transfer. Um, Thank you. Our last talk will be from William Hathaway. It's a virtual presentation on Wharf Mosset, a modular and cross-platform tool for configuring and installing the Wharf model. Uh, William, we cannot hear you in the space. I think you might be muted. I'll send you a request. Can you hear me now? Yes. OK. Good afternoon. My name is William Hathaway. I'm a meteorologist here in Texas. Um, my co-author is Dr. Hosni Sunan from uh, Numatha uh, Consulting in Saudi Arabia, and we developed the Wharf Mosset, a multi-operational system installed toolkit for installing the weather research forecast model Wharf. So quick overview of what I'll be talking today about. Uh, we're gonna do a quick brief history of the wharf, which I'm gonna skim over pretty fast because I'm pretty sure everyone understands it here, but I still wanna give everyone a brief overview. Uh, overview of the summary of the wharf structure, identify the challenges of installation 
an overview and history of the wharf Moset, features and structures, future works and potential improvements. And if we have a little time left, some Q&A. So brief overview of the wharf. It's a flexible state-of-the-art numerical weather model. Uh, key features is it features multiple dynamic cores. You can do nesting simulations, scalability, and portability. Um, there are literally hundreds of or thousands of physics options that you can um, implement inside the wharf model, and it has data assimilation um, capabilities with real-time data and um, from ships, surface ops, and uh, cloud observations and satellites. The wharf was developed in conjunction with NCAR, NCEP, ESRL, the United States Air Force, NRL, OU, and the FAA. So to give you an idea of the complexity of WARF, um, you can see on this chart that we've probably all seen before that there are many paths which data can come into the WARF, and these paths um, lead to complications because of the libraries and dependencies required for it. So the installation requirements for WARF, um, it has the WARF MOSSET is uh, able to have it built on Debian kernels, which is such as Ubuntu, Fedora kernels, such as Red Hat Linux, uh, XNU kernels, which is Mac OS and Windows subsystem Linux. The required libraries are NetCDF, MPitch, Jasper, LibPNG, Zlib, and GCC G4 CPP. Libraries can be built from source files, or package managers like APT and YUM. The installation challenges with WARF is um, each different operating system has different system requirements. The tutorials that you find online, such as at UCAR on, or on YouTube videos, change based on the operating system. Uh, users are not really familiar with terminal-based systems. Uh, the world we live in, we're all used to graphical interface systems, GUIs. So transitioning to terminals can be a, a challenge. Um, depending on which version of WARF you're using, sometimes you have to use older libraries or um, different um, setups for the WARF. Um, another issue is the library compatibility issues when newer versions of the required libraries come out. Sometimes uh, one library like HDF5 will come out, but the NetCDF runs behind, vice versa. And then the post-processing tools have different system requirements and installations than the WARF does. So the solution that I came up with is the WARF MOSSET. The WARF MOSSET is a multi-operational system installed toolkit developed to make it easier to install and run the WARF model. So how does the WARF MOSSET solve these channels? It's a fully automated install package that streamlines the install process with little to no user action with the terminal needed. It installs all the required libraries, packages, binaries, and source files. It is um, the compatibility of all these libraries and packages are updated and maintained by myself and Dr. Sunan. And it allows the freedom of choice for Fortran compilers such as GNU or the Intel um, compilers. It is a semi GUI interface, which provides guided steps on how to select what you want the um, package to do. I apologize if the graphic on the right is a little small and hard to read. I'll be providing them in supplemental materials to the pre uh, conference so you can see it. But basically the overview is the, the way the MOSSET works is it performs system tests to determine the operating system. And so with, with the checks inside SIFs, it will decide whether or not it is a Darwin kernel, a uh, Fedora kernel, a Mac kernel, and then from there, it will ask you to select which compilers that are compatible. Intel compilers are only compatible so far with the um, Fedora, uh, the Ubuntu kernels, but the GNU um, compatibility are available for any um, operating system. It also checks for system architecture. 
So if you have a 32-bit architecture, the it will give you a flag saying that it will not work because the system is built for 64-bit architectures. And then it gives you the choices of post, pre and post processing tools such as open grads, uh, DCTs, uh, model evaluation tools. And then it asks you about if you wanna do auto configuration or none. If you choose auto configuration, you'll the it is literally a one click and go. And then it gives you the choice between the different models, Wharf, Wharf Chem, Wharf Hydro standalone. Wharf Hydro coupled or Hurricane Wharf. And then it does in the, the installation, it will perform a bunch of system checks to make sure that executables are created. And if it does fail, it will exit the program and give you a log file. And at the end, it will tell you that the system was successfully installed. The included libraries, software packages um, that are currently included um as of this month are listed here below um, these are the most current versions of the, the compilers and libraries one thing that is um, important to know is that parallelization of hdf5 and netcdf are built in directly to the wharf model so that you can use um, parallel pnetcdf and phdf5 to help runtime processes um, software included, um, you have the Wharf ARW version 4.5, WPS, Wharf Plus, Wharf 4D VAR, Wharf Chem with KPP um, built in, Wharf Chem 3D VAR, Wharf Hydro Standalone, Wharf Hydro Coupled, Hurricane Wharf, which is only available on the Intel um, compilers. For some reason the GNU, GNU compilers was listed there. And then the optional geography files, mandatory and input files. And then here's a list of some of the pre and post processing tools that are included as part of the MOSIT. Um, most of these tools have been um, archived and are no longer supported due to their age. However, um, with a little help from Dr. Sunan and others, I was able to get some of these tools back to working with modern compilers and modern libraries such as ARW Post, RIP4, um, Grads, and UPP. So where has the Wharf MOSSET been used? Currently, there has been over 3,000 unique IP address downloads across 110 countries which is roughly about 57% of the world. The countries in blue in the little graphic at the bottom is where they have been downloaded. And the efficiency is it's a one-click install. So if you were to set, uh, pick Wharf with all options available in the MOSIT, it will take somewhere between 45 and 100 minutes to download, assuming you're using 10 megabytes per download second. Stronger internet connection, faster download. If you have a faster computer, it can make that time get even shorter. So I wanted to show a brief video of the interface. So you begin by moving to your home directory. You clone the um MOSIT from GitHub, which is freely available and open to everyone online, no restrictions to countries or anywhere. After cloning, you move into the directory file. You make the executable scripts, and there you see the list of the Wharf MOSIT. You start it, and then here you go. You first get to choose your compiler. Intel or GNU. Then it'll do run its system test, make sure there's enough space for storage. And then you get to choose if you'd like open grads or grads. Then it asks if you would like the auto configuration. This is where you don't have to click anything. Specific applications. Since I was doing this, you can do yes or no. You pick your model. 
you enter your pseudo password. So you do need super user access. And there you go. This is the wharf currently installing all the libraries and packages needed to begin. It does all the pseudo updates and you get all, make sure all the packages are currently up and ready to date. So future works and potential improvements. Uh, future works, uh, right now we have Wharf, Wharf Chem, Wharf Hydro, Wharf Hydro Coupled, and Hurricane Wharf. The MOSIT has three new models that would like to be coupled into it. The Wharf CMAX for climate modeling, the Wharf S Fire for uh, wildland fire modeling, and then the Coast, which is a wave model, uh, atmospheric model wharf and uh, sea swell model. Um, another thing that will be coming in with the MOSSET is a set of standard meteorological charts that are Python codes. So users have been giving me feedback that they can install the wharf in and use it and run it, but they don't know how to make charts with it. And since Python is the way that the future of modeling seems to be heading at this time, um, standard meteorological charts will be going. Um, additional updates to libraries as they come forward, more pre and post processing tools. And then there is a journal article that will be that is currently being accepted and under review about the MOSSET to be published. Potential improvements, uh, a Python GUI for software installation. Um, Still that it's currently being used on terminal base. So, so still some people are a little um, unfamiliar with the terminal. So I'm trying to develop a Python GUI to make it a uh, clickable. Enhanced streamlining of installations and adding climate data operation support. So in conclusion, the wharf can be a copyrighted tool to install. New users are unfamiliar with terminal commands. A uh, new system OS is different from the Windows or Mac OS, which most people are from, uh, familiar with. Pre and post processing tools require additional libraries and packages to install with the Wharf. This adds time and frustration to users. The Wharf MOSSET seeks to help new users by semi-automating the process for them. This allows users to focus their time more on research or forecasting. Uh, the Wharf MOSSET is free on GitHub for anyone to use. The link is there. And then in summary, Wharf is a complicated tool to install. The additional libraries and packages required to install with Wharf makes it challenging for new users with uh, terminal commands. The Wharf MOSSET helps new users by semi-automated process. And again, the tools are available on GitHub. The QR code you see is a link to the GitHub. I'm just going to stay here for a second. So if anyone wants to take a picture of that. And then thank you for your time. If, uh, if there's any time remaining, um, please, uh, I'll answer your questions. Otherwise, feel free to contact me directly through my LinkedIn. Link is there and the QR code takes you to my LinkedIn. And that this time I'll be happy to answer any questions or explain anything. Any last minute questions for William? I actually had a quick question uh, sure. regarding the Intel builds. Um, are there any sort of licensing restrictions? Because, I mean, can you just... I assume you're building things and then removing the actual compiler. Uh, no. Intel. So the Intel compilers are freely available for the longest time. I thought they weren't either. And the Intel compilers are downloaded via either APT, YUM, DNF, or uh, package managers. And in part of the uh, installation, the MOSIT gets the open source license that Intel provides for uh, their scientific community. And so it builds all the packages and then you just source the Intel compilers and it will uh, build it inside of those. Okay, thank you.
Oh, I think we have another question. Oh. Hi, William. Uh, thank you so much for this presentation. I think it is very helpful for the new user like me in the WARF community. So I am just wondering if it is uh, tested on an ARM64 architecture. ARM64 is, yes, it Mac. should be. Mac, yes, it is uh, compatible on Mac. Um, the Intel compilers are not available on Mac. I'm still having issues trying to get them to install properly. It tends to cause system breaking um, programs to the OS, but right now the GNU compilers are available for Mac and can be used with all the packages. Okay, but I am uh, I have been struggling with the installation of RFDA and I'm having the fatal error call. I, the symbol is not available for ARM64. Um, Something. without having to, without being able to get, see the errors that you're having, I mm -hmm. can't tell you exactly how to fix it, but I have gotten it to work on an ARM64 Mac on my virtual machine. But if you, I'll be happy to uh, reach out to you and help you get it installed. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. It does seem that we have a Zoom question as well. Yes, this question is from Mean Ju. Uh, and I believe it specifically applies to your software, Will. Um, it says, can WARF be compiled in single precision mode and can PNET CDF be included in the compilation? Um, single precision, yes. It would have to change the uh, uh, compiler commands in the package itself. Um, and then um, PNET CDF is included in the compilation. But yes, I, right now it's, I believe it is built in double precision mode. Okay. Uh, if no other questions, we could thank our speakers again. And I assume that the break goes till 3.30, so 22 minutes. Okay, let's get started. Uh, welcome to the, the, the afternoon session. Uh, the first talk will be on IBM Graph and will be given by Brett Will. Go ahead. Okay, get a good start here before Cliff sets the time for me. Um, Set. Oh. So I'm obviously excited to be back in person here again. This is awesome. And I'm excited to just be back in the state of Colorado. I mean, I take it for granted sometimes, but beautiful state. And next week I have some vacation time here. So looking forward to that. So I'm going to give a quick overview of what we're doing with graph nowadays. But um, for those who don't know what graph is, it stands for Global High Resolution Atmospheric Forecasting System but it really is a marketing uh, brand for us. So it encompasses many different things, starting with software. Obviously we run the NCAR MPAS model is our, that drives our um, entire program here. There's also the HPC side of things with IBM power um, systems that we have access to. And of course the scientists and a lot of collaborations here that's, that's made this a reality. So we're, we're truly thankful for this. Um, as you know, NWP forecasting can be brutal at times. So sometimes we feel like these, these clowns down here don't have a clue what we're doing. But um, I do want to say Graph is truly built on the state of the art science and hardware, not only from the science side of those hard, the hardware resources um, from IBM we, we operate on, but there really is decades of um, international contributions from the science perspective that has made this possible. So, I mean, we truly are thankful for that because we get to reap the, the harvest of all the decades of, of work. So we're th thankful for that. So why does IBM, um, the weather company, use Graph? It basically comes down to is a framework of tools that Graph contributes to that allows for the development, automation, and highly efficient generation of weather stories. So these weather stories, um, in the end, by the time it reaches the end user, becomes a decision maker. So whether it's B2B or B2C, um, they can make a decision on that story that's being sold to them. So this occurs across many different platforms. Um, we have a forecast on demand, which is one of our main APIs that drives the forecast. And then um, currents on demand is Graph is used for areas of the world we don't have good observations at the surface. So we use that to estimate the current conditions. But I won't go through the whole list here, but obviously the media side of things is a big um, big chunk of our business from the consumer apps, the media side, as well as aviation, energy, both renewable and non-renewable. And we have a, a good chunk of business on the direct data service on B2B and B2, um, 
B2C and B2B as well. Now, we, one of our um, streams that we use is what we call the graph five minute forecast stream. It's highly popular and that's, we use that stream and use that to drive a lot of our products because there'd be no way we could acquire the amount of data that we need from a government source model to do the things we need to do from a temporal, temporal frequency um, as well as the amount of data that we have to deliver. We have three different applications of uh, operational graph right now. Um, the first day here, 2017, is when we start running the application, and 2018 is sort of like when it was operationalized. So our first application is uniform 15-kilometer mesh. This was our initial deep thunder. Um, this is primarily to replace our global wharf application that we had at the time. And this now is pretty much our aviation um, business model. So again, it's uniform 15-kilometer, but it, it generates a lot of products for aviation, such as surgeons forecast, um, dissipation rates of forecasting ice potential and convective guidance. But all these, all these applications run on our IBM Power 9 systems with GPUs. The second one here is our graph variable resolution. It is 15 kilometer, um, it was three kilometer of refinement regions over most of the land areas in the globe, and then 15 kilometer outside of that. This is the one that's updated um, every hour, and it goes out to a 15 hour forecast. Um, we spin up from an ESMWF analysis, and then we do a very limited data simulation using GSI, just for surface authorizations only, as well as we do a US NEXRAD cloud analysis on top of that. And finally, the graph LR, that's sort of our long range model. It's um, updated every six hours and it's a 4.8 million cell mesh and it goes out to 72 hours. But the same data, they, they, the same data simulation drives both of these graph and graph LR applications. I'm not gonna go through the details of this because this is sorted in disarray now because we're going through a significant HPC expansion and relocation. So we have um, stood up a new HPC in Rochester, Minnesota at the IBM facility there. We have about 128 Power 9 systems available to us there now. And then we also have our operations still in Raleigh, North Carolina, but that is being moved up to Rochester and merged with one um, HPC system. Hopefully we'll get complete that in the next couple of months. And then once we do that, we'll be able to get back to this workflow. But we do have a very efficient research operations where we have sort of a case study environment and we have a historical case um, lab environment that we run things through physics updates and things like that to make sure we're not having running any seasonal dependencies because any install we do, if we make the forecast worse, we're not going to install it. So we're really tuning on the accuracy. So a little verification here, we're looking at equitable threat score. These are bulk statistics. So if we go back to when we first started um, running graph back in February 20, um, you can see at the time, we did this, um, her was really the only thing we had to compare it to. So it's sort of our sanity check to how we're doing. But you can see during the stratiform type precip um, seasons, we're pretty much on par with um, her back then. But you can see during the convective season, we really definitely dropped our, our, our skill versus her. Um, this is somewhat can be expected because we're not in a cycled um, system for DA. And also we have a lot of issues on the convective side regarding overpredicted cold pools and the propagation of that um, throughout the system. So in um, late 21, we went through a series of exercises to focus in on the convective issues. And we tuned a lot of the convection, the microphysics, PBL, surface layer, and a couple other things too as well. But you can see year over year, we significantly increased our forecast scale relative to her. And then as you see in the October through February of 23, we actually exceeded her. Um, significantly. And again, it takes a lot to move these metrics because this was about 3,000 sites that we're looking at here. Two meter temperature. Um, I'll just cut, touch on a couple of things here. So um, in 21, we realized that we were getting way too much solar flux into the um, into the domain. So we switched to the Thompson cloud fraction, which really helped with that. And we made a, a few other updates to the soil moisture and the cloud droplet effective radius when the microphysics. And then also, um, this we found in the winter time, um, because of these changes with Thompson cloud, Thompson cloud fraction, there was a major bug and impasse in the call to that cloud fraction scheme, where the units were incorrect and the DX, which went into scale, were a part of that cloud fraction. So um, you can see when we fixed that, we went back to we never have been able to exceed her, but we're much more competitive now. So it's good to see um, from the two meter temperature. But again, precipitation is is our bread. Um, that's where our market is. Um, another thing that we've found extremely fruitful is we have, you know, hundreds of TV meteorologists that use this model on air. 
Um, so we'd like to take advantage of the social media side and sort of proactively engage these meteorologists to get feedback. And of course, everyone likes praise, but we really like um, the complaints because that's what drives the value for us to make things better. So just a couple examples here. Again, convection is always an issue for us, but people ask like on Facebook, why can't the graph initialize an existing line of storms? Or in this case, we've got a new acronym graph, gosh, really awful forecast. So you can see the radar there is a big complex storms and graph like a three to four hour forecast has nothing. So again, the, the big difference here is the reason we suffer there is because we're not cycling in a data simulation environment. But you can see on the, ra the radar here on the left, if you look in the center part here, this is um, a one hour graph forecast without any um, cycling going on. So we take the forecast background analysis, and then we apply the, the METAR observations and the cloud analysis on top of that. But there's no forward contribution to the next forecast cycle. So you can see um, it's not very rep representative of reality, but when we do the same experiment operating in a cycle environment, six cycles in a row, it's very close. It looks really good. So the, it's a much improvement there. Um, this is uh, again in Texas the next night. You can see up in Northwest Texas, south of Amarillo, there are a complex of storms moving south and south and east. The operational graph basically had nothing. And these are the complaints we get. And again, when we operate in a cycle environment, not perfect by any means, but significantly improved by cycling the cloud analysis. I'll touch on Hurricane Ian just for a second. Um, we're looking at the tracks here of the graph LR, the four kilometer model that starts using the, at the 72 hour from uh, landfall and then every subsequent um, model run after that in six hour increments. So we're going from 72 hours down to six hours before landfall. And you can see it was a very consistent track overall. The early runs had it going more towards Tampa, but it quickly started shifting towards Fort Myers um, over that 72 hour period. Um, I'm gonna do the statistics here, but I was trying to generate something similar to what I got from NOAA here with ESNWF and um, UKMO and uh, ESNWF and GFS. But it's not a, a fair comparison because there's got a lot more runs involved in the, the NOAA comparisons here. But when you go through and looking at 72 hours and under, we're basically right on matching UKMO or slightly better than UKMO. So we're, I wouldn't say we're perfect in any means with the tropical uh, storms, but overall the last three years, the, the uh, feedback has been very positive overall with how we do. On the left here, we're looking at the aviation model again. So this is 15 kilometer forecast. We started, um, but here's a, this is starting at 120 hour forecast, I believe. The very first run had it south of, Fort Myers, but every cycle beyond that was always near Tampa Bay or, or toward Fort Myers. Um, the interesting that, use, generally speaking, if we initialize with GFS, the trend will be similar GFS from the impact solution overall. But in this case, remember there was a few cycles where the ensemble spreads and the determinic forecast and the hurricane models shifted the track further west over the panhandle of Florida, but we never really saw that um, even using the GFS data. So a look ahead real quick. Um, we're trying to, we have two main goals here over the next few months that'll become operational. The first one is we want to unify our two graph applications. We want the best of both worlds here. So we want an hourly updating model, which currently only goes out 15 hours, but we want now want that good to go out to 72 hours. So this will be updating. We'll be switching to the graph or mesh, um, which is much smaller density, um, but allow us to get to where we need to be as, as far as a unified graph. Our target is a, 12, 3.75 kilometer mesh um, that's significantly expanded over CONUS and Europe. And with the HPC merge I was talking about, will be about 2.5 compute, X compute power increase um, versus where with operations are now. So once it's merged, we'll have about 844 GPUs to work with operationally as well as ongoing research. So the first phase, which we hope to accomplish in the next um, three months probably, is um, the unified graph on the graph LR mesh, 15, four kilometer. Um, it's good to see what Samuel was showing earlier, but the scalability with the GPUs. But you can see here um, with the ideal in the green and then the graph 4.8 million cell mesh in red there. And our target is to get to about 52 minute integration for everything involved. So that includes model integration, diagnostics, the input, and as well as the IO, the stream output. So, if we get to 72 nodes, which is 288 GPUs, it's not that efficient by that time, but
but it's about 17,000 cells per GPU. Generally, what we found is about 40,000 cells for GPU is when things starts breaking down and becomes much um, less efficient. But when you break this down, we're spending about, to meet this 52 minute, or about two minutes reading in the, the uh, init.nc file, the model integration's taken about 36 minutes, diagnostics about three minutes, and the stream output 11. The stream output, that's good to hear um, Michael talk about smile or smeal. Um, so hopefully that 25 gig per second is reality. We're looking forward to that. Phase two will be going to uh, a much more denser mesh, um, 3.75 kilometer over kilometers in Europe and 12 kilometer elsewhere. The advantage of going to a more dense mesh is we actually get performance and improvement in the scaling side of things because we have more um, cells per GPU. And then also with MPAS 7, we've just done some preliminary testing with that. It's about anywhere from 13 and 20% runtime improvement over version six. So when you combine both of those, the increased efficiency in the scaling of the GPUs, as well as the MPAS 7, the blue line, which might be a little hard to see there, but the blue line is MPAS 7 with 8.5 million cell mesh. So even though we're almost doubling the size of the density of the mesh, we still get to the same runtime as we did with MPAS 6 and the small mesh. So that's encouraging there. Um, the remaining issue will be that the IO. So hopefully we can get by bottlenecks. We might have to add a few more nodes um, to get the runtime down to deal with that additional IO. Um, lastly, their second goal we want to get to is a graph Jedi data simulation. Um, we're excited for this. Our number one goal, as I said, is improved graph precipitation skill, especially in the short term. So hopefully things work out. And this client here, this lady is very happy with their forecast. It was perfect. And um, we have a lot of different data sources we were excited to use, but one of them is the unique and proprietary data sources, such as cell phone pressures. Um, but we believe the, the, the foundation is really ready. We have a proven model over the last few years, and we're ready to allow this to mature and become a, a robust global data solution framework. So I'll stop there, and uh, we'll turn it over to James with the Graph Jedi. So I'm curious whether it would help you in your predictability um, if you had more vertical levels. You have 51? Yes, we have 51 right now. Um, the aviation model only has 35, and we have 51 in the two versions of graph. Um, we are limited somewhat in, in our resources. Um, we don't want to get – we've done numerous tests from the, the, the 50 historical cases where we don't see any impact, at least for the metrics that we're interested in, by adding levels. And we've tried it numerous times, and we just don't see the benefit of doing that at the cost of Have the extra resources. Have you tried more vertical resolution in the planetary boundary layer, for example? Um, I think, we, yeah, we have done that. And again, we just didn't see the value in it. Okay. The next question, did you ever try running three kilometers globally and compare? No. 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 Okay. <laughs> okay, next talk. Uh, next, James Cipriani will be talking about uh, the Jedi side of graph. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so uh, first and foremost, I want to thank my team. Um, I wouldn't be up here presenting if not for uh, the people on this uh, this intro slide. So it's definitely a team effort, no doubt. Uh, so I'm going to focus on three things here today. Um, IBM Graph, very briefly, because we just heard about it. I'm going to talk about current data simulation with our system and then what we're looking towards, which is the graph, uh, the data simulation with JEDI for graph. And we've done some preliminary work. I'll outline that. I'll outline kind of the workflow that we're thinking. Uh, and I just, uh, I did want to, you know, have uh, the the top right uh, images, courtesy, courtesy of the JEDI documentation. I'm going to come back, circle back to JEDI uh, towards the end of the talk, but you can kind of see the workflow and kind of the components of the JEDI system in general. Um, of course, I think a lot of us are familiar with, with DA in general, and I just wanted to illustrate the variational cost function, which uh, in this particular one has the time component as well, so it could be 40 as well. So as, as Brett just mentioned, um, GRAPH stands for Global High Resolution Atmospheric Forecasting Systems, driven by MPAS on the unstructured mesh. It has replaced our legacy uh, WARF operations. It was uh, called the Rapid Precision Modeling Framework, RPM. Uh, obviously, our 
focus is short-term precipitation among other metrics. Um, and we've targeted, um, again, as Brett mentioned, two uh, solutions thus far for graph, the, the long range, which is the four kilometer variable resolution mesh out to 72 hours, and then the 15 three kilometer resolution mesh out to 15 hours, and that's run 24 times a day. And we're looking towards doing the hourly updating out to 72 to unify both of those, uh, both of those systems. Uh, again, pretty much the last slide on graph, and I'm basically just reiterating what Brett had, had shown. The image on the left is, is our sort of 30% of the world coverage of our 15-hour forecast mesh. Um, that is not the DA mesh. The DA mesh that we're actually essentially spinning up is the graph LR mesh, the 15 four-kilometer mesh. I don't have that image here, but Brett did show it in his presentation. Uh, and of course, we generate you know, graphics like you see on the right and a, a bunch of other gridded products that are uh, essentially used as input to downstream applications. So I really want to jump right into the, the data simulation, kind of what we're doing, where we're going. You're going to get a little bit of past, present, and future kind of interwoven here. Um, it's it's all interrelated. Um, so we are a 3D VAR-based system currently. It's driven by GSI. I'm going to get into more of the specifics there. Um, and we also have a cloud analysis utility, and I'll show some um, an example of, of the impact of that as well uh, to complement what Brett had shown. Um, essentially, you know, we were 3D VAR based to start um, because we didn't have the resources to sort of go the ensemble route um, at the time. And really the only kind of uh, assimilation system that would operate on the unstructured mesh was DART, and that was ensemble only. Uh, so we kind of needed a, a stopgap, kind of an inter, interim approach, if you will, um, to uh, to get us to the JEDI framework. Uh, and that ended up being GSI. Um, and uh, so essentially what we've done for our operational forecast is we've generated three months of uh, retrospective forecast data so that we could feed that into the NMC method um, for generating the background error covariance matrix. These are, it was 182 simulations derived from the fall of 2017. They're cold start, you know, no observations, no perturbations, um, other than the fact that we're using 12 and 36 hour forecasts to generate the perturbations that go into the NMC method. We ran those using a 15 three kilometer uh, mesh that was publicly available from NCAR. Um, that met, that data does get interpolated to a Gaussian, a coarser Gaussian grid that that can then be used to to generate the the EC matrix. But that that was the uh, the area of focus at the time uh, that we used for the retrospective simulations. You can see the vertical levels there. It goes back to the question that was asked earlier. Um, we did do other tests with other configurations. This is a similar distribution to ECMWF. If you plot their 138 levels, uh, we did want to um, have more levels in the vertical. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, in the higher higher uh, altitudes, just because you know some of the radiance data sets do peak very high, uh, and we know that we're going to be prioritizing those data sets in the very near future. Um, so that's sort of why we chose this distribution, you know, partly, and then of course, you know, resource constrained with adding additional levels. So what essentially happened? So what you're seeing, the images, the two images on the left, leftmost and the center, are essentially single observation tests, making sure that the system that you know, that we developed sort of did what we wanted to using the BEC matrix that we developed. Um, so you're seeing a, you know, essentially a one, one Kelvin temperature perturbation with a 0.8 degree observation error uh, applied right, right in the center of CONUS. Um, and then you sort of see how the background error matrix sort of spreads that error information and the impact it has on the different variables, such as the temperature increment or the U-zonal um, uh, increment as well. And then on the right, you kind of see that real case study where we assimilated conventional NSEP observations using the GDAS prep buffer data. Um, so not anything in-house, but we'll get to that. We'll get to that very soon. So you can kind of see it, it sort of is doing the right thing. The main point I wanted to illustrate is that GSI can't operate on the unstructured mesh of impasse. Um, which is why it's sort of an interim uh, approach. So what we do is select a target Gaussian grid, which is fairly coarse, about 0.2 degrees, um, just for computational efficiency. We did some testing at 0.1 degree, but GSI just took far too long to run on the nodes that we could afford. Um, so we generate weight files using some e ESMF functions and first order interpolate um, and output the analysis variables to the target grid, run GSI as if it were a global application, and then interpolate the analysis increments back to the unstructured mesh, updating the variables that you see there, the, the 
the six variables, essentially, I'm sorry, seven variables, UV, density, QV, surface pressure, theta, and the normal component of velocity. What I'm showing here is just an example BEC matrix. This is not our operational one, although the operational one does look similar um, for the control variables. Um, this probably looks familiar, familiar to a lot of people. Uh, but again, this is just a sample one that was based on one month of 15 kilometer um, forecast data initialized four times a day. Again, using the NMC method um, just to make sure that everything kind of worked as we expected it to and things, you know, looked um, similar to what the GFS, for example, the 64 level GFS at the time uh, uh, looked. That's not being shown here, just the, just the MPAS version. Um, but again, this is just an example. This is not the three month, 15, three kilometer forecast. This is a 15 kilometer uh, retrospective forecast. But just to give you an idea of, of uh, you know, the code doing the right thing. So, you know, what, is it, what does it look like when we, you know, apply some, you know, sort of uh, novel observations, um, you know, in, in, the, in the framework? So we did a cell phone pressure test and Super Brett alluded to it. It's a little hard to see the lines there, but you can kind of see the, you know, the sort of the cost function being minimized. And then you sort of got your O minus B and then your two, uh, your two outer loops. And you can see the bias in the RMS uh, decrease uh, as you get to that, that second outer loop for the minimization. Um, and this is essentially the, the fit for surface pressure, as I said before and after the assimilation, when assimilating um, only cell phone pressures. And this is what you get as an analysis increment. Again, don't, you know, sort of take this with a grain of salt. This was just sort of a test to see if we can incorporate novel OBS, you know, convert them to buffer, get them into GSI and whatnot. And you can kind of see the increment there. You can see the highest concentrations of cell phone pressure OBS, as you might imagine. Uh, you know, in the high, highly populated areas. And then a vertical cross section across cone is there up to six kilometers, um, just kind of showing how the, you know, the BEC uh, distributes that error information. So all this kind of leads to a working DA system. What I'm showing here is our lab environment or 50 cases um, from our, our lab environment uh, that Brett alluded to, um, where we can kind of make changes and rapidly test them. Um, so we essentially um, ran a lab without any DA and then a lab with um, conventional OB DA. And you can kind of see what you get. Um, I'm not sure if this is gonna show up. Does this show up when I, oh, it does, okay. Um, so the, um, the red line is, is with the DA and the orange line is without. So you can see in the earlier hours, pretty much across the board for both CONUS and Europe temperature and wind speed, you know, pretty significant impact. It does degrade a little bit with temperature over time, and that could be a result of a number of things, one being the fact that, you know, we've got a lot of different interpolations going on with the BEC matrix, which really has not been optimized. Uh, but in general, just this was very, very encouraging and something that we use to uh, essentially say we can go live with this. Um, and essentially, what we're live with now is, as, as Brett mentioned, um, surface observations that we sort of get in-house. They're essentially METAR and mesonet data. Um, and uh, we're essentially doing a six hour spin up initializing from uh, ECMWF and, and then uh, simulating on top of that, that six hour spin up with an eye towards cycling, of course. And then it's just an example of cloud analysis. You can see the operational, um, the operational there on the, uh, on the right hand side. It's kind of a, it's uh, based on the Thompson scheme. That's how we derive the, um, uh, derive the hydrometeor information. We did do some tests with Kessler and Ferrier as well. Uh, this turned out to be the uh, sort of the uh, the best uh, uh, bang for the buck, if you will, sort of a blend of model and observations. This is a, a conus um, image, but you can't see the boundaries. Um, then you can see for a particular case, I don't recall the date of this case, but you can see that um, we actually had a pretty significant bump in the overall equitable threat score and a, a small bump in the precipitation bias as well. The orange line is with the cloud analysis. It's, we call it MPAS X runs for experimental and the graph LR is the operational without any cloud analysis. So again, this is live uh, as well in operations. Um, so where are we going? Um, as we heard, you know, MPAS Jedi 2.0 has been released. We want to employ more advanced DA techniques, more observation data sources using the Jedi software. And that operates directly on the MPAS mesh. So that's of, of great value to us um, where we can kind of get rid of some of those interpolation artifacts, hopefully. Um, the objective as mentioned is to develop rapidly updating uh, ENVAR system. Uh, I have hybrid in, um, in uh, sort of brackets there. We're sort of in, you know, in, in progress of uh, um, best determining, you know, when we would wanna to go to a hybrid approach versus just a straight ENVAR, for example. 
Um, and we want to have that driven in part by an, an in-house MPAS ensemble, ideally using the LETKF of JEDI, which um, we, you know, has not really been widely tested yet. So there's other options like EDA, for example, that we heard about um, that can sort of um, get us to an ENVAR approach. But we want to replace what we have with GSI first as a variational system um, before we sort of move to this next phase of, of um, you know, of, of data simulation. So what we've done so far is we sort of built the JEDI software. We've run a lot of the C tests. Uh, we built that with the GNU compilers, for example. Um, we built things like the Yoda converters, although we haven't really um, had much of an opportunity to test those. Um, that's a JCSDA internal uh, repo. Um, but we have generated three months of retrospective forecast data initialized with ECMWF instead of GFS, uh, twice daily out to 48 hours. Um, so that we can essentially do the NMC method again, but using the uh, the Saber software, specifically the, I think it's background unstructured mesh program, something like that is what BUMP stands for. Saber's system agnostic background error representation, I think. Um, but essentially leveraging, you know, those utilities on the unstructured mesh to generate uh, the, the BEC matrix. Uh, what I didn't show here, uh, and I perhaps should have, is uh, stream function and velocity potential um, they uh, had to be derived um, because of the way the unstructured mesh is of, of MPAS. So um, there were some NCL utilities to, to derive stream function and velocity potential on uh, a Latlon grid and then interpolate those back to the mesh. So we have all of that data ready to go. Um, and we you know, coordinated with uh, some members on the forum, the JEDI forum, uh, to uh, confirm that we had all the output that we needed um, for each of these simulations out to, out to 48 hours. So where are we going? Just kind of looks a little messy, but essentially it's a two-step approach. We're sort of running, we're going to be running uh, a graph ensemble at a resolution to be determined for, you know, 10 to 30 kilometers, let's say, with a number of members to be determined as well. This will be leveraging the MPAS GPU executable so that we can get a speed up of model integration. Those members will then be um, updated via the LETKF in theory, but that could be the EDA currently um, until a LETKF really gets off the ground. Um, and that sort of will continuously cycle. And that's sort of the, the, the upper part of this graph with time here in the dotted line. Then those uh, ensemble forecasts would then in theory feed into a hybrid ENVAR approach or an ENVAR if you don't want to include the high res um, or the static component of the, the BEC matrix. But we would feed the ensemble members into an ENVAR system um, operating on a high resolution graph forecast, three to four kilometers. Um, and then, of course, out would come a deterministic uh, high-res analysis that could then be used um, in a cycled approach um, and to drive the next, you know, 72-hour um, forecast, essentially, um, with the potential, if we do a hybrid approach, to upscale and recenter the analysis ensemble about the hybrid analysis, which actually might give us a little bit of benefit as well. So this system would sort of continuously cycle. It would be reinitialized at some point, um, not unlike what the HER does. Um, I think they're um, sort of reinitializing um, every so often um, because of the you know the high resolution and 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 things of that sort. So we would likely reinitialize and sort of spin the system up, um, you know, at a frequency to be determined. Um, but essentially, that's kind of what we're looking at um, is an ENVAR approach with an eye towards a hybrid ENVAR approach that would drive our hourly seventy-two hour forecast. And really, the last slide here is just you know. What do we want to focus on um, for observation data sources? Because um, talked a lot about model background, um, but obviously the observations are the other piece. Um, and uh, probably familiar with the graphic on the left, that's uh, ECMWF forecast sensitivity to observations from uh, summer of 2006. So you can see the negative values indicate positive impact in 24-hour forecast period. So, you know, usual suspects, AMSU A, AIRS, um, some aircraft reports and, and, and so forth tend to have um, the largest positive impacts for ECMWF, that is. Now, of course, our system is going to be different. Um, you know, we really can't do the forecast sensitivity to observations because um, ECMWF is doing 4D VAR, uh, straight 4D VAR. But based on literature reviews um, and, you know, some other sources, we've kind of um, loosely prioritized the list as follows. I'm not going to go through all of them here. And, of course, there'll be more to add. 
Um, the star, uh, the ones with an asterisk um, are observations that we pretty much have in house. We've got radio songs that we have tested with. We've got personal weather station data. We've got cell phone pressures as well. We uh, do have, um, I think a feed of the MODES uh, high frequency aircraft data, or we will potentially get a source like that. Um, and then of course the, you know, the main radiance data sets as well. You know, how best to format those. We thought Yoda converters at first, uh, but we just heard about the OBS to Yoda um, from uh, the talk this morning, which is publicly available and it doesn't seem like it's a JCSCA internal uh, repo. So uh, we might actually uh, try to play around with that and see what we can get out of it. Um, I think, yeah, that's it. Time for one question. Go ahead. So I think your plan, I mean, it's a very ambitious and God, I wish you had your computing. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I, I see with this, like if you go back to your uh, the, the complicated slide, yeah, that one. So you're going to basically be doing, creating uh, the, the variational information, the background errors from a, a non-convective uh, ensemble. I mean, right. Yes. So are you going to, are you using like a her cloud analysis with, with uh, a forward backward cycling, which I don't think exists in MPAS or anything like no, that? No, no. It's the, the cloud analysis utility that we're using is, um, is one that we developed in house. So it runs after the traditional, you know, DA runs. Um, and it is just based on like, you know, ADAS and GSI principles as they were, it doesn't have any forward or back or forward or backward integration or filtering. Um, but we are thinking toward down the road at some of um, the work that uh, Zhou Guang Wang's team has done with uh, incorporating reflectivity as a state variable into the ENVAR approach, uh, which she has shown has um, had significant improvement, e you know, even beyond 12 hours. Um, so we're looking kind of towards that. But to answer the question, our cloud analysis um, does not do forward and backward integration. Yeah, I mean, just a final comment. I think in a warming world, we're going to be much more interested in precipitation from convection. Yep. And so in a sense, initializing that's going to get more important, it's not tomorrow, but in the next yep. five to 10 years. I think. We've, we've toyed with the notion of, um, you know, maybe some of the ensemble members being convective allowing um, and maybe doing like a, a blend, but then there's a trade off of, we can't run as many, right? So then what, you know, what happens? We're ranked efficient, really ranked efficient. And we got to maybe up the weight of the static matrix in a hybrid. And we just don't know how that's going to play out. Yeah, no, I agree. And I, I will say that if you, from our warning forecast experience at NSSL, that reflectivity does a lot of the work at those resolutions. So that might work. So. Yep, for sure. Thank you very much. How many people do you have working on this? Four, four people. I mean, there aren't too many private sector firms that are doing global prediction. It's extraordinary how much you're doing with so few people. Okay, next, next talk, Craig. Okay. Bring it up. Okay, next talk will be on MPAS uh, JEDA based variable resolution global data simulation system, and Craig Schwartz will be giving the presentation. All right, so. I'm going to start off with the big picture of this work and where it is we are planning to ultimately go with this work. Unless AI and machine learning fundamentally come around and just change how we use numerical weather prediction models, probably within 10 years or so, we're going to have operational models running globally with convection permitting resolution. If we have those, then arguably we're going to want global convection permitting data assimilation systems to initialize those models. And because forecast models are uncertain, we're gonna need ensembles of global convection permitting models. And ensembles are an imperative part of data assimilation systems. So where this work is going is looking pretty much way towards the future and trying to develop global convection permitting ensemble based data assimilation and prediction systems. So doing this is gonna be hard. It's gonna be really challenging. It's gonna require big computing and new technologies. It's gonna require fundamental advances in satellite data simulation. To do this really well, model developers and data simulation scientists and software engineers are gonna to have to work together better than they probably ever have before. If we really wanna do this well, but the payoffs are potentially huge. We can get cutting edge NWP. We can get better data simulation systems 
better understanding of multi-scale predictability, improve convective scale MWP model physics, especially in the tropics. And I think what's really exciting potentially is global convection permitting reanalyses. So we're not gonna get there overnight, but there are a few intermediate steps that I would argue we can take right now. One of them on the data assimilation side is to do what's called dual resolution data assimilation, where we use a relatively coarse ensemble to provide the error statistics to update a single deterministic global convection permitting model. And this can obviate the need for global convection permitting ensembles and save us a lot of resources. Another thing we can do is use variable resolution meshes, such as those afforded by MPAS, where we have convection permitting resolution over a portion of the globe and coarser resolution elsewhere. And then when science and computing permits, then we can fully move towards global convection permitting for all of the components. And so what this work does is it uses these two approaches. And what we've managed to do is do continuously cycling dual resolution ensemble variational data assimilation over a variable resolution MPAS mesh with 6.5 million grid columns and three kilometer cell spacing over most of North America, smoothly transitioning to 15 kilometer cell spacing over the rest of the globe. And we've done this uh, with the ENVAR algorithm from JEDI. A few details about the model. We use the convection permitting physics suite, uh, but instead of the grell fridas scheme, we swap that out for the scale-aware new Tidka cumulus scheme. We've got 55 vertical levels and we use a 15 second time step. Uh, in the future, I think we can probably increase this time step and also save on some computing. On the DA side, this is Ian Var from MPAS Jedi. For the ensemble covariances, we had 80 member global ensembles that provided the background error covariances. These were produced with a 15 kilometer global ENKF with 80 members using MPAS and DART, another data simulation toolkit that's available. And I could give a whole separate talk just on this ENKF. This was quite a big computational achievement to pull off. Uh, but this provided our background error covariances for the ENVAR system. We had horizontal and vertical localization. All of the experiments I'm going to discuss assimilated observations from satellite AMVs, Rawlinson's aircraft, GN SSRO refractivity, and surface pressure, as well as clear sky AM SUA radiances. So not a full suite of operational observations, no radar yet, um, but enough observations to keep the system stable, as you will see. I'll show results from four experiments. The first is kind of a control. It's where we did this ENVAR, where we use this 15 kilometer global MPAS ensembles for the background error covariances to update this variable resolution mesh. The second experiment was exactly the same as the first, but now we use 30 kilometer ensembles as the background error covariances provided by a 30 kilometer ENKF. And the point is, is to see if we can coarsen the resolution of our ensembles and still get decent results because it's a, it's a lot easier to run a 30 kilometer 80 member global ENKF than a 15 kilometer 80 member global ENKF. Third experiment is exactly the same as the first, except now we're swapping out physics schemes. So instead of the convection permitting suite, we use the mesoscale reference physics suite. And then for the fourth, um, we threw more observations at it. So we started assimilating all sky AMSU radiances, as well as all sky GO16 radiances into the system. All of these experiments continuously cycled for 35 days, new analysis every six hours, and at zero UTC, we initialized eight day global forecasts on this variable resolution mesh. So these are pretty big computations that we're doing. Just to reinforce this experimental design, for each analysis cycle, we have a single ENVAR background on this variable resolution mesh, and we combine that background with observations and ensembles from a coarser ensemble. In this case, these would be this 15 kilometer 80 member ensembles that provide the background error covariances. So this coarse ensemble, the high resolution background and observations go into JEDI's ENVAR. It gives, it gives us an analysis on the variable resolution mesh, and then it serves as initial conditions for a six hour uh, forecast on this mesh that then becomes the background for the next cycle. And we just do this over and over. Uh, we do this for 35 days every six hours. And the important part is we only have one instance of this high resolution expensive um, integration that we have to do because we use the coarser ensemble. So this was for three experiments. And then for the um, for one of them, it's exactly the same. Just look in the top left and you'll see the 15 change to a 30. This is where we use the 30 kilometer covariances to drive the system. So a brief sanity check to make sure these systems actually worked. Uh, what's shown on the x-axis is the analysis time. 
this is as uh, the forecast time, um, as forecast, uh, as the analysis date uh, increases. And the y axis is the root mean square error. What we're like looking to see here is if our background fits to aircraft zonal wind observations are, um, are higher than the analysis fits to observations, because we expect the analysis to be closer to observations than the background. And that indeed is what we see, where the analysis and the stash lines has a lower RMSE than the background at all data simulation cycles. So this is like the most basic sanity check we could do, and it passes. Some other quick sanity checks, we can look at the number of assimilated observations. So number of observations, uh, this is just aircraft temperature observations around 200 millibars on the Y axis, and our analysis time goes out uh, to the right. And we see basically a stable number of observations being assimilated. That's also good. This means that our background isn't moving too much and we're just tossing out observations because of a poor quality assimilation system. Uh, we can also just look at the background root mean square errors. Those are again shown on the Y axis, now it's time on the X axis. This again is for aircraft temperature observations near 200 millibars. And we're basically seeing fairly stable patterns with time. We're not seeing these RMSEs just go up as our assimilation cycles uh, increase. And it's a similar story for different observation types. Here's the same thing for surface pressure to kind of look at the whole column mass. And once again, we're pretty stable throughout the 35 days of cycling. So this is encouraging. It shows the system is stable, but I will say a stable system that has adjusted to the climate is not necessarily a good climate, uh, but nonetheless, it has reached its climate and it's stable and that's a really good first step. So now I'll talk about some precipitation verification. I'm gonna show you aggregate statistics over 31 deterministic forecasts using percentile thresholds in the verification to control for bias and basically ask the question, is it raining in the right place at the right time? Uh, verifications over the United States to the east of the Rockies, where we had NCEP stage four analyses that we could trust, and we use those as our truth. And I'm going to show fraction skill scores, and if you're not familiar with the metric, that's fine. Just know that higher values of the score are better. So what's shown here on the y-axis is the fraction skill score. Uh, in the left panel, it's a fraction skill score for the top 10% of events, and on the right panel for the top 5% of events, and forecast time goes out on the x-axis for each of the, th the thresholds. So the fraction skill score decreases with time, as expected, because forecasts get worse the longer they are. And this red curve is for the convection permitting physics suite uh, and the 15 kilometer ensemble covariances that I viewed as somewhat as a control. And now I'll put on another curve when we swap out the physics. I'll go back and forth and you can see where it lies. So this gray curve is for the mesoscale reference physics suite. And we see that over the first two days or so, we clearly get worse forecasts when we use this mesoscale reference suite. Markers across the top are indications of statistical significance. And so you can see that over the first two days, we have significant differences. It is interesting that after about four days or so, and we're five days, that the mesoscale reference suite actually does lead to somewhat better forecasts. Uh, it's harder to read into these results at these longer time periods because for this specific comparison, I'm not sure we would expect to see a huge physics sensitivity at, at later times. For some other comparisons that I'll show, differences at later times, perhaps more sensible. So I'm not really sure what to make of this, but I think there's a pretty clear signal over the first two days or so that the physics suite really does matter in these assimilation systems and can impact the forecast quality. So I'll do another comparison. Here's kind of back to our control with the 15 kilometer covariances that we used. And now we'll put on the blue one, and this is when we coarsen the ensemble resolution to use 30 kilometer background error covariances. And if you look across the top, we've got fewer instances of significant differences, especially uh, for the top 5% of events. And if you look at the curves, these blue and red curves are fairly similar most of the time. And what this is suggesting is maybe we can get away with using a relatively coarse ensemble in the data simulation, at least for now. I think this is the sort of result that would kind of have to be revisited periodically with time but at least for testing, we might be able to get away with a coarser ensemble. And then finally, our last comparison, we'll look at what happens when you throw in more observations. So here's our control. And then the yellow curve is when we start throwing in observations from all sky radiances, all sky microwave AM SUA radiances, as well as all sky radiances from GO16. And we see a clear improvement after about two days when we throw in these, uh, these additional sources of radiances. Now, because there isn't much of an improvement 
over the first couple of days, I don't think this improvement is coming from the GO16 observations. I think it's likely from the all sky microwave uh, radiances, which in global models are well known to kind of exert their influence at longer time scales because they sample the larger scales. And so we're seeing a similar behavior here, but now for precipitation in basically a three kilometer model over the United States out to eight days. So this is pretty cool. Um, but lest we get too excited, you can put on one final curve, and this is what happens when you just run in pass and don't do any of your own data simulation. And you just take the GFS initial conditions. So we have a ways to go to match GFS analysis quality. This is no surprise. GFS is an operational model. It's well-tuned. We're just developing the system from scratch. We don't expect to beat GFS right now, and certainly higher resolution on its own is not a cure-all. Just because you go to higher resolution does not mean you're going to have magically better analyses. So there's definitely still work to do. Uh, but I do think it's important to show where we are falling relative to an operational set of initial conditions. Um, so that's basically it. We're going to keep working on this over the next couple of years. We want to expand the area of three kilometer horizontal cell spacing because the goal eventually at some point is global three kilometer data simulation. Um, we want to leverage the constant improvements in MPAS and JEDI to make the system better. I think this particularly will involve a better use of satellite observations. So to conclude, these systems seem stable with time. Uh, forecasts seem more sensitive to physics and background error covariance resolution. All sky radiances seem helpful, but we have more work to do. And if there's any take home, I think it's a this. It's that tools and computation exist to start developing these high resolution, next generation global data assimilation systems now. I don't really see a reason to have to wait five or 10 years to start developing these. And that's it. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, Craig, great work as always. Um, curious, given that you're looking at sort of inputs of 15 to 30 kilometer, 80 member ensembles for the covariance, have you tried to control with just using GDAS as the covariance information into your MPAS based deterministic? Uh, no, we not. That would be interesting. Yeah. Sort of deconstruct why we're seeing the yeah. Yeah. GFS skill. Okay. Thanks. Nice. Nice. Oh, is it? This is on? Yeah. Nice presentation, Craig, as always. Um, so I've got really a kind of a two part question for you. Um, so you showed the um fraction skill score when you compare to stage four. Um, obviously, you know, you're on structured mesh versus a maybe a polar stereographic grid as a stage four. So you probably had to do some interpolation to get them on the common grid. So do you think you're falling victim to some interpolation errors and that might be why you're not beating GFS as much? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other question is about the bias correction of the radiances. Um, about how many days in would you say you know, you're sort of comfortable with the bias correction? Yeah, we looked at that. Um, things tend to stabilize after about five days. What I thought. Last question. Yeah, just a, I don't know if it's more of a question or comment about stage four. Um, I was wondering if you've ever, because a lot of people use stage four as verification. There's a lot of caveats with stage four, um, especially depends on when you pull it. Do you pull it one day after or seven days after? Because there'll be massive differences. Um, have you ever run, probably at a smaller scale, it's probably a pretty big project to do, but with something like an, uh, an MRS pass two or something instead of something like a... Yeah, I mean, four. honestly, I'm, that's a great point. Uh, I, I'm actually doing some of those comparisons right now for a different data set. Um, but, um, you know, I, I have looked at verification when you verify against both uh, stage four and MRMS, um, not this data set, but some others, and got remarkably similar overall conclusions. No meeting, no Wharf impasse meeting is complete without Morris's talk on high resolution <laughs> convective uh, prediction. So here it is. <laughs> Thank you so much, Cliff. Um, I've been a Wharf I, for two decades now, and you know I've been really used to what WARF can do for severe convective weather, convective systems, that's what my interest is. So when MPAS has come along, you know, I, I really had a lot of doubts whether the new technology could really make a difference. And so in order to 
satisfy myself by attach myself to a really nice project that Craig Schwartz, Ryan Sobash, and David Ahevich uh, put together in parallel with the um, hazardous weather test bed. Um, similar to what Craig described um, in his last talk, um, we have a three kilometer um, resolution over the CONUS, 15 kilometer um, all over the globe, running five ensemble members, three kilometer horizontal self spacing, I said, using um, what was considered the convective of you know, um, physics suite, Thompson microphysics, MYNN, planetary boundary layer, NOAA, RT, and so forth. Running 132 hour forecast for the month of May, it parallels with the um, hazardous weather test bed, like I said, initialized by downscaling members one through five from NCEPS GFS's initial conditions. Thank God we initialized with GFS after what we just learned. Um, but uh, um, the, the, you know, the plots are available on the web and it's really fascinating to go through and see what these kinds of ensembles um, can offer us um, um, from storm scale, um, all up area severe hourly max type plots. Here is one of the more commonly used ones, reflectivity and updraft helicity. Um, see a convective system in Eastern Kansas with some high updraft rotation at the leading edge and so forth. You can see that there are five members and I'll show some examples of the different members in another case. But the other thing that this global model is, it, um, and this exercise is meant to do is to look at the capability to forecast severe weather out to five days. Um, perhaps that's why um, we're running it as a global rather than a regional scale type of forecast. But you know, you have the simplification. You don't have to worry about boundary conditions during the five days and so forth. Um, but you know, the comparisons between a global and a regional scale still have to be done to confirm you know, that any differences. But here, for example, we have the ensemble summary of five-day accumulated precipitation, um, showing some significant precipitation areas. Um, and um, there are other kinds of ensemble summary things like max updraft helicity, max updraft speed, and so forth. And all of these are, are available for the whole month of May for those who want to go and take a look at it. Um, objective verifications are ongoing for all of this. Um, I'm here mostly to offer some initial subjective verification of convective phenomena, looking for the types of weather that will produce hazardous conditions, tornadoes, severe winds, hail, heavy precipitation. And I'm interested first in the short term, one to two day forecast, so that I can gain some confidence in the impasse world, you know, having lived in the wharf world for two decades, and then looking at the possibilities of getting extended, improved severe weather guidance out to five days. Um, so let's look at just a couple of examples. Um, here's a one of the more significant severe weather outbreaks um, for this month of May. Um, it was a, mostly a wind producing, almost a derecho type of event that went through um, central Kansas. Um, and if you look at the um, observed reflectivity on the upper left, and then you look at the five members, um, one, two, three, four, five, you see that you know there are different solutions for each of those five members. So there's a lot of spread that's coming out of this technique. And it turns out that one of the five actually does a really nice job. Um, I think this shows two things. One, that MPAS can produce these types of phenomena realistically. And to me, that's really step one in, in high resolution simulations. Can the model produce the right phenomena, the phenomena that are causing the hazardous weather? But the other message from this, of course, is we if we just chose that one, we would be lucky. You have to run an ensemble at these scales, as we all know. Um, and the chances of hitting it are well, even with WARF, we're on the order of one and five, two and 10 or whatever. Um, there are a lot of examples where, you know, people run ensembles for these high resolution severe weather events and two or three of them get it. Um, and so you have to run several members to have a chance to get these more regularly. Um, 
if you look at the structure of this of the best simulation, you get confidence in the fact that it is producing the right kinds of phenomena, um, like the um, surface temperature, the cold pool being, oops, not that, I want that. What did I do? Oh, okay. Okay, so you can see in the lower left, I won't try to put the cursor on, um, there's the nice cold pool with this event and the accumulated MPAS surface winds from all the members clearly shows that there was you know, the potential for a very, very severe wind event with maximum winds up over 40 meters per second in this particular case. Um, if you look at the weather service one day forecast guidance for this event, um, you see on the upper left that they had the Kansas region with slight um, chance of severe weather. Um, the impasse ensemble allows us to look at various aspects of that severe weather. Um, in the upper right, updraft helicity greater than 75 meters square per second squared for all five members. You get a probability of 50% right in the right place. Maximum surface winds, it was able to pick up. So even though the individual members had low scattering of results over there, the mean of the ensemble was able to indicate that this was the region that we have to really be concerned for severe weather. And then looking out to five days, um, day one, day two, day three, um, and you see that day one is the best of the forecast. Um, day two, um, it was a little further south. Day three, it was a little further west. and these were the, the SPC severe weather forecasts. These aren't all that bad, um, but days four through eight, they just refused to even put out a, a suggested forecast because it was to them, it was unpredictable. If we look at the same kind of guidance from this MPAS ensemble, day one looks really good. Day two and three are to the Northwest. So, um, you know, there's, there's some indication there's gonna be severe weather in the region, although not as accurate as perhaps the weather service in this case. Day four, there's still some indication. Day five, also some indication. So one could argue that um, while the NWS gave up after three days in um, suggesting that running these out might give you some guidance out a little longer. Um, that has to be, you know, this is just some anecdotal evidence right now, but these are the kinds of things that we're interested in doing. Um, and it's not moving ahead. Okay. Okay, uh, here's a, just one more case quickly here. We'll go, if you could go back one. Um, here's another event, different convective modes on the same event, um, a tornado outbreak in Northwest Kansas and another wind event down in Louisiana. And if we, Move ahead here. The observed reflectivity had the um, a big um, upper level low and a lot of stratostorm precipitation in Colorado, but in Kansas um, there were severe supercell storms with tornadoes, and here was the best of the five ensemble members showing a very very similar um, connotation of you know showing the um, really nice MCS in um, in um, Louisiana and showing the distinction in modes from the stratiform precip in Colorado to the severe storms with updraft, strong updraft felicity in Colorado. So um, it's able to differentiate the different modes very nicely. Um, this is just looking at it a little closer. You can see the configuration of the, of the observed stratiform um, changing to the more convective mode in Kansas and the same thing in the impasse reflectivity. If I show you all five members, two out of the five actually got a good in this particular case. The other three were a bit off. Um, and then this is the structure of the system down in, um, in Louisiana. Again, you know, two out of the five um, ensemble members got a forecast that was comparable to this. So, so I've become convinced basically that um, MPAS can produce the right phenomena, which is a uh, step one in my uh, mind. Here's the five-day ensemble, 24-hour precipitation forecast. See how far out we could um, forecast this. And you can see at day one, you have the precipitation for those two areas 
day two was pretty good too. It begins to fade by day three, just like Craig's show, but by day three, the accuracy of these forecasts begins to disappear. And by day four and five, it's marginal. Um, and one more slide, please. And in summary, um, again, these, these are just my, my initial suggestions. This is not objective. You'll see a lot more objective verification um, on Thursday um, from the hazardous weather test bed where they're actually comparing models. Um, but just from, for Morris's sake, you know, I'm become satisfied that every three kilometer and pass up here is capable of representing the critical convective modes, which I think is important associated with hazardous weather. I think that's step one. Prediction of timing and location is another thing that we have to work on. And also perhaps, you know, anecdotally, the global impasse with three climb refined mesh may produce improved three to five day severe weather forecast, at least. There was some slight suggestion of this. This is really early on, but um, I, I just um, recommend coming on Thursday to hear our um, Adam Clark and Corey Parkman talk about the comparisons between impasse and other models. Um, and those will run, I think, regionally. So I'll stop there. Questions? Go ahead, go to the, go to the mic. As you got out into the three to five day forecast range, did you look, did you have a chance to look at what the GFS, the larger scale model had in terms of the long wave pattern then and compare that to what MPAS had? That's the next step. Um, yeah, the, the, you know, this experiment just finished and um, we're just trying to get some initial results out there for the workshop. But yeah, all those are the kinds of things that need to be done. Oh no, not Adam. <laughs> Nice talk, Morris. Thanks. Uh, I really just have a, a comment because I got to look at these forecasts every day for five weeks and it was really, really fascinating. I, one of the basic questions that we had was, is there even value in running a KM ensemble out to five days? And uh, I think absolutely after looking at these for, for almost a month, um, there, there is value. One thing that I didn't quite expect, you know, you would think that like, you'd get this um, incremental uh, increase in skill as you get to shorter lead times. But sometimes we would find that our five-day forecast was better than the three or the four-day forecast. So you'd like get a really good forecast. Then day four wouldn't be as good. Maybe day three, you'd improve again. Um, and, and there was really no way to predict when you would you know, see that kind of jumpiness. But, uh, but yeah, there's definitely value out to five days. So it was, it was cool, glad. Uh, this, this is the beginning of um, perhaps trying to get that kind of guidance out to the public as you know, we're making progress there. Any other questions? Just a, just a comment, you know, we shouldn't be so convective oriented. High resolution ensembles like this are valuable for other things like heat waves and heavy precipitation on the West Coast, stuff like that. So it's uh, the values there for other things too. And then, I guess so. Maybe. Maybe, yeah. Okay, yeah. well, we'll <laughs> all right. Well, anyway, let's thank our speakers. Great talks. Okay, we're going to finish the afternoon before our reception with uh, uh, talking about some aspects of our ongoing and uh, future model support. Uh, we've been having uh, a number of, of internal discussions trying to uh, clarify what we're doing and, and where we should be going with uh, model support and thought it'd be appropriate to kind of summarize uh, uh, where we are and what our thinking is and get uh, feedback from from you all in terms of what uh, you feel is important and what works and doesn't. Uh, I think most of the uh, points that we uh, wanted to emphasize from our discussion have been mentioned one way or another in uh, the earlier talks, uh, particularly this morning. So 
in some sense, what I'm going to start with here is just a, a, a overview summary of uh, kind of what they are. Uh, the first one on the list uh, is to emphasize that we are not planning to retire WARF or step away from its support and maintenance in the foreseeable future. I thought it was very encouraging that this morning uh, Everett uh, made virtually the identical statement uh, uh, to us. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's encouraging that uh, we have the uh, at least the, the vocal support of our of our NCAR director in that decision, because uh, this question keeps coming up and uh, there's questions of how much we should feel pressured to uh, just move away from it. Um, <clears throat> it is true that we have uh, really stopped a major uh, development within M cubed uh, uh, in MORF. We are still clearly doing uh, maintenance, uh, releases, tutorials, and so on. Uh, but our, uh, our our primary development efforts are are, are shifting toward MPAS. Uh, in that regard, we I think that uh, uh, future uh, enhancement to the modeling system will uh, come from participation of of community users, and so. Uh, we're, in that sense, moving more toward a uh, community open, open development paradigm. At the same time, we feel it's important that uh, M Cube maintain its role as as gatekeeper in terms of uh, the uh, ensuring uh, coding standards, appropriate testing, and and, and so on. Uh, as we've talked, as particularly Bill this morning talked about uh, this morning, we are encouraging uh, users to uh, move from WARF to MPAS and particularly to try out uh, regional MPAS. Um, at the same time, we appreciate this may not be feasible for all users and, and, that, and that at present, MPAS doesn't have all of the uh, diversity of capability that, that the WARF model has. Um, we mentioned that uh, we're moving toward regularly scheduled uh, tutorials for uh, for for MPAS uh, that we would do in addition to uh, the ones for WARF. I'll mention more of that in a second. If you can flip me to the next slide. So, in, in terms of uh, a little more specifics on uh, particularly near-term objectives. Um, with the web pages, we're in the process of updating the, the WARF and MPAS pages to make them uh, more, uh, more uniform, e easier to use and navigate. And so uh, you should be seeing some uh, changes in that regard. Uh, as it was mentioned this morning, we do have a, a new version of the of the WARF user's guide, which I think is uh, is really uh, beneficial as well. Uh, it, with regard to tutorials, we're proposing a six month interview interval for tutorials for both WARF and MPAS, alternating between virtual and in, in person ones. So. Uh, we're thinking perhaps uh, um, a virtual tutorial for WARF in the in the winter and in person in the summer, and MPAS uh, operating with tutorials uh, in the spring and fall. Uh, if folks have strong uh, views on this, uh, we'd be interested to to hear about them. Uh, for the for the forum, we agreed that we, we need to have somewhat more consistent monitoring and, and response of questions and issues raised on the forum. Uh, in, up to now, we've been a little more uh, uh, haphazard in who and how we're monitoring forum issues. So we're gonna try to get more consistency in that. At the same time, I do want to encourage uh, everyone to consider uh, taking a, a more active role in 
being involved with the forum, that uh, if there's a particular area of the modeling system that you're interested in to sort of monitor what uh, questions are being uh, submitted and if there's somewhere you know the answers to uh, to participate in in responding and that can be certainly very beneficial and help in our uh, providing support in more of a of a community context for physics uh, it was mentioned in a couple of the talks this morning that we're moving toward uh, consolidating uh, our physics in WARF and MPAS and also our CM1 uh, model at uh, in MQ. Uh, for, for this purpose, we are have been establishing a shared physics repository with the idea that all the physics uh, in the in this repository would be CCPP compliant and that the uh, Wharf and MPAS and CM1 would draw their, their physics directly from, from this repository. So if we're serious about moving in this direction, then uh, we really want to require that new physics contributed uh, to these modeling systems must be suitable for, uh, must be first of all CCPP compliant and uh, suitable for inclusion in the MCUBE shared physics repository. Uh, so there are some new standards there that we uh, will intend to be enforcing. Uh, we want to essentially have a, a similar uh, criteria for acceptance of physics packages. Uh, we've made the general statement that new physics must demonstrate added value to the modeling systems. This is obviously a, a, a pretty uh, subjective uh, assessment to make. And so we're intending to revitalize our physics review panel uh, that would uh, take the lead in evaluating and approving uh, uh, appropriate physics packages submissions. Uh, so that sort of uh, uh, where we stand at the moment. Uh, and I'd, we'd be interested in questions and comments you all might have in terms of uh, what you would like to see from uh, our support folks in assisting your use of these models. It's always hard to get people to respond. What's your response to our planned uh, or proposed schedule for uh, conducting WARF and MPAS uh, tutorials. Does that seem like a, a reasonable um, frequency and spacing to, uh, to work with? <laughs> the, What have people's experience been with using the forum in terms of getting uh, responses to uh, questions or issues that you may have uh, submitted or that uh, you're familiar with that others have submitted? Has this been working well for you? Uh. <laughs> It'd probably be good to use the microphone. Hopefully we still have people uh, online there. <laughs> so yeah, if you could. Sorry, yeah. So my experience with the form, form has been, it's oftentimes a bit of a mixed bag. Um, some some questions, there's a lot of really good answers on the forum for, especially for issues that are common or, you know, more common or more uh, regularly encountered. Um, but I will admit it's often not the first place I find the information I'm looking for when it comes to troubleshooting, worth problems and, um, 
my experience is I haven't seen a whole lot up there on the impasse yet, but I imagine that will change going forward in the future. Thank you. Hi, I was actually had a thought about revisiting your other question about the tutorial timing. Um, one thought, a lot of times, especially with graduate students, summer is when they're gonna be available to take trips and actually do on-site attendance in person. So if the goal is to move the community away from more and more towards impasse development, it might actually be wiser to flip those two. Uh, so the next gen coming through might, uh, who, who are really gonna need the hand-holding and assistance probably. By flip those, you mean have impasse in summer, winter? Yes, um, yeah. mm -hmm. that's a thought. Yeah, that's an interesting point. One sort of complicating issue is, is that uh, summer is also the time when accommodations in Boulder are also a lot more expensive. <laughs> so that, that's given us some, but I, we can appreciate that that's uh, probably more, more convenient for not only students, but uh, uh, academic folks as well. Yeah, so it's an issue. Uh, Joe, I had a comment or a question about how contributing, let's say, to impasse development is going to work. I mean, uh, one of the things that I've sort of felt like after Dave Gill left is I had nobody who I could talk to because Scamrock doesn't actually listen to me that much and uh, and certainly doesn't answer my questions when I need them. Um, but I, You just like, have to give him the right beer. Well, that's true. That's true. That's true. But, yeah. Um, no, I mean, so like I've already done some coding with the work I'm going to show this week that isn't ready to be given to whoever like Michael, but is there a process that you guys are starting to put together about how you would accept code and how that would work? The Oracle approaches. <laughs> Uh, no, so that's a good point. We've been talking about this for an awful long time that we need a contributor's guide or a developer's guide that that lays out expectations uh, for your expectations for us and our expectations for you. It goes both ways, right? Um, we can keep talking about this a lot. And, and I think we've got a few new software engineers now uh, who are visiting in person. A couple of them are fully remote. So this is a longer story than you asked for. Um, but they were visiting in person last week. And this is one of the things that we said, all right, we've got a whole bunch of software engineers all together in the NCUBE lab. Let's start to lay out um, a table of contents for a contributor's guide. So at least we're starting to take something that approaches a concrete step in that direction. And we mentioned this last year, we had, was it Monday morning session or a Friday afternoon session at the workshop last year about you know, so you want, I wanted to call it, so you want to be an impasse developer. Um, I think we called it ultimately something different from that. Um, but we said that step one is uh, start a conversation, right? Because I think the last thing that we want is to have someone who puts a lot of work into developing something, they make a pull request and we look at it and we say, oh, well, we've kind of already done that ourselves and we just haven't made a pull request yet. So thanks, but no thanks, right? That turns away the community. So I think the first and most important step is to, to get in contact with one of us, any of us, and let us know your intent. And maybe we can collaborate and say, we've got similar ideas, maybe we should work together. Um, or that's a really great idea, but we'd like to design it differently in a way that works better with, with user interfaces or something like that. So I think that's probably gonna be like step zero in the contributor's guide is how to get in contact with us. And, and we've got some ideas maybe to open up GitHub discussions on the repository or something like that. Um, but that's probably the most important thing I can say. I, I was just gonna say that, you know, it's, I think you guys have to lay down some groundwork, but I also think that you might wanna have, and I'm willing to do it because I actually have some stuff I wanna contribute this summer, some guinea pigs and making an organic process to figure out how this is actually gonna work and get a couple of people wanna contribute and then work through them closely like, okay, you know, you can't do that or I can, you know, you can tell me this is not what I want done and this is why and all. But I think that kind of working through it as, as I, said, I said from like you guys figuring it all out and then laying it down, you got to do some, but I think finishing is always that. It's kind of like writing a document. So. Yeah, I can certainly support that. And from my own experience with uh, importing our code from my little uh, 2D prototype for this upper uh, boundary condition uh, into the full MPAS model that uh, 
having good guidance on how to put things in in terms of uh, you know standards and uh, kind of use uh, procedures where things should go. Uh, fortunately, I've had Bill at arm at arm's length where he keeps kicking me toward the right direction. But uh, there's many mysterious things in that model uh, that uh, that sort of pop up, and having that communication uh, uh, that Michael was talking about too to to keep so you don't so a, a developer doesn't get too far off the correct path in the in the process of development, I think is is really important. I'll ju I'll just try to tie all these thoughts together. Um, as this sort of process develops to kind of encourage a sort of standardized way of community development, um, maybe in addition to WERF and MPAS tutorials or as part of an MPAS tutorial, there is a, an entirely different development tutorial, which basically lays out the entire process of how to develop a physics package and go through the, uh, the CCPP compliancy and, and everything. That's a very good point, and and that would be relevant to yeah, to obviously to both uh, wharf and MPAS developments. So yeah, that's a a great suggestion. I have a question on this side. <laughs> Do we need a completely new paradigm on physics development now? I mean, right now the way the physics, you know, it's nice to have, make sure it's CCCP compliant, all that. But it's completely disorganized. You know, the physics do you get are the people that show up at your door, right? Well, I have this new physics parameterization fist or this or that. But aren't we beyond that now? Uh, what are the weaknesses? We, we need to identify where the problems are and where the community has to put energy. I mean, MMM can put some energy into it too, but we need to decide where the community has to work to improve physics. So don't we need a more active management of what our problems are and what we prioritize. I mean, isn't that the next step? I mean, that's the same. This is the same problem on the UFS side, right? You know, they have, they have this new dynamical core, but there's no organized way of improving the physics. Maybe we should do that. Well, there's a, there's issues of resources and and issues of ideas. You know, you can't just say, "Oh, I'm going to go build a better whatever physics package." and Say you know well what am I going to do and and that's where but you can the work the work weakness. has done where people have creative ideas and uh, the interest and and resources to uh, to pursue them so but maybe we should put more, more resources into verification and evaluation uh, centrally and see and identify where the real weaknesses are and then identify that to community and try and to try to work in an organized way to fix. The pieces that we know are not, are are problematic. Gretchen, did you want to speak? Our fearless lab director has joined us for this afternoon. Hanging out in the back. Uh, yeah, no, Cliff, I don't disagree with you. But actually, I was going to suggest this is something to talk to NSF about. Um, NSF being able to organize an even broader community, and I would I've been um, happy. You know, Joe, you talked about how we're getting support from NCAR, but we're also getting support from NSF to more work on the kind of problems that we've been wanting to work on for a long time and to support the models in the right way. But bringing them into the conversation, I think would be important and they could help coalesce and put some resources behind this kind of effort. Um, I have a follow-up question on this CCPP, um, and I kind of meant to ask it during um, Laura's talk earlier, I think. So you know, we heard, um, you know, a talk referencing Derecho and GPUs, and then we heard Laura's talk referencing, you know, um, sort of like a, you know, a one-stop shop for the physics and, you know, kind of consolidating everything. But so right now, so with those two topics in mind, you know, there is this um 
this sort of open ACC atmosphere model branch um, of MPAS dev version seven. I think um, that um, I think NVIDIA has, uh, people at NVIDIA have done a lot of work porting um, atmosphere model GPU modifications. Um, and it, is there a plan to incorporate those GPU modifications into, you know, those physics modifications into the CCPP so that you, a user can either build a CPU based MPAS or a GPU based MPAS? And if so, who's going to do the work? Laura, do you want to respond to that at all? Do I need to do something special? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'm talking. Um, I guess the first step was looking at the prioritization that are existing in WARF and the way sometimes they are probably kind of not, uh, I mean, written in a completed way, in a completed way, and definitely not, you know, the research important version standard. I think the first step that we wanted to take was to clean up those prioritizations, be able to kind of, uh, uh, have them pass implementing those prioritizations in a, you know, it, away from the worth centric way of, of, of doing things. So that was really the first step. Once the prioritization is cleaned up, I think uh, adding finally big, you know, open ACC coming at the top of, in, at the top, well, you know, within the prioritization itself, I think is definitely the second step that we, that we can take. Right. I think it would be the, I think it's a normal step that, that can be, that can be used. Yeah, because I think the um, how we're sort of using the I mean, obviously we're um, you know using the the GPU enabled branch right um, or you know a a flavor of that branch, and it can be built on CPU or GPU. So I would I would think in theory that that next step you know should be a would be a logical one where you know you. Can I mean, it's definitely a, a logical step to take, but you also have to kind of take into account that then on the science, I mean, on the development point of view. Sometimes you have all these cumbersome, you know, added uh, open SEC or whatever you like to call it, uh, directives in the source code itself, which kind of make it hard to kind of, for developers to kind of work their own, you know, their own projects, work on their own prioritizations as well. So there is kind of like a, I guess, interactions between software engineering and scientists, you know, the, what we have said for, for, many, for many months now that needs to happen. But I think there is a clean way to do a, an implementation of, of, of GPUs on the top of the CCPP compliant. Although, you know, at a higher level, the CCPP framework right now is not, doesn't support GPUs. So that's also something that will need to happen. Right. Thank you. Dealing with the CCPP monster, DTC here at NCAR. Who Speak is, into the microphone. So, so the people who deal with the CCPP most at uh, the DTC at NCAR, who are also working with the office operational side at UFS and the um, CESM. Um, so th they definitely have that in their plans. They're gonna have a visioning workshop in August and, and GPU uh, compatibility of CCPP is one of the topics of interest there. So they're definitely looking forward to having GPU uh, consistent uh, uh, CCPP physics that's in their plans. Oops. Sorry. So I just wanted to say I, I recognize this is going to be really difficult for you all. That's a zero sum game with your people and all of that. If I speak as somebody who has one of those crazy applications that is not going to easily move from Wharf to MPAS. So I wanted to ask from the standpoint of Wharf development and uh, releases and incrementing. If you envision that you're going to get to a WARF 4.6 or a WARF 5.0, or if you think you're going to be at a WARF 5.n indefinitely. And I and the reason I ask that question is I'm about to embark on some resource intensive simulations. And one of the big criticisms we get from reviewers is, oh, why aren't you using WARF whatever the latest one is in, in without recognize without people blindly recognizing how much effort it takes to develop them so for me if i see you're going to stop at 4.5 i'm going to move to 4.5 so i don't know if you can answer that today well you shouldn't 
want to go there only if that's the last one. I mean, I, we like to encourage people to, you know, continue to move with uh, with up to date versions of the model. And we certainly have no plans to stop our releases at, at 4.5. Now you mentioned five, there's sort of a, a subject, subjective issue as to when we consider a certain set of updates, a, a major uh, change. And often that relates to whether the, uh, whether the new uh, release will have backward compatibility with uh, uh, previous ones. Uh, and so <clears throat> we currently do not have any, you know, active plans for a major new release, but we do intend to uh, keep going with our uh, annual, re annual releases and uh, whatever appropriate uh, updates or contributions uh, we have uh, uh, that would be included in that. And, and just for your edification, I appreciate the answer. They in the probably 14 or so years I've been doing like regional climate modeling with WARF, what we've ended up landing on is the even number dot one. We tend to end up updating. And so we're actually on 4.4.1 right now. And it's just worked out that way over 14 years. So that's why I'm thinking, uh, do I jump to five or do I wait for 5.1 or are we going to six any day soon? So thank you. I can see why you like the point ones because there, there's the opportunity to pick some of the obvious bug fixes from <laughs> from the new release get picked up. We're, we're on to you. <laughs> so I want to shift gears or sort of go back, circle back to something, but at larger scale. So I'm sitting here today, and I'm hearing people talk about global cam, and I, you know, graph stuff is incredible. What do your team is doing? Dave Randall's Earthworks. I know GSL has a global cam initiative going. Uh, we're still staying in our little little place in Oklahoma. We're not doing global cam yet. But it seems to me that between resources and software and everything, that the private sector and the public sector ought to be talking more about sharing resources, particularly in software development, particularly in terms of GPU, particularly in terms of sharing. You know, some stuff is proprietary. But not everything is proprietary. And it seems to me that we ought to all be leveraging off each other instead of sitting, you know, and I know how it is. We're the same way down there, especially because we're in Oklahoma. You know, we go off to, into our little rooms and we do our work and we sit in front of our screens and, and, and we don't network because we haven't been able to until recently for three years. So I would just like to say that we have an opportunity in this community to really pull in, you know, NVIDIA, IBM, uh, the work, the people that Dave Randall works with and all that to really try to build, I would like to see a version nine of MPAS, which is at least ACC GPU compliant. You know, maybe it's not the fastest thing on earth, be, you know, relative to the machines, but be able to at least leverage that. And I, I don't think we should, we all have zero sum games in software development. So it seems to me we ought to be coming together to do that. Well, as you pointed out, we have had working relationships with IBM and NVIDIA. Uh, I don't know, Bill, do you want to comment on uh, sort of how productive those uh, interactions have been or how they could be strengthened? I think they were quite productive. The fact is we do have a GPU version of MPAS um, that works in the graph system. I think a lot of that initial work has come to fruition. Um, we haven't brought that to the main release yet. For a number of reasons, which uh, there'll be a discussion session Thursday afternoon. We can <laughs> we can follow up there probably because I'll talk a little bit about what we see the path for for GPUs to come merge into our main release because there's lots of details there that are difficult. But but it has worked. But understand, uh, it's a private company, I, IBM weather company. They have to make money. So even though it's not proprietary, they've shifted their resources to the DA side, which I think is is where you're going. So, so it makes perfect sense. Um, we still work with NVIDIA quite closely. A lot of the development that Dave Randall talked about in Earthworks for physics and GPUs in the climate model that the MPAS die core is in, those parameterizations, particularly the radiation, which is now running on CPUs in a asynchronous mode and graph, that's going to come into MPAS, for example, and some other parameterizations will come into MPAS. So, so that, that synergy is still there. It's just maybe a little bit under the surface and not so obvious yet. 
and, and understand, I think our, our ability to take advantage of the GPUs, it's still not obvious what the best thing to do is. So, so I view what our development as, as big experiments. Some things work well, some things don't work so well. So we're still learning. One thing I heard in a meeting the other day from one of the heads of CESM was that they didn't see their, their system going to full GPU applications. They, they didn't believe in it. And I, I was shocked at this actually. Um, so there's still, uh, and, and climate drives the bus at NCAR. So the machines we get really is dictated by climate. So uh, it'll be interesting to see if our next machine will be a lot more GPUs than this one, which would be helpful if we're ready to take advantage of it. So, so there's a lots of things going on, but, but I think there's still a lot of synergy. We meet with NVIDIA folks every other week to discuss ports for CESM that will come into MPAS. So there's a lot going on and the synergy is still there. Okay, well, I didn't mean to imply that you guys, I felt like there was a gap because I did feel like there was a gap in my knowledge or a clearly a gap in my knowledge about what's been going on continuously because I kind of felt like there was this gap between version six and version seven and eight there. Um, so I didn't mean to imply that and I had something else I was gonna say, but now you, Long beyond. So, oh, I, I know what I was going to say. I mean, we all talk about building these systems, and I know it's a huge investment. And we build it so we can do problems that we can't do on CPUs. But don't forget that the little guy at the little universities and all those things who might be able to buy their $60,000 workstation with three A100s in it, okay, could use that code too to do some global modeling in his group. If he does, I mean, most universities, yes, have supercomputers now, but not everybody. And so I think that, yeah, we're building it for the giant systems, but there's also a value in building it for a smaller class of problems to get everybody into global modeling instead of regional modeling. Well, and as if regional MPAS becomes more popular, that's also more doable on local machine, you know, individual local machines. Yeah, I hate to divert the discussion, but I wanted to get back to uh, the questions that um, um, someone asked a few minutes ago on uh, aspects of WARF. So, I mean, for a lot of our work, we're interested in, you know, more uh, high resolution, more localized applications. Uh, we don't see that as uh, being uh, practical yet for, you know, MPAS. So for us, one kilometer is high resolution, or rather is low resolution. So we're, you know, wondering what will happen to, uh, you know, LES implementations, you know, how much more work will be done on Wharf Urban. Um, we've been, I've read a couple of like Stan Benjamin's papers on Wharf Lake. We've seen some of the issues associated in lake boundaries. Um, is, is, will there be more work along those lines? Um, I realize that at three kilometer or, or coarser resolution with MPAS, you, you know, except for the Great Lakes, you can probably ignore the issues. Mm -hmm. so. Well, I think in particular, where we have these derivative models, you mentioned Wharf Urban, Wharf Lake, there there's a, a lot of incentive for those who have been developing those uh, integrated systems to advance their capabilities. And so uh, I would expect we would continue to see uh, uh, further uh, you know, enhancements and improvements of those systems. But perhaps more coming from the, uh, the broader community than let's well, say. Well, you say broader community, but that the, the part of that community that is, uh, has been using those uh, extended systems with you know, Wharf Fire, Wharf, Wharf Urban, so on. But you know, will, the, will there be issues with uh, you know, being fully uh, compliant with the you know, the dual approach with uh, the unified physics. Uh, you know, are those packages being developed to be compliant? Uh, that we would have to be working with the individual developers. Jimmy, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, sorry to... Uh... No, the, the Wolf Urban is coupled to the uh, NOAA MP and a little separate and once NOAA MP is an impasse, the Wolf Urban will also be an impasse and that's also going to be as compatible with CCPP as other physics. Um, the, the, NOAA, the land surface model is quite different from other physics. It's a big model underneath. Um, 
the atmospheric model. But the urban is part of the, we consider it part of the land model, and that is going to be ported to MPAS as well. So it will be available in both the lake model. There's already a CCPP version of the lake model being, because the rapid refresh uh, want that. So it's, there will be a, there is one that's compatible with at least the UFS, and um, that could easily also be ported into the uh, NOR-MP compatibility. So these are both sort of to the side of the land model. They're parts of the land model in some sense. So once we have no MP, these other things can also be coupled in. Okay. Um, I, I just have so, a, one question in curiosity um, outside United States, because uh, in other countries like South America, they use a lot of work to, the, to do the forecasting, the weather service. So I would like to ask you, is you, according to the two slides that you presented, do you think that National Weather Service in other countries have put effort in empaths right now instead of WARF? Because they are still working with WARF and they are still using um, financial support for some research to um, find the best configuration to make forecast uh, mm -hmm. outside the United States. Uh, so right now that you are talking about to pass this transition from, from WARF to EMPAS, do you think that they should stop using WARF and they have to more concentrate using EMPAS? Now that's kind of a hard question to answer. And I think it, it depends on the uh, long-term plans and resources that these uh, various operational uh, entities have because it, if this is a longer term ongoing thing, it is certainly to their benefit to start looking at uh, moving toward toward impasse for future operations. On the other hand, uh, you know that's a that can be a pretty big effort, and for operational centers, they often don't have the resources for doing that. And that's one of the reasons why we're trying to emphasize that we are intending to continue to maintain and support WARF so that uh, these operational centers shouldn't feel like they're under the gun, that they have to uh, switch or they're gonna be uh, out of business. And, and uh, so we're, we're, we're trying to be uh, accommodating of these situations, recognizing that uh, uh, transition is not always easy. So thank you. Um, yeah, I think we have to move on to our reception here. The beers, parts, what? Oh, okay, go ahead. So this is from Raphael. As a user, I am more concerned about how to migrate from Wharf to Impasse. It was a steep learning curve to get used to Wharf. Do you have any plans on how to bring most of the Wharf users to Impasse? Okay, I would uh, encourage him to... Uh, participate in the discussion session on Thursday and to attend the, uh, uh, the, the mini tutorial on, on Friday where that exact issue is going to be addressed. So, so if there are uh, further uh, issues or concerns that we need to discuss, you can uh, buttonhole any of us as you, as you like when we're uh, at uh, reception or breaks. Uh, we also are gonna have an extended discussion session on, on Thursday where issues can be brought up again. So I uh, very much appreciate your participation in this. It's been actually quite, uh, quite active compared to some of the discussion sessions we've had in the past. <laughs> so thank you and uh, let's all have something to eat and drink. <laughs>